The Dream Peddler by Lucy M. Blinn Read for LibriVox.org Up the streets of Slumbertown Comes the crier with his bell, Calling softly up and down, Dreams to sell, dreams to sell, Will the children choose to buy, Such a world of them have I, Here are dreams for merry spring, Fashioned where the blossoms wake, Where the fields and meadows ring, With the songs the breezes make, Dreams, oh, dreams, oh, come and buy, Who has merrier dreams than I? Here's a dream that winter brought From his palaces of snow, Well his frozen fingers wrought all its wonders long ago, when the star shone pure and bright on your blessed Christmas night. Here are dreams for summer sleep, fancies light as thistle spray, woven where the fairies keep carnival and holiday. Dreams here, dreams here, buy and try. Who has daintier dreams than I? Dreams to sell in slumber town, sure you'll buy these glowing dreams, warp and woof of red and brown, chosen from the autumn's gleams. Ah, no peddler far or nigh, sell such gorgeous dreams than I. On the streets of slumber town, ever sounds a silver bell, as the crier wanders down. With his curious wares to sell, Calling softly, come and buy, Who has sweeter dreams than I? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Children's Wonder Book, The Fairies from Mog, by Mary E. Stone. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen. Vancouver, B.C. Oh, where are you? Where are you? Will o the wisp, and say, is your lantern all lit? For over the bog two fairies from Mog, this night have determined to flit. They're dressed in pig doublets with white silken hose, and one is a lady. You see, should they sink in the moss, what a terrible cross! They've sent you a message by me. You mustn't go hopping and skipping across, but steadily light them the way. Your duty not least to find them a priest and let them be wedded ere day. Said the will o the wisp, my duty I'll do. His lantern he slung on his back. Stepping over the bog went the fairies from bog, and he steadily showed them the track till under the leaves of a pickerel weed he pointed the home of the priest a wonderful frog in green velvet tog who couldn't talk latin the least but he managed somehow to tie up the knot and will o the wisp kiss the bride safe o'er the bog were the fairies from mog ere the sun o'er the hillside had hide end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Section 3 of The Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Children's Wonder Book. Cinderella Up to Date by h s huntington cinderella couldn't find her slipper it was a glass slipper which her fairy godmother had given her along with a magnificent ball costume and the loan of a coach and six from the livery stable in point of fact there had been a pair of slippers and very pretty they were only they were rather hard and when cinderella tried to dance in them at the court ball they hurt her toes dreadfully besides they were so smooth that her feet kept sliding away from under her, and that was awkward, especially as she had the prince for her partner. 
the prince was a polite young man and he told cinderella that she skated beautifully only he found it hard to keep up with her because he had left his own roller skates at home but cinderella explained that it was only her glass slippers which would make her wander around and she begged permission to take them off while she was dancing so she did and danced all the evening in her stocking feet and i am sure she danced very nicely too she enjoyed herself so much that she forgot her promise to be home by midnight so when the clock struck twelve she was quite frightened and hurried away as fast as she could it must have been then that she lost her left slipper she remembered picking up both of them and slipping them in the pocket of her gown but when she came to look for them in the morning she could only find one now cinderella was very proud of those slippers though they did pinch her feet and she hunted high and low for the missing one she turned all the bureau drawers topsy-turvy she looked in all the vases and behind the pictures and in the canary bird's cage she even lit a kerosene lamp and looked down cellar but not a sign of that slipper could she find all this made her neglect her kitchen work cinderella's wicked sisters scolded her because breakfast was late and they complained that the mutton chops were burned and the buckwheat cakes were heavy but by and by they went off to their dressmakers and then cinderella looked in their room thinking they might have been mean enough to steal the slipper but it was not there it occurred to her that she might have dropped it in the carriage so she went to the corner drug store and bought a postal card and wrote to the owner of the livery stable asking him to look she got an answer by the next morning's mail the man said he was very sorry but the carriage had unfortunately turned into a pumpkin and the horses into mice he had looked inside the pumpkin before it was made into pies but had found only pumpkin seeds when she read that cinderella just sat down and cried she dried her eyes presently and went out for a walk while she was walking she met robinson crusoe he was dressed in a magnificent suit of goatskin with the hair hanging about his waist and knees he had an axe and a saw in his girdle and a great goatskin umbrella over his head and he carried four or five muskets across his shoulder his parrot was perched on one of the muskets and his tame kid walked behind good afternoon said robinson crusoe are you beauty cinderella blushed and hung her head a little some people say i am she answered are you the beast i'm afraid i look like it my dear said crusoe but it isn't my fault i live in a desert island and keep the only dry goods store in the place it's a very fine store but just now we're all out of cloth so i am obliged to content myself with goatskins i'm expecting another shipwreck soon and then we can replenish why don't you go to one of the big sixth avenue stores asked cinderella my godmother always says her shopping at one of those places oh my dear that would never do what would all the boys and girls say if i got my clothes in such an irregular way besides i have no money except spanish doubloons and pieces of eight and i believe they're not current at present perhaps asked cinderella have you seen a little glass slipper somewhere no said crusoe i don't think i have i saw the print of a man's foot down by the seashore but there were no signs of a slipper about it it's not a man's slipper i'm looking for said cinderella i've lost one of my own slippers and i can't find it anywhere i'm sure i had it on at the court ball i took it off because it was so uncomfortable to dance in perhaps you left it there suggested crusoe why don't you telephone up to the palace and ask i would sobbed cinderella only i'm so ashamed of my carelessness what would the prince think of me he said he did admire a good careful housekeeper above all things i'm sorry said robinson kindly if you'll come over to my hut perhaps i can fit you with a goatskin pair i'm sure they'd be softer than glass and probably warmer i don't want goatskin slippers said cinderella pouting i want my own glass slipper it is very unfortunate said robinson crusoe i can't think of anything else unless you advertise in the paper but i really must say good-bye now i'm told that several canoe loads of cannibals are in sight and i must go to the top of the hill where i can watch them through my perspective glass and he hurried off 
cinderella sat down on a log feeling very sad she buried her face in her hands and thought bitterly of her loss what's the matter asked a soft voice cinderella looked around and saw little red riding hood in her scarlet cloak with a basket on her arm have you found a glass slipper asked cinderella no said red riding hood have you lost one i lost it yesterday such a beautiful glass slipper you can't think maybe it's in this wood do help me to find it that's a dear girl i would said red riding hood but i'm afraid to go into the wood again there's a wolf there do you know she added confidentially i had quite a narrow escape this morning i met the wolf but fortunately he had just eaten my grandmother and he really had no room for another meal he looked dreadfully fierce and he had my grandmother's nightcap and spectacles on but he didn't eat me wasn't it lucky indeed it was said cinderella warmly lucky for you i mean she added but perhaps it was a little unpleasant for your grandmother was she very old about eighty we always said it was careless of her living in that lonely house with no lock on the door but only a latch string the wolf got in by pulling the latch string and he ate my poor grandmother in bed when is the funeral asked cinderella i don't know yet answered red riding hood you see we don't know just how to arrange matters until somebody kills the wolf i'll do that cried a voice near them it was jack the giant killer he had on a fine suit of clothes and carried a tremendous great sword which he kept flourishing all the while it made cinderella and red riding hood quite afraid of him if you please sir said red riding hood i should like very much to have the wolf killed but i'm afraid it wouldn't be safe for you oh perfectly safe a mere bit of sport and jack the giant killer swaggered around and slashed with his sword worse than ever a wolf is nothing at all besides some of the giants i have killed by the way can't i rescue any poor lady from the wolf's den i don't know said red riding hood the wolf has eaten my grandmother already so i don't see how you are going to rescue her it is difficult but perhaps not impossible nothing is impossible to me said jack the giant killer with another swagger is it long since the poor lady was eaten it was only this morning oh do rescue her if you can pleaded red riding hood just then a little girl ran screaming out of the wood her long yellow hair flying behind her a fair lady in distress cried jack the giant killer to the rescue and he rushed about making a great show of peering among the bushes for a giant or a dragon then he led the little girl up holding her hand above her head as if he were walking an old-fashioned minuet why it's little goldilocks exclaimed cinderella what can be the matter matter enough cried goldilocks you'd be frightened yourself if you saw a great big bear and a middle-sized bear and a little wee bear all together bears exclaimed jack the giant killer really this wood is very interesting and now i think of it they want to buy some bears and wolves for the central park menagerie i must see if i can't turn an honest penny in this business with that he screwed his face into a scowl which he imagined to be a look of fierce resolution and pulling a bit of whetstone from his pocket he began to sharpen the sword with an immense parade cinderella couldn't help thinking that he boasted too much and though he had very pretty clothes and a fine sword she liked the prince much better presently jack bowed to them and ran off into the wood slashing and practising throwing his sword up into the air and catching it as it came down but he had scarcely been gone a minute before he appeared again this time scampering for dear life with his sword trailing behind it's coming he panted save yourselves ladies or you will be devoured what's coming asked cinderella in great alarm a wolf or a bear or or something oh there it is save me save me jack the giant killer didn't look a bit heroic as he dodged about trying to get behind little goldilocks at length he dropped his sword and began to climb a tree but he only got halfway up the trunk and there he stuck the girls all screamed and were going to run away but red riding hood happened to look around and saw something trotting out of the wood 
when she saw it she stopped and sat down on the grass and just laughed until the tears rolled down her cheeks and whenever she began to recover herself she looked up and burst out with new peals of laughter it was really quite delightful only jack the giant killer looking down from where he was clinging didn't like it a bit what are you laughing about he growled oh dear oh dear me panted red riding hood oh it's too funny for anything why that isn't a wolf at all ha ha nor a bear it's only just mary's little lamb are you certain asked jack in a trembling voice but sure enough the lamb came running out when red riding hood called it and laid its head in her lap it knew her very well and liked her almost as much as it did its own mistress i ain't afraid of it screamed jack the giant killer in a great passion he slid down the tree tearing his fine clothes in two or three places then he caught up his sword i'll kill it he bellowed red riding hood jumped up if you do i'll slap your face she cried very fiercely and then she began to sob and i'll pull your hair chimed in little goldilocks crying also and i'll scratch you and stick pins into you added cinderella she was older than the rest and didn't cry a bit jack the giant killer scowled and swaggered but by this time they knew what his courage amounted to so cinderella and red riding hood and little goldilocks and the lamb all ran right at him and they scared him so that he fairly took to his heels and fled and that was the last they ever saw of him the great coward said red riding hood to take mary's little lamb for a wolf or a bear and she fondled the lamb lovingly oh but there are really true bears in the woods said goldilocks i saw them and they were dreadful did any of them have a glass slipper asked cinderella i don't know said goldilocks but they had nice chairs and beds and excellent porridge i'm very fond of porridge when it's neither too hot nor too cold i don't like porridge remarked cinderella cracked wheat mush is ever so much better or oatmeal said red riding hood grandma always ate oatmeal for breakfast before the wolf ate her by the way asked cinderella do your folks use saracella in house cleaning i saw an advertisement of it at the court ball sold by all grocers squeaked a little fellow at their feet he was a very little man so small that they had not noticed him before and he was busy pasting advertisements on all the trees and fences and houses what are you doing that for asked goldilocks the advertisements were mostly about soap and indigo and patent medicines i do it to improve the landscape said the little man and to teach the children to read and i'm paid for it how much do they pay you asked cinderella sometimes more sometimes less yesterday they gave me a bean a bean exclaimed cinderella isn't that very poor pay that depends on how you look at it a bean alone isn't much but if i plant it perhaps i shall get half a cupful of beans from it and if i plant those i shall get a peck and if i plant those they will yield twenty bushels and if i plant those but objected cinderella you will have to wait a long time unless your beans grow very fast this kind is said to be a rapid grower said the little man oh do plant it now and let's see exclaimed goldilocks i never saw a bean planted so i will said the little man drawing the bean from his pocket then he made a hole in the ground put the bean in and covered it up no sooner had he done so than the earth broke away and a bean plant began to rise very fast oh dear me squeaked the little man oh dear i'm ruined what's the matter asked cinderella in great surprise oh don't you see i've lost the bean it came up on top of the plant and now i'll never see it again yes i will i'll climb for it and he threw off his coat and began to climb up the beanstalk but as he climbed it kept growing cinderella called after him if you see a little glass slipper up there please bring it down i will said the little man but the bean plant kept growing and the little man kept climbing until he was quite out of sight i'm afraid i shall never see that slipper again sighed cinderella and she said good-bye to the others and went slowly and sadly home but the next morning the following advertisement appeared in the newspaper if the lady who dropped a small glass slipper at the court ball 
will please write to room 753 royal palace she will hear of something to her advantage cinderella saw this and wrote at once saying that she had lost a glass slipper and would like to get it back again next day one of the king's officers came with a slipper he had a black dress suit on and a feather in his cap and a little golden sword strapped to his side cinderella saw all this through a crack in the door while she pretended to be examining the gentleman's card she thought him very fine-looking indeed when she went into the drawing-room the gentleman rose and made such a very low bow that his little golden sword stuck straight out behind him cinderella curtsied and the gentleman bowed again and placed a chair for her and made her ever so many compliments which were very nice but he didn't say anything about the slipper at first the fact is he was a celebrated diplomat diplomats are remarkable for a great many things among others for a custom they have of always avoiding the very subject that they wish to talk about at length cinderella thought it better to open the business herself and because she was not a diplomat she went straight at it have you brought me my slipper she asked my dear young lady said the diplomat i have done myself that honour and permit me to confess a mistake which i made it is the less to be deplored because it gave me an opportunity of conversing with your charming sisters only less charming than yourself of course oh said cinderella have you seen my sisters i have indeed but it was through a mistake when i first entered the house your sisters alone were visible and i naturally imagined not having seen you that one of them was the owner of the slipper in fact each of those two ladies claimed it but it was an illusion on their part or a mistake or possibly a prevarication or never mind said cinderella how did you know it was not theirs my dear lady the prince requested me not to give up this slipper without first making certain of the owner by a test what is that asked cinderella the lady is to try the slipper on now your sisters though perfect in every other way fail to meet the requirements in this one particular their feet i whisper it only in confidence were miles too long neither of them could get the slipper on at first i was greatly disappointed but bethought me to ask if there were any other lady in the house and they informed me that there was none except one who i hesitate to mention it was performing menial services in a part of the dwelling which i am credibly informed is known as the kitchen oh laughed cinderella you needn't be afraid to speak of it i work in the kitchen every day i like it the kitchen is refined and beautified by your presence said the diplomat with a bow now as to this slipper i am forced to trouble you to try it on is that all said cinderella please let me take it and i will put it on now could i permit you to exclaim the gentleman nay allow me but to kneel and i will place the slipper on your foot if you please said cinderella but i think it will be rather like a shoemaker's shop however the gentleman insisted he first laid a handkerchief on the floor to protect his fine clothes then he knelt down cinderella took off her left boot and the gentleman held the slipper while she put her foot into it of course it fitted exactly the diplomat got up and made a very low bow again then he kissed cinderella's hand which she thought a very surprising thing to do madam he said i congratulate you the prince my master saw your beauty and grace at the court ball he had no means of finding you save by the slipper he now through me offers you his sincere homage and is desirous to marry you cinderella arose and curtsied as well as she could with one boot on her heart was beating very fast but she tried to look cool and collected i will see if i have any previous engagement she said turning over her ivory tablets she knew very well that nothing was written there but she thought it looked well to consult the tablets because the diplomat was such a very ceremonious gentleman however she had to say something and what she said was thank you i shall be very happy to marry the prince so the bells rang and the cannons were fired and there was great rejoicing over the marriage of cinderella to the prince she walked in procession through the crowded streets to the church and little girls goldilocks was one strewed roses in her path 
banners waved everywhere and because the banners were not enough the good wives hung all their carpets out of their windows with music and perfumes and better than all with love cinderella went to marry the prince and then they walked back through the street and when they had passed the crowd went away and the banners were furled and the good wives took in their carpets and their husbands had to tack them down again which was not so pleasant really it was a magnificent celebration the newspapers had several columns about it next morning under the title a wedding in high life and red riding hood has all the descriptions cut out and pasted in her scrapbook where you may see them if you are acquainted with her cinderella made such an excellent housekeeper that the prince found he could live cheaper married than single they didn't even have to keep a hired girl end of section three Section number four of the Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. The Children's Wonder Book Under the Plum Tree by Susan M. Day. Lawrence lay on a sunny bank under a plum tree, where hung a few late plums, ripe and tempting. He was not looking happy, he said, half aloud, I am the most unlucky boy. Nothing ever goes right with me. Just then a plum fell from the tree quite near him. Then it rolled down the bank out of reach. There, he exclaimed, that is always the way if i had been some other boy it would have fallen where i could have reached it at that moment he felt himself slowly sliding along not down the bank in a most peculiar way presently he stopped and just then another plum fell hitting him sharply on the mouth but it bounded off and followed the other out of reach he heard a merry laugh close behind him, a very small laugh, but as merry as sleigh bells and as musical. Then a voice, still full of laughter, say, Oh, you should have had your mouth open. He turned his astonished head, and, as a tall flower nodded towards him, he saw a dainty figure about the size of a grasshopper, with a face like that of a lovely little woman balancing itself above the shrubs about him. I heard your naughty speech, the voice went on, and I thought I would give you a lesson. You are talking nonsense, you know very well, because there is nothing in luck except in being in the right place at the right time and having your mouth open. That means that you must be all ready yourself to take the good that comes to you. Was it you that pulled me along the bank just now? Oh, no, rippled the soft, laughing voice. I never do anything myself. I have little people to work for me. Now, two of my servants, very plain creatures they are, but cheerful and good to have about one, are just the people to help you. I always call them right time and right place and I told them to drag you with their strong little hands to be ready when the plum fell, but you wouldn't open your mouth. And again the voice laughed in a teasing way. I wish I could have such slaves always, said Lawrence, growing a little red under this constant laughter. Well, she said, ever you will go, they shall go with you. If when you feel the touch of their little hands, you will obey them, they will lead you where and when the gifts of fortune shall be. All that you need to do is to remember to have your mouth open. Slowly, Lawrence rose and went home, a different boy from one of an hour ago. From that time it was astonishing to see how he prospered. Boys wondered and as he grew to manhood men wondered at his success 
when at the close of a long life full of honors and riches some one asked him the secret of his prosperity he said smiling right time and right place have been the leaders of my life and all that was left for me to do was to obey them and keep my mouth open when the plums fell End of section four recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. The Ogre Who Ate the Shaking Jelly by Martha Young. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. Grandma gave we Dick and Nelly each a saucer of shaking jelly. Dick gave the saucer a funny long look. He saw how the jelly shivered and shook. Oh, I see, said he, you're afraid of me. Then with a stern voice, and you'd better be, for spite of all your quaking now, I'm going to eat you anyhow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 6 of the Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Children's Wonder Book. Section 6 The Wizard's Palace. By Elton Craig. Once upon a time, a long while ago, a prince started out to seek his fortune. So he left the grim old castle, where he and his father and his father's father had been born, and took the world for his pillow, as they say in old legends. For, you see, a stay-at-home prince was not thought much of in those days, it being the fashion to have adventures. He started out one morning as soon as the sun was up and shining, and journeyed toward a great forest that stretched dim, deep, and mysterious away to the west. Now this forest was enchanted, and it was said that in the middle of it stood a wonderful palace that was as green as the ocean, and had a thousand and six little windows, with a dwarf looking out of each. In this castle lived a wizard, who was quite out of the common run of wizards, for he had nineteen legs and twenty-one hands, and a poor, pretty enchanted princess. Well, the prince reached the forest just at nightfall. It was a curious place, for every flower had a little head peeping out of it that nodded to him, and the tall trees shook their great sides with laughter, and, bending down, tried to wrap their arms around him as he passed. And this was truly dreadful, for if those goblin trees had once caught the prince, they would never have let him go. Suddenly he heard loud cries, and looking around, saw a will-o'-the-wisp rushing toward him, chased by a large bat, who was trying to blow out its lamp with its wings. Now everybody knows that a will-o'-the-wisp is of no use whatsoever without its light, so the prince drove the bat off with his cap. Many thanks, my dear prince, said a tiny voice in the dancing flame. When you reach the palace, remember to say, Breck cock, jock lock, to everything they ask you, and you will gain the princess. With that it danced off. The prince went on, and after a long time he reached the palace, which shone like the sun in the dark wood, and just as he reached it, the thousand and six little windows flew wide open, and a thousand and six dwarves stuck out their heads and screamed all together, Crack, crack, black. Brack, clock, jock, lock, answered the prince, and they all gave a horrible yell, dropped to the ground, and rushed into the forest. Come, they are done for anyway, said the prince, and he opened the door and went into the great hall, a wonderful place it was, to be sure. 
the floor was of gold, and the walls were covered with odd figures that danced and swayed and looked out laughing from between the cobweb curtains. Right in the middle of the hall was the old wizard, sitting in a great silver chair, with his twenty-one hands folded and his eyes shut, and by his side, in a little ivory chair, was the loveliest maiden the prince had ever seen. For her face was as fair as a lily, and her eyes as blue as the sky, while the lovely hair that rippled to her feet was like spun gold. Anyone could see with half an eye that she was a true princess. Just then the wizard opened his eyes, and seeing the prince, he seemed ready to die of rage, and jumped to his feet, roaring, Flip, flap, fiddle! Brick, rock, jock, rock, answered the prince, not in the least afraid. Then the wizard screamed and rushed at him. Dear me, how they fought, while the poor little princess got behind her chair and sobbed. But at last the prince gave him a dreadful slash that cut his head off, and then there was nothing left to do but to comfort the princess. The princess showed him where the wizard kept his treasure, and they put some chests of gold on two horses and rode away to the prince's castle. Then they were married. They had sixteen children, eight boys and eight girls, and the princess dressed the boys in blue and the girls in pink, and they all lived happily ever after. End of section six. The Alphabet Tree by Clara Dotty Bates. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. To Jack all play was good, all learning very bad, until one night when tired out, a charming dream he had in a wide garden space all shine and green stood he where in the sunniest fairest place grew an alphabet tree fruits purple gold and red bent every tiniest twig a's were apples the bunches of bees bananas yellow and big he spied an orange oh a plum that was P. C was a cherry, Q a quince, and a great blue grape was G. How full of juice they were, how ripe the syllable seed. And when he had eaten from every bough, behold, Jack liked to read. He ate from red streaked A, way down to X, Y, Z, and cried there never was anything so nice as this alphabet tree end of poem this recording is in the public domain section number eight of the children's wonder book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox Dot org. Recording by Janine Mary Solheim, Danvers, Massachusetts. The Children's Wonder Book, Section 8, Behind the Wardrobe, by Mary P. W. Smith. I hate the old thing, so there now, cried Ned Langdon, throwing his loathed arithmetic with all his might across the room. I just wish there was no such thing in the world as arithmetic, especially fractions. I know someone invented fractions just to torment boys. Ned was far from being a stupid boy. He really shone in history and geography. He stood fairly well even in grammar. He was a great reader and wrote the best compositions of any boy in his room. But he so detested arithmetic that a willful stupidity seemed to becloud and benumb all of his faculties whenever he went into that class. The blunders he made and the way in which he didn't know his lesson and couldn't do his problems were the despair of his unlucky teacher. Today he had fallen into even worse than usual disgrace. 
and had been kept after school to do problems when the first skating of winter had come and the moment school was out all the other boys had rushed off to bullhead pond to try it their merry voices echoed back into the gloomy deserted schoolroom darkening already as the short day declined toward evening and in the growing shadows ned and the master had stayed until nearly supper time it was too late to go skating when ned was finally released with the order to take his arithmetic home for evening study he had rushed home feeling himself an abused persecuted martyr and had amazed his mother by breaking into the room with a wail of despair already recorded ned i am surprised exclaimed his mother before she could say more she was further surprised by ned's giving his arithmetic a hearty kick that sent it flying nearly to the ceiling ned said his mother pick up your arithmetic and go to your own room your supper will be sent to you and by and by when you are in a more reasonable frame of mind i will come up and see you ned sulkily obeyed glaring at the hated arithmetic as he mounted the stairs feeling it the cause of all his troubles his supper was brought up by good-natured nora with whom ned was a great favorite and who did not hesitate to tell him that and her opinion it was a shame a doubtright shame so it was which rather comforted ned even though at bottom he knew he was in the wrong and that he was getting no more than he deserved as the darkness deepened ned began to grow sleepy and just to keep himself awake thought he would get his skates out of the wardrobe and see if they were in good order for tomorrow on opening his wardrobe he was surprised to see a small door in the rear that he never remembered noticing before opening it cautiously and peeping through to his amazement he found himself looking outdoors into a country new to him a pathway starting from the little door wound invitingly away over some pleasant-looking hills that hid the distant landscape ned was of an adventurous turn of mind so it did not take him long to decide to squeeze through the little door and set forth on the pathway resolved to see what lay beyond the hills he walked rapidly on full of curiosity and soon found himself at the top of the hill below him lay spread out a wide tract of country varied by farms villages rivers and brooks but ned saw at once that it was all strikingly different from any country he had ever seen everything was so regular exact precise the fields were divided by fences into either squares parallelograms or triangles the rivers ran through the land like straight deep ditches with no curves whenever their course changed they made a right angle instead of a bend and the little brooks which were also rigidly straight flowed into them at exact right angles all the houses were alike square with doors in the centre and precisely as many windows on one side as on the other as ned walked wonderingly down the hill he could not but notice that even the trees and bushes grew up perfectly perpendicular like walking sticks with exactly as many branches upon one side as on the other it seemed to him that their leaves and twigs took on the form of figures ned thought this must be only his fancy so he rubbed his eyes and looked again no wherever he looked a bewildering lot of fives sixes sevens eights etc waved about him this is queer thought ned he noticed too that the trees instead of being scattered about the fields irregularly here a clump there a group yonder scattered single ones stood with almost painful regularity in rows each just so many feet from its neighbors the effect of the whole landscape was very prim and precise and ned wondered at it greatly as he saw some boys playing in front of a house he was approaching he resolved to question them the boys had a game not unlike twelve men morris marked out on the ground with pegs and were jumping at right angles from peg to peg they stopped and stared as ned advanced and asked them what country do you call this why arithmetic land of course answered the largest boy ned hardly knew what this meant but pursued his inquiries what makes your trees grow so regularly 
Why, everything has to be planted by rule, of course, replied the boy, who, like his companions, looked extremely keen and wide awake. He was very thin and active, and seemed to cherish a fairly good opinion of himself. If that field is twenty rods square, what is its area? I don't know, said Ned, without stopping to think, as was rather his habit in arithmetic. In truth, he so detested it he would not try to think. He don't know, he don't know, shouted all the boys derisively. Why, stupid, said the first boy. It contains four hundred square rods, of course. Now, if you have three hundred and twenty-four trees you wish to set out in that field, in how many rows will you place them, and how far apart will the rows be? Ned, disgusted to find that this was what was involved in being in arithmetic land, answered again, I don't know. I should never set trees out like that. I should just let them come up any way. He'd let them come up any way, shouted the chorus of boys. What is your name? asked Ned of the oldest boy, who seemed to be regarding him with silent scorn. My name is A, replied the boy, and these others are B, C, and D. Ned shuddered. How often had he declared that he hated A, B, C, and D, who were always dividing things in such foolish, unnecessary ways, involving no end of fractions and consequent trouble for boys. But A was so small, though his face looked so keen and old, that Ned was moved to ask one more question. How old are you? That's easily told, replied A briskly. D is six years old, but I don't care how old D is, interrupted Ned. I asked your age. No matter, replied A severely. All questions must be solved by rule. D is six years old. Two-thirds of D's age is just one-third of my age. What is my age? Ned would not answer, but noticing that C had some apples and feeling hungry, he said, Give me an apple, will you? Ha! exclaimed C. Don't you wish you might now? I have only four apples. If I divided them equally among us five boys, what part of an apple would each boy receive? I don't know and I don't care, snapped Ned, his appetite for apples suddenly gone. He don't know and he don't care, shouted all the boys. Ned resolved to leave such disagreeable companions and push on, hoping for better things ahead. Remembering that, as it was only Tuesday, he still had some of the week's pocket money left. He resolved to walk on toward a village in the distance, where he would, of course, be able to purchase a supper. He ventured one more question, however, as he turned to go. How far is it to that village? he asked. If you walk at the rate of two and a half miles an hour, you will reach it in as many hours as one-third of fifteen multiplied by two, rattled off A. He can't tell, he can't tell, stupid, stupid, shouted the boys as Ned, with a puzzled look, turned and walked off. Presently a man overtook him, driving a fine horse. Will you give me a ride, please? asked Ned, uncertain of how many miles of walking lay before him. Certainly, said the man, who had a kind, pleasant face. Hop in. In Ned hopped, and away trotted the horse with a good will. This is a fine horse, remarked Ned, by way of opening conversation with his new friend. What does such a horse cost here? Well, I'll tell you, said the man pleasantly. I bought a cow and two sheep at the same time I bought the horse. The cow cost twice as much as the sheep, and the horse three times as much as the sheep, and they all together cost me one hundred and eighty dollars, so you can easily see what the horse costs. Oh, yes, indeed, said Ned hastily, hurrying to change the subject. What a nice, thrifty-looking orchard this is. Yes replied the man. It's mine. This is my farm. One half of these trees bear apples, one quarter peaches, one eighth pears, seven trees bear plums, and three cherries. Now how many trees should you say there were in that orchard? Ned would have been puzzled to tell, but luckily, as he thought, just then he saw over the stone wall a hound in hot pursuit of a fox. The fox was a long way ahead. 
over the ground they sped like lightning toward a piece of woods ha shouted ned standing up in his excitement see there see that fox run how the hound springs along i wonder if he'll catch the fox his friend seemed also somewhat excited by this spirited sight he said the fox had seventy-six rods start but that hound runs fifteen rods to every ten the fox runs in how many rods will the hound catch the fox oh i hope he won't catch him at all exclaimed ned i hope the fox will get away the man looked at him in mild surprise as if this were not the sort of answer he had expected but said nothing ned on his part now carefully refrained from stirring up his new friend by asking any more questions and they drove on for some time in silence until they came to a group of men working on a stone wall who seemed by their loud angry tones to be quarrelling ned's friend stopped the men seemed to know him and the employer said see here x i'll leave it to you c claims that he has the job of building this wall but i can't wait for him to do it alone and i've hired a and b to help a and b can build it in eight days but with C's help, they can do it in five. Now, how long do you say it will take C to do it alone? Ned was so fearful they might refer the question to him that he hastily said to his friend, I think I'll walk on now. I'm ever so much obliged for the ride. And, scrambling down, hastened on by himself. After trudging on a while, he began to feel tired. It was growing dark, and the road ahead seemed to run up a high hill, steep and rough looking particularly hard to climb ned was therefore glad to see a man approaching driving a flock of sheep good evening sir said ned as the man drew near what a large flock of sheep you must have a hundred at least no said the man not a hundred but if i had as many more one half as many more and two sheep and a half i should have one hundred how many but Ned hastily burst in. Excuse me, I'm in a great hurry. I'm tired and hungry, and I want to get to the next village as soon as possible. How far off is it? If you walk ten miles, began the drover. Ten miles, exclaimed Ned, his heart sinking within him. Don't interrupt. If you walk ten miles less eight, and divide the remainder by three, you will have the distance to Fractionville, the next village fractionville exclaimed ned horrified but i don't want to go there of all places but you have to go replied the drover but don't be frightened the road isn't so hard as it looks one step at a time and you get to the top before you know it you seem to be a stranger in these parts so i'll tell you something to your advantage don't be afraid of the fractions they are fractious seeming fellows to be sure but if you meet them bravely, you'll find out they're not so bad as they look. Good night. I must push on. The man to whom I sold these sheep is coming to meet me. We were ten miles apart when we started an hour ago. As he travels three miles an hour, while I only travel two, you can easily tell how soon we shall meet. Thank you. Good night, said Ned, hurrying away. At the foot of the hill, he was rejoiced to see a small country store. I'll have something to eat before I go another step, thought Ned. Examining his pocket, he found he had only fifteen cents, and decided to content himself with crackers and cheese, with possibly a few apples. He stepped into the store, and said to the storekeeper, a withered, precise-looking old gentleman, who peered sharply at Ned through his glasses, I'll take half a dozen of those crackers, please. How much are they? Ahem, said the old gentleman. Those are expensive crackers. I bought eight boxes of them and paid for them with cider at four dollars a barrel. It took six barrels of cider to pay for them. There are twenty dozen crackers in a box. Now, if you will tell me what one half dozen cost me, and add one cent and a half, which is my profit, that will be what you owe me. The old gentleman rattled all this off in a matter-of-course way, as if this were quite the ordinary way of selling crackers. "'I can't tell,' said Ned, gazing hungrily at the crackers. "'You can't, hey? 
then you're not so smart as the boys of your age in these parts. I'll pay whatever you say, said Ned meekly. We don't say, said the gentleman testily, replacing the box of crackers on its shelf. People have to find out for themselves. Ned thought he would make one more effort. How much are your apples apiece? he asked, looking longingly at a basket of large red apples. I sell oranges, began the storekeeper. Apples! I want apples! shouted Ned, thinking the old man must be deaf. I sell oranges, continued the old man sternly, at three for six cents. Apples are worth only half as much as oranges. Now, what is the price of an apple? Ned's head felt so confused by all he had heard in this puzzling land that it was some time before he ventured to falter timidly. One cent. Q.E.D., said the storekeeper, brightening up and handing Ned five apples in return for his nickel. Ned had barely taken one enormous bite when a farmer entered the store to buy cloth for a suit of clothes. He selected a piece and said he would take three and three-fifths yards. The storekeeper said it was five dollars a yard, and turning to Ned, remarked, He expects to pay this for cloth with butter at three dollars a box. How many boxes will it take? Ned mumbled something about being in a hurry, plunged out the door, and began to rush up the hill, so anxious to escape these perpetual problems that he forgot, for the moment, that Fractionville lay just ahead. But suddenly, through the growing twilight, he saw strange forms running down the hill, a whole swarm of them. Instinctively, Ned turned to flee, but in an instant he was surrounded and seized, while a wild yell of triumph went up from his captors. He realized that he was in the clutches of his deadly foes, the Fractions. We have him at last, shrilly screamed the leader of the band, whose name Ned soon learned was Eight Ninths. Hold him fast, Two Forts. Don't let him escape. Bring him right to the problem quadrangle and we'll put him through. He hates Fractions, does he? We'll show him. Seizing him at once in their bony hands, they bore him up the hill so rapidly that he was too much out of breath to speak, even had he been inclined. As they swept on, Eight Ninths, noticing Ned's apples, said, Subtract those apples from the prisoner and divide them among the company, which operation was quickly and accurately performed, and Ned was left to brew ruefully over the problem. If a boy has five apples and you subtract five apples from him, how many apples will he have left? At the top of the hill, Ned was borne by his captors into a large building and into its dining room, apparently, as a long table was set in the apartment. Ned was now able to see the fractions. They had high, bald foreheads and wonderfully sharp, quick eyes. They seemed to be clothed in fragments. No one had on a whole suit. Each wore a broad belt, which seemed to divide him into two parts. All were maimed. Some lacked a leg, some an arm, some a foot or a hand. But whatever portion was missing, all had heads, and they were all so wiry and active that a few trifles of limbs gone seemed no obstacle to their activity. A delicious smell of dinner now penetrated the room. A bell rang, and, to Ned's relief, the fraction seemed to be genuine boys in their appetites, at least judging by the headlong rush they made for the dinner table, bearing Ned with them. Ned now remembered the drover's advice, not to be afraid of the fractions, as they were really very good fellows at bottom. He began to think the man must be right, and to feel in better spirits. Presiding at the head of the table was an exceedingly keen, wide-awake-looking man, whom Ned afterward learned was the original lightning calculator. Ned was seated next below him. Soup was the first course. The lightning calculator took off the cover of the tureen, letting out a most appetizing, savory steam. Ladle in hand, he said to Ned, This ladle holds a quarter of a pint of soup. The tureen holds a gallon and a half. If I give each boy two ladles full, how much will he receive? This almost took Ned's appetite away, big as it was. In dismay, he faltered out the old familiar school answer. I don't know. The fraction boys were all holding up their hands, 
wriggling them frantically and grinning derisively at Ned. Next, said the lightning calculator. Eight ninths, who sat next, rose to his feet and rattled off glibly. If in one gallon of soup there are four quarts, in one and a half gallons there are six quarts. If in one quart there are two pints, in six quarts there are six times two pints, which are twelve pints. Twelve divided by twenty-four equals twelve twenty-fourths, which, reduced, equals one half. Therefore, each boy will receive one half pint of soup. Those who think the answer correct may raise their hands, said the lightning calculator quickly. All hands went up instantly but Ned's, and all the boys were served with soup except Ned. Can't I have any soup? whined Ned. Certainly not, sir, said the lightning calculator severely. Those who don't know can't eat in Fractionville. Keep your wits about you and look sharp when the next course comes. While the rest were eating, Ned had time to look about him. The walls of the room were made wholly of blackboards. The somber effect, however, was relieved by the chalkwork which covered them from top to bottom, problem upon problem, so that it really made Ned's headache to look at these decorations. There was not a whole dish upon the table. The cloth consisted of three joined, and, as Ned noticed later, the food was all divided into sections or portions. The soup was now carried out and roast meat and vegetables brought in. Ned pulled himself together, resolving to be very bright. How much beef at eighteen cents a pound can you buy for a dollar and eighty cents? Ned was asked. One pound, he shouted, jumping at a hasty answer, then seeing his mistake, but too late. Next, said the lightning calculator, before the fatal words were hardly out of Ned's mouth, and he saw there was no meat for him while all the fraction boys laughed and seemed to enjoy their roast beef with livelier relish because Ned had none. Nor could he tell at once how many bushels of potatoes, at forty-five cents a bushel, you must give for six pecks of onions at fifteen cents a peck. So he had no vegetables. When the bread was passed, he did manage to say that, if bread were ten cents a loaf, he could buy ten loaves for one dollar, and twenty loaves for two dollars, so he had a large slice of delicious bread, delicious partly because he was so hungry. A little encouraged now, and stimulated by the atmosphere around him, so to speak, as well by hunger, he actually managed to say that if cheese were eighteen cents a pound, and you wished to pay for it with butter at twenty cents a pound, it would take nine pounds of butter to buy ten pounds of cheese. So he had both butter and cheese, and he felt that he deserved it, too, after such an effort as that. All this made him exceedingly sharp for his dessert, especially as he saw that it consisted chiefly of lemon pie. Now, said the lightning calculator, look sharp. If eight pies be each divided into sixths, and those sixths divided equally among twenty-four boys, what part of a pie would each boy receive? Ned's mind, strained to its utmost, worked with a lightning-like rapidity never displayed in his arithmetic class. Six times eight are forty-eight, twenty-four and forty-eight twice, he dashed through mentally, then shouted, two sixths, before the question was hardly out of the lightning calculator's mouth. Very good indeed, said the lightning calculator. You are improving. You should have said one-third, but you shall have one piece of pie. Your answer was so nearly correct, and I will take your other sixth myself. Four large watermelons were now brought on. Ned loved watermelon as much as he hated arithmetic, and he had not seen one yet this season, so he looked very animated. The lightning calculator said, You shall have one-fourth of this melon. Ned's face shone with anticipation. If you will divide it as follows, one-fourth to yourself, Two-fifths to me, three-tenths to eight-ninths there, and the balance to six-sevenths. Alas and alas, Ned could not divide it, and the melon was withdrawn from his reluctant hands and placed before eight-ninths, who quickly and cleverly divided it into twenty parts and distributed it as requested, and was soon reveling in the quarter that might have been Ned's. 
After dinner, the fractions proposed to play messenger boy. Ned cheerfully followed them, as he liked that game. But the fraction boys played it quite differently from the way to which he was accustomed. Instead of playing it with little figures representing messenger boys on a checkered board, the floor of a large room was marked off in squares. The boys donned messenger caps and hopped themselves from square to square, going forward or back, according to their answers to arithmetical questions put by the lightning calculator. It may be supposed Ned did not shine in this game. He was the laughing stock of all the boys, who passed on far ahead while he stuck again and again on stupidity and was forced to go back to carelessness. Finally, he reached inattention, whence he was sent back to discipline, where he had to stand on a dunce block with a fool's cap on his head until the game broke up. Ned was so completely fagged by these agreeable diversions that he was only too glad when the lightning calculator announced that it was bedtime. He wearily followed the fraction boys upstairs into a large room where stood several beds. To his dismay, the lightning calculator said to him, You will share this bed with six-sevenths, five-eighths, and nine-tenths. You will easily see what portion of the bed belongs to you. But, remonstrated Ned, I don't wish to sleep with anyone. I want a whole bed to myself. The fraction boys roared at this. Do hear him, they said. He must think he is an integer. I am, exclaimed Ned, glancing down proudly on his strong legs and arms, where not even a toe or finger was lacking. Boy, said the lightning calculator, it is a wise boy that knows himself. You are not even one ninety-ninth. Your grandmother always insisted that you had no head for arithmetic. You have no head. Ned raised his hands to his head. Alas, they met in vacancy, just where his brain should have been. Horrified at this discovery, he gave a great groan and woke up to find himself lying on the floor before his wardrobe and his mother bending over him with an anxious look. Ned, she exclaimed, still shaking him, wake up. You seem to have been having such a bad dream. Ned sat up and felt his head in a bewildered way. It's all there, he said. Come, Ned, said his mother, laughing. You're not half awake yet. Come downstairs and get your arithmetic lesson for tomorrow, and then you can go to bed and do your sleeping in more comfortable fashion. The next day, when Ned presented himself in arithmetic class, instead of the usual bored, listless, inattentive look and air that were his teacher's despair, his face wore such a wide-awake, smiling look that the teacher was alarmed and watched him carefully, thinking some new form of mischief must be brewing. But when Ned went to the board and actually performed correctly a quite difficult problem in fractions, following it with an explanation so quick and clear that it would have done credit to the lightning calculator himself, the master, equally pleased and surprised, said, Well done, Ned. I have always told you that you had as good a head for arithmetic as any boy in the room, if you would only give attention and try. In short, now that Ned could see an amusing side to arithmetic, and could fancy himself battling and overcoming his old foes, the fraction boys, he no longer hated it, and that made all the difference in the world. End of Section 8「Section 9 of the Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T.J. Burns. The Children's Wonder Book. A Windy Story by Nora A. Smith. Perhaps you may not know it, but all the winds. Zephyrus, Notus, Boreas, and Eurus live on an island, and with their king, Aeolus. It is the strangest kind of an island, for there are four different kinds of weather on it, and all at the same time. The western part, which belongs to Zephyrus, is sunny and bright. Birds sing there, sweet flowers bloom, 
and the dear dimpled baby winds are always playing hide-and-seek in the leaves. The northern part belongs to Boreas. All is blustering and cold there. The ground is shining white with snow, the streams are frozen thick with ice, and the sturdy winds wear fur coats and mittens and pelt each other with snowballs when they go out to play. They practice their blowing exercises every morning, and Boreas gives prizes to those who can blow the strongest. Boreas himself lives in a deep ice cave and walks about leaning on a stout glittering icicle, all muffled in furs and with a great white bear running by his side. The east is Eurus' home. How gray the sky is, full of dark clouds always ready to send down rain and hail. Eurus is a hard, rough old fellow, and the young winds are very much like him. Their favorite play is called Going A-Shivering. They all take hold of hands and dance and sing in a circle. The chorus is nothing but shivering and teeth-shaking and blowing, and he's the best wind who can blow the others down. I don't call it a nice play myself, but if I were an east wind, I dare say I should think it great fun. The southern part of the island the home of Notus is very warm indeed. Tigers and lions roam about in the high grass. There are long-tailed green and red birds in the trees, and even monkeys swinging by their tails from branch to branch. The winds are lazy and sleep most of the time, but now and then they awake in a rage and blow very wildly, tearing the flowers to pieces, frightening the birds from their perches, and uprooting the great trees. All the little wind children go to school every day and learn many things. The points of the compass, of course, the way to sail the ships, to turn the mills, to chase the clouds away, and a great many more difficult studies, such as how to make a monsoon and the proper strength of a cyclone. None of the winds are ever allowed to come to earth where the children live until they have been to school, and King Aeolus thinks they know how to behave. I'm sorry to say, however, that you can't tell any more about winds than you can about children. Sometimes they are extremely naughty when they really know how to be good and could be if they chose. That was how it happened with little Boreas one day. I forgot to say, didn't I, that all the young winds were named after their fathers. It was the custom of the country, and you had to tie a tag on yourself to make sure which was you and which somebody else. Little Boreas had been promised that as soon as he knew his catechism and his wind song and could spell aeronaut, which is a very difficult word, I can tell you, he might go to earth and have a long play day with the children. He could say his catechism nicely. It began with easy things, such as, What is your name? And, Who gave you that name? And went on to the whole duty of a good wind and other difficult questions. The answers were all in rhyme, so that they would be simpler to remember, and the last two lines of the whole duty of a wind were, to make no trouble and pleasure double. That's easy enough, said little Boreas. Easier to say than to do, said his father. But you'd better go and try. Of course, I don't expect you to be soft and gentle like your cousin Zephyrus. Your family is a strong and rollicking one. But try to do some good whenever you blow. And don't tease the children. No, indeed, said little Boreas. And away he blew, singing his song in a deep, strong voice. The weathercock soon felt little Bo whizzing along and turned his golden tail to the north. You must move quickly for the Boreas family, said he, or they'll blow you down. They don't like to wait for rusty joints. What fun, said little Bo. That big shiny thing 
turn just for me. Let's see. Aren't there any more? Oh, yes. There were several more. A great fish on Jack's stable. A horse on a barn across the way. A golden arrow on the church steeple. And each obediently turned as Bo bade him. How strong I must be, said Bo. Everything moves when I speak. Hurrah! There's a boy with a kite. Now see me send it up. It was Jack's new kite. And it was a little timid yet about flying, for it hadn't had much experience. Whoop! Halloo! cried Boreas and ran for it. Oh, gently, gently, begged the kite. You'll break my string. How about that catechism you learned? Make no trouble and pleasure double. It's no trouble to the boy, said Bo. I'm doing all the work. And of course, it's double the pleasure for me to blow hard. So, fly away with you. Up went the kite, not daring to talk any longer. Away ran Jack after it, tugging at the string, when, oh dear me, what a pity. Bo wrapped the tail round the telegraph wire. There, you rude thing, said the kite. See what you've done. And you'll make Jack cry. He's so little. Now how are you going to get me down? Get you down indeed, <laughs> laughed Boreas. I'm too busy. You may thank me for putting you up so high. You couldn't have done it yourself. And away he whizzed, leaving the kite sadly hanging to the wires and Jack crying. Rude little Boreas traveled some distance before he found any new mischief quite to his mind. But he amused himself very nicely on the road, blowing roosters' tails the wrong way, puffing the smoke in people's eyes, flapping the wet clothes in the washerwoman's face, whirling the leaves about in a mad dance that made them giddy, and pulling at the flags till they stood out straight in the air and begged their poles to let them free. At last he met a flock of children coming from school. How he jumped at them and whistled with glee. He blew Ruth's hair into her eyes so that she couldn't see the way and fell into a puddle. He turned Mary's cape inside out over her head. He blew Tom's papers out of his hand and over a high fence, and then tweaked off Harry's cap and made him run for it. Ha <laughs> ha! laughed little Bo. I call this fun. Great fun for you, said an old tree standing near. But I thought your father told you not to tease the children. That's true said Boreas. But this is only play, and I'll be good pretty soon. However, he traveled a little more slowly for a few minutes. But quite nearby, on a pretty little pond, Dick was launching a toy ship. She was painted bright blue with her name, Nancy Lee, in gold letters on the stern. And on her deck, sat a beautiful doll in a sailor dress of blue and white. It was Nellie's dolly, and she brought her to have a sail on the new boat. The Nancy Lee slid gracefully into the water, and Bo came up just in time to fill the sails and begin the journey. The dolly really had a delightful time at first, for Bo blew very gently, remembering what the old tree had said. But in a few minutes, this grew very tiresome. Come on, Nancy, he cried. Let's see how fast you can go. And he gave the boat such a sudden push that she bent over almost to the water. She righted herself in a minute and flew like a bird over the angry waves Boreas had made. But where was the passenger? 
Oh, my dolly, my dolly, cried Nellie from the bank as the yellow head and blue dress sank below the water. Has that awkward doll fallen off? cried Boreas. Now I have been naughty. And he stopped a minute to consider what he should do. Did he, while he was thinking, did he hear a deep, strong voice somewhere calling, Boreas, Boreas, come home. Or was it the tree's sign? Oh, never mind, he said. Dick is going to get the doll. And brave Dick waded deep into the water and pulled the poor thing out with her yellow hair all dripping and her pretty dress soaking wet. Nellie took her in her arms and cried all the way home. <laughs> and Boreas started off in a hurry so as not to see the tears. He really felt quite sad and said to himself several times, now I really must begin to make no trouble and pleasure double. In a minute, though, he rushed to a roof where a shingle was loose and was just about to send it flying down on Rover's head when he certainly did hear, close to his ears, Boreas, come home, come home. I'm afraid it's King Aeolus, he said. But I won't go just yet all the same. And he whizzed away to a tree nearby where a mother robin was cuddling five specks of baby robins. The mother didn't see Boreas, and as it was time for her to get up and rest her legs, she fluttered away, leaving her darlings with only rude little Bo for their nursemaid. In a minute, he came tumbling along and looked into the nest. His very breath made the birdlings shiver, and when he began to rock them, they all twittered with fear. You fraidy cats, he called. I won't hurt you. I'm just going to rock you a bit. And away went the nest, tossing like a ship in a storm. One wee birdie nearest the edge was so little and weak that he couldn't hold himself in and he fell over to the ground, calling and crying for his mother. Boreas! 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 called King Aeolus again, and this time in so loud and strong a voice that the doors and the windows rattled and the trees shivered. Little Boreas himself shook and trembled at the angry voice and felt all at once as if he must have been very naughty indeed. He didn't dare stop another minute, but flew to the north at the top of his speed. But as he came nearer and nearer his island home, he blew more and more slowly and began to think of Jack's kite and Harry's cap, of Ruth's curls, and Nellie's doll, and of the poor frightened baby robins. Slower he went until he almost crept, and then he began to cry. <laughs> Great drops that fell to the earth so fast that children ran to the windows and cried, Oh, dear, it's raining. King Aeolus and his father were both waiting for him, and they felt very sad when he came along sobbing. <laughs> I will be good. Oh, I will be good. Be quiet, Bo, said the king, and tell me if you're not ashamed of having been such a naughty wind today. <laughs> Yes, sir, said Bo, in so tiny a voice that you wouldn't have believed it could belong to him. And are you sorry? said his father. <laughs> y y yes, sir, 
sobbed Boreas. I'm very much disappointed in you, said Aeolus, and you cannot go to Earth any more until you are a better wind. You are to go away by yourself without any work and sit on the ice all alone to think about being good. Some day I shall send you to Earth to undo some of your mischief. Zephyrus can go down and play with the children. He won't tangle their hair and drown their dolls. <laughs> oh, dear. I never will again, either. I'm so sorry, cried little Bo. And he gave his hand to his father and went away crying. <laughs> he sat down by himself on the ice as the king had commanded and was very, very sorry. So sorry that he wept a little river of tears that kept freezing and freezing around him. Indeed, if Notice hadn't passed by and melted him a little, I'm afraid he'd have been there still. But I know he's good now, for the other morning he came into my garden, and though he was cold, and though he blew hard, yet he tried to be helpful, and he brought a host of sunbeams with him to make the world look brighter. End of Section 9 Recording by T.J. Burns The Tax Gatherer by John B. Tabb Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. But pray, who are you? said the Violet Blue to the bee with surprise at his wonderful size in her eyeglass of dew. I, madame, quoth he, am a publican bee, collecting the tax on honey and wax. Have you nothing for me? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Little Peppercorn by E. Cavazza Read for LibriVox.org by Betty B. Little Peppercorn Will you hear the story of Peppercorn? Dear Little Peppercorn, a boy he became, but a bean he was born. Dear Little Peppercorn. A Smyrna Folktale A woman went across a field to sow some beans in early spring. She thought how much the land would yield and of the price her beans would bring when they were ripe and fairly grown and as she worked there all alone she saw how every little bean was plump and round and white and clean and said i would these beans so fine were every one a child of mine nay these indeed were not too many but i alas must grieve and pine for chick or child i have not any behold as from her fingers fell the beans she scattered on the ground they changed to children who can tell how many dancing in a round i know not what this wonder means she cried go back into my basket and all be beans as heretofore and i will wish for nothing more or if i do i will not ask it and all went back and all were beans save only one a little boy she took him home and he became her husband's pet the household joy and peppercorn they called his name because the little boy was small as any fly upon the wall but one sad day alas for him incautiously with tug and toil he climbed upon the kettle's rim wherein the soup was set to boil the steam arose his sight grew dim he slipped fell in and could not swim the woman came her soup to skim pity she had not come more soon she found him floating on the broth and took him in a silver spoon and dried him in a linen cloth but drowned in the soup was peppercorn dear little peppercorn the woman went weeping the man went unshorn for dear little peppercorn when the dove heard the news she plucked out every feather and why said the tree for peppercorn 
the tree shook its apples they fell all together and why said the well for peppercorn the well poured its water all out on the sand and why said the maid for peppercorn the maid broke the pitcher she had in her hand and why said the queen for peppercorn the queen broke her arm when for grief she fell down and why said the king for peppercorn the king of the land threw away his gold crown and why said the people for peppercorn for dear little peppercorn the woman is weeping the man is unshorn the dove and the tree and the well are forlorn the maid and the queen and the king they all mourn for dear little peppercorn and this was the end of peppercorn dear little peppercorn end of poem this recording is in the public domain a boy's thunder by hugh c middleton read for librivox dot org by by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c they are grinding in the skies i hear the rocks turn i almost can smell the hot meal burn they are grinding for here is a sprinkling of mist the first mealy dust from the first run of grist the old mill rattles the overshot turns the rocks go spinning the hot meal burns they are grinding for now comes the water down pouring there's rattle and splatter against the mill flooring they are grinding for fast the miller boys come they are grinding for scudding the boys go home their white sacks are loaded for see the downpour when they get overhead to the mill house door the weir gate is heightened for every big turn oh hear the mill rattle and smell the mill burn end of poem this recording is in the public domain Section 13 of The Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bryn Villers, Honolulu, Hawaii. The Children's Wonder Book. The Thrilling Story of Captain Noman by Charles Remington Tallest. Archie and Clement, two boys just out of knickerbockers and just into Greek, were sitting on the steps of the back piazza one September afternoon with their first Greek books in their laps. They were not studying much, however. It was not a good place to study. The day was too fine, and the outdoor scene with the green lawn and a tennis court, and the grape garden beyond, and the stable yard where Dennis was washing carriages, and Lance, the big mastiff, lay asleep in the sun, was too attractive. But the rule had been made that they should give an hour to tomorrow's lessons each afternoon before going out to play, and here they were. "'Bother the Greek!' Archie exclaimed. "'It has bothered me enough already, although we've not yet learned the alphabet. What's the use of learning Greek, anyway?' "'I'm never going to Greece, am I? For my part, I abominate them!' Latin and Greek both. Hi, hi, here broke in a cheery voice beside them. What's that you say about Latin and Greek? Never speak ill of the dead languages, my boy. De mortuis nil nisi bonum. They looked up, and there was Leroy, dressed in his tennis flannels, and with his racket under his arm. Leroy was a student at Harvard. He had no lessons to get this bright afternoon. His school did not begin until the last of the month. Leroy took out his watch and stood a moment, looking at it, and at the boys. "'Look here, you fellows,' said he. "'I'll tell you what I'll do. I've got just fifteen minutes. Now if you'll promise to study hard and make up for it when I've done, I'll stop and tell you a story.' The promise, as may well be imagined, was readily given. So Leroy sat down on the step. Once, 
There was a man, he began, and then paused a moment as though to get his facts together. This man was a great fellow, he went on. Some people consider him a hero, but I don't think I should call him that. To my mind, he was nothing more than a common adventurer, after all, who sailed about, from one place to another, doing about as he pleased and helping himself to what he liked. Was he a pirate? inquired Archie. Well, yes. I don't know, but you might call him a pirate. He may not have sailed under the black flag, but I dare say he had a red one or some other color. Like the Red Rover, you know. What was his name? asked Clement. Oh, said Leroy. He had various names, as pirates do. At the time I'm telling you of, he called himself Noman. Captain Noman. Well, one day Captain Noman was cruising about in his ship when the lookout at the masthead reported land in sight. The ship's course was accordingly altered, and about four o'clock in the afternoon they came to anchor off the shore of a lofty island. Was it an island in the Spanish main? Clement interrupted to inquire. Clement had lately been reading some articles on the buccaneers and marooners of the Spanish main, and these, with the pictures that illustrated them, were still vividly in his mind. No, said Leroy, it was not in the Spanish main. But it was in a sea quite as full of islands as that is, and quite as thickly infested with pirates. All right, interposed Archie, nodding impatiently. Go on, please, Leroy, and tell us what they did. Did they go ashore? Fifteen minutes was not a very long time in which to tell a story, and Archie did not want any of it wasted. Yes, said Leroy. The captain ordered out his gig, and they pulled ashore. Come to think of it, I believe it was the cutter, though. The gig would have been too small, you see. He wanted to take as many men as he could, for he didn't know what dangers he might encounter. And besides, they were going in search of supplies. They left one man at the beach to look out for the boat, and the rest of them, with Captain Noman at their head, started off to explore the island. They wandered about for a long time without meeting any inhabitants or finding anything that it seemed to them worth their while to appropriate. By and by, however, they came suddenly upon a big hole in the side of the mountain. They peered into it, but could see nothing, and presently, mustering courage, they went in. They found themselves in a huge cavern, hollowed out of the rocks, and after a moment, as their eyes became accustomed to the gloom, they perceived that somebody lived there, and that the place was used as a sort of dairy. There were several neatly kept pens or enclosures in which were lambs and kids, and on the rocky shelves around there were great quantities of cheeses and vessels of milk and cream. They were very glad to see all this. Those are just the things that sailors like, you know, when they've been at sea a long while and live on salt, junk, and biscuit. Then they were proceeding to help themselves when all at once they heard a noise outside as though somebody were throwing down a whole cord of wood at once and then the mouth of the cavern was darkened and the owner entered. And such a fellow as he was, the very sight of him was enough to set them quaking in their sea boots and wishing with all their hearts they were safe on board ship again. He was a perfect giant in stature, as large strong as a dozen ordinary men, and his face, with its heavy jaw, its teeth that looked like tushes, its tangled beard and hair, and its one great, round, glaring eye was absolutely frightful. Strangely enough, he only had one eye, and that was in the middle of his forehead. He drove into the cavern a flock of sheep and goats, and then rolled to the opening, completely stopping it up, a huge rock so heavy that twenty oxen could not have drawn it. And there were Captain Noman and his men shut up in the place with that horrible monster with no possible way to get out. You can imagine how they felt. They did not feel any better either when the monster, glancing about the cavern, presently discovered them. Who are you? 
he demanded in a voice so deep and loud that it rolled and reverberated against the walls of the cave, just as a peal of thunder might have done. At this, Captain Noman stepped forward and tremblingly explained that they were a band of innocent voyagers who had landed upon the island in search of water and provisions, and who humbly besought his hospitality. The monster did not deign them a single word in reply. He simply glared at them a moment with his terrible eye, and then, reaching out one of his long arms, he seized two of the men and hurled them bodily against the side of the cavern, dashing their brains out instantly. Then... Having thus killed them, he actually sat down on a rock and with great apparent relish proceeded to devour them. You see, he was a cannibal. Meanwhile, Captain Noman and his crew huddled themselves together in the darkest corner they could find and fearfully watched him, wondering what he would do next. Oh, I say, broke in Archie at this point with some show of disappointment. This isn't a true story, is it? Couldn't be. Never mind if it isn't, cried Clement eagerly. Please go on, Leroy. True or not, Clement was intensely interested, as was Archie too, for that matter. Only Archie was a good deal of a realist. So Leroy went on without saying whether the story was true or not. Well, pretty soon after this, the monster without seeming to take any further thought as to his prisoners, stretched his enormous length on the floor of the cavern and fell fast asleep. And then, one would think, was Captain Noman's time. Up to this moment, he had no thought of making an attack. Well, he knew that though he and his men numbered quite a company, they were no match for such an adversary. But now that he was asleep, what could be easier than to fall upon him with their cutlasses and put an end to him? And the crew all thought so to a man, but Captain Noman shook his head. He was a wise fellow, celebrated the world over for his cunning. No, my brave boys, said he, that will never do at all. For you don't see, there is that big rock at the door of the cavern. We could never move it from its place ourselves. Not if we put our shoulders to it at once and gave a heave altogether. The giant is the only one that can move it, and if we go and kill him, why, we'll just be shut up here, unable to get out, and doomed to die a miserable death. Which was all quite true, and the men saw that it was so, and there was nothing for them to do but bide their time and wait and see what the morrow would bring forth. The next morning, the first thing the monster did was to repeat his dreadful performance of the night before. He seized two more of the men and dashed them against the walls, and then ate them for breakfast. After that, he rolled the rock from the door, drove out his sheep and goats, and then carefully replacing the rock, went away, leaving Captain Noman and his men still imprisoned in the cave. Then... They held a long consultation as to what it was best to do. Captain Noman at length hit upon a plan. He directed his men to take a huge bar of wood which stood there against the wall, and which apparently was used by the monster for a staff, and to sharpen the end of it as sharp as they could get it. Then he told them to season the point well in the fire that had been left burning, and after that to hide it carefully in the straw so they would know where to find it when it was wanted. And this being done, he selected four of the coolest and bravest of his men, and taking them apart, instructed them fully as to the manner in which they were to assist him when the time came in the daring project he had in view. The monster came home at night at the expected time, drove in his flocks as before, and then closed up the door again with the boulder. Next, he milked his ewes and set the milk apart in the pans, some for drink and some for the cream to rise. And then, just as they knew he would, of course, but not a thing could the poor fellows do to prevent it, he laid hold of two more of the ill-fated band and slew and ate them as before. 
when he had finished his horrible supper, and while he was sitting there by the fire, comfortable and self-satisfied as people are apt to be after a hearty meal, Captain Noman stepped up to him and offered him some wine that they had brought with them, for trading purposes, I suppose, when they came on shore. The monster took it and drank it, and then eagerly called for more, which Captain Noman freely gave him as often as he wished it. This made the old fellow, by and by, grow quite hilarious. He asked Captain Noman his name, which the captain told him, of course, and vowed that he was a fine fellow and promised him that in consideration of his distinguished merits he should be the very last one of the party to be devoured, a promise by which, as you may imagine, the captain was not particularly elated. At length the monster began to show signs of drowsiness. He nodded stupidly as he sat there, tried to rouse himself once or twice, and then, all in a moment, he fell over on the floor and was sound asleep. Then, surely enough, the time for action had come. Captain Noman called for the sharpened stake, and thrusting the end of it into the flames, kept it there until the point, though not blunted at all, was just a solid burning coal of fire. Then, while not a sound was heard in the cave save the deep breathing of the sleeper, the captain with the four men whom he had chosen took firm hold of the stake. It was very heavy and cumbersome, you know, and a very delicate piece of work it was, too, that they had in hand. And raising it straight up in the air, they held it poised for an instant directly above the horrible eye of the slumbering monster of a cannibal. Then... With all their might, they brought it down, making sure of their dreadful but necessary work. Then, what a scene took place! The monster sprang instantly to his feet, roaring with pain, but utterly unable to see anything about him, his sight, of course, being totally destroyed. He began rushing up and down the cavern, fairly beside himself, seeking to lay hands on the captain and his men, who, he well knew, must have done him this injury. But they, keeping perfectly silent and moving nimbly about, were easily able to avoid him now that his sight was gone. His loud cries, however, quickly brought some of his neighbors. It seems that there were neighbors, after all, to the door, who called out to know what was the matter and why he disturbed their slumbers in this way at this time of night. Oh, friends, the monster cried in reply, I am dying. And no man gives the blow. Oh, ho, they answered to this. If no man hurts thee, then it is the stroke of heaven. And so saying, they went back to their beds again, leaving him still howling. There was no more sleep in the cavern that night, you may be sure, either for the monster or for Captain Noman and his men. The one could not sleep for pain, the others for anxiety, and a long, dreary night they had of it. But morning came at last, and by and by the monster, blind and beside himself though he was, prepared to drive out his flock as usual. He was very cunning, however. As soon as he had rolled away the rock, he sat himself down right beside the opening, and calling to the sheep and goats to pass out, he carefully felt of each one of them as they went by to be sure that none of his prisoners went with them. It was evident that he did not mean them to escape. But Captain Noman was quite his match in cunning, at any rate. He quickly whispered to his men to take some willow withs that were lying on the floor of the cave, and to tie the rams of the flock together, three abreast, and as fast as this could be done, he directed the men one by one to suspend themselves on the underside of the middle ram, taking firm hold. And so, one after another, they, every one of them, passed safely out. You see, they were protected on either side by the other two rams, and the monster, in passing his hand over them, only felt of the back of the middle of the ram. Captain Noman himself was the last to pass out. He was a true sailor, and he knew that the captain should always be the last man to quit the post of danger. And so they made their escape. They were not yet out of the woods, however. 
The old fellow soon discovered that they were gone and came out blind, though he was in hot pursuit. He followed them by the sound, for you see, they drove some of the sheep and goats down to the boat to take on board the ship, and these made quite a noise. So he arrived at the beach just after they had pushed off. Captain Noman, while the boat was still only a short distance from shore, called out to him exultingly that he was well repaid for his cruelty to their comrades, whereupon the monster, picking up a huge piece of rock, hurled it with all his might in the direction of the voice. And he came very near hitting them, too. The rock just cleared the stern of the boat, and it made such a splashing and commotion that they were nearly swamped as it was. You may be sure Captain Noman did not shout again, till they were well out of stone's throw. Then he could not refrain from repeating his cry just to let the monster know that they were safe. And that, said Leroy, getting up from the step, is the end of my story. Archie and Clement each drew a long breath. They had been deeply interested. It's a good story, declared Archie with emphasis. Indeed it is, cried Clement. A capital story. Did you make it up, Leroy? No, said Leroy. I read it. I have the book in the house. Would you like to see it? It's full of such stories. Indeed we would, cried both boys together. Well, Archie, you go and get it, will you? It's a green book with red edges. You'll find it on the library table. I was using it this morning. So Archie jumped up and ran in, and presently he came out again with slower step and rather a crestfallen air holding the open book in his hand. Why, said he, this is all printed in Greek, just like what we are studying. Leroy burst out laughing. <laughs> to be sure it is, cried he. It's Homer's Odyssey. But the story of Captain Noman is there, almost exactly as I've told it to you. It's the story of Ulysses and Polyphemus, and the book is full of just such stories. You ought to read it. But we can't read it, said Archie ruefully. Oh, yes, you can, after you've studied a while. You'll have to read it, you know, or something equivalent to it before you can get into college. But look here. Leroy took out his watch again and whistled softly as he looked at it. <whistles> Ooh, I'm behind time already, said he. I ought to be over at the Evans's this minute. But I'll give you the moral of my story. You just pitch in for two or three years and study your Latin and Greek faithfully. And you'll begin to see then, much better than you can now, what they are good for. You'll like them too. And you'll find they'll let you into a lot of good things besides stories about monsters with only one eye in their heads. I can't stop any longer, but remember you promised to go to work like good fellows and learn your lessons. Good day to you. And off he went. Archie slowly turned over the leaves of the book. His eyes dwelt longingly on one page and then on another, though one was very much like another to him. I declare, he said, it would be nice if we could dig this out, wouldn't it? And read all the stories? Yes, said Clement, it would. But the only way to be able to do it is to study, of course, and I suppose we must begin with the alphabet. Yes, Archie answered with a sigh and took up his lesson book. Then, for a long while, no sound was heard on the back piazza, save the humming of the bees, or now and then a murmured, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, or... Mu, Nu, Chai, Omicron, as one or other of the boys forgot himself and spoke his lesson aloud. End of section 13. Recording by Bryn Villers, Honolulu, Hawaii. The Little Pixie People by James Whitcomb Riley. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen. 
Vancouver, B.C. It was a very merry fairy dream. All the woods were airy with the gloom and gleam. Crickets in the clover clattered clear and strong, and the bees droned over their old honey song. In the mossy passes, saucy grasshoppers leapt about the grasses and the thistle burrs, and the whispered chuckle of the katydid did shook the honeysuckle blossoms where he hid. Through the bleasy mazes of the lazy June, drowsy with the hazes of the dreamy noon, little pixie people winged above the walk, pouring from the steeple of a mullein stalk. One, a gallant fellow, evidently king, wore a plume of yellow in a jeweled ring. On a pansy bonnet, gold and white and blue, with the dew still on it, and the fragrance too. One, a dainty lady, evidently queen, wore a gown of shady, moonshine and green, with a lace of gleaming, starlight that sent, all the dewdrops dreaming everywhere she went. One wore a waistcoat of rose leaves out and in, and one wore a facet coat of tiger lily skin, and one wore a neat coat of palest galing gal, and one a tiny street coat, and one a swallow tail. And ho! sang the king of them, and hey! sang the queen, and round and round the ring of them went dancing o'er the green. And hey! sang the queen of them, and ho! sang the king, and all that I had seen of them wasn't anything. It was just a very merry fairy dream. All the woods were airy with the glow and gleam. Crickets in the clover clattered clear and strong, and the bees droned over their old honey song. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 15 of the Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sangat. The Children's Wonder Book, Section 15, Christopher's at Home by Tudor Jenks. Of course, he may have been asleep and have dreamed it all. It's an easy way to explain those odd happenings and queer goings on that we don't know anything about to say, oh, he dreamed it. But here's the story, just as Kit told it to me. And Kit is a very wide awake sort of a lad. He's our shortstop, you know. And we don't have sleepy heads for shortstop in the alert night, I can tell you. You see, Kit had to hand on a composition on Friday. Like most boys in the class, he put off writing it until Thursday night, and then he knew he had to do it. So, he went into the library. They have a good library room at the Johnsons. Christopher Johnson is his company name, and he sat down before their big green base table, spread out a lot of commercial notepaper, got a pen, and dashed right at it. Kit is a good writer and he can roll off a composition just like anything. The subject he took was Columbus's first voyage. He likes historical subjects so he took that instead of my pets or a day in the field or my favorite game which were the others. You see Kit is a lively sort of boy and he reads a good many exciting books and that gives him a style of writing that isn't usual among boys. I suppose most fellows would have begun this way. Christopher o Colombo was born in the year so-and-so in the obscure little town of you know its name better than I can tell you, and so on. But Kit likes something snappier than that, so he got his elbows as far out on each side of him as he could reach. 
held his pen so tight that it wanted to squeal, bent his head over towards his left shoulder, his tongue out like that of a really fashionable pug, and reeled off this opening sentence. Little could the proud Ferdinand droop such insolence from a comparatively unknown adventurer. No more, he said, with haughty disdain, tire our royal ears with thy rash schemes. We have no gold to waste on thy vain vaporings, and he would have dismissed Columbus without further party. But here the beautiful Isabella besought him to pause for a moment. A boon, a boon, my lady, she cried, I have jewels in my coffer. Let me sell them and fit out a vessel. Mayhap we may thus acquire waste domains and convert many heathen. I copied this word for word from the first page. Kit can spell when he tries, but he spells just anyhow when he is in a hurry. That was as far as he had written when there came a knock on the door. Now, Kit hoped it was his sister Helen. Helen was always good to Kit, and especially on composition days, Kit fully appreciated what it was to have such a sister. You see, Helen was one of the studying kind, and she would look over Kit's compositions and put a little pencil mark opposite the words that she wanted him to look up in the dictionary. Kit was an honest little fellow, and he told the teacher about it. But she said it was all right, so long as Helen didn't write the words out for him. Helen used to punctuate for him too sometimes, for Kit couldn't have patience to put it all the dots and dashes for himself. He said he couldn't bother with them, they interrupted the flow of his ideas. But it wasn't Helen who had knocked at the library door, as Kit found out when he said, Come in! The door opened slowly wider and wider until it stood wide open and then a procession came in led by a courtly little gentleman in small clothes wig silk coat and waistcoat and wearing a rapier at his side he was only an inch or two tall permit me he said bowing to kit much as the dancing master does when you come in late to introduce myself and my companions understanding that you have devoted the evening to letters, I have invited myself to be present in order to render any assistance that may lie in my power. I am known as the master of ceremonies, and he bowed again. Glad to see you, mumbled Kit, looking at him with very wide open eyes. Won't you and your friend sit down? Thank you, no, answered the leader. We don't care to delay. We will duly take our places where we belong. Let me look at your composition, and the little master of ceremonies hopped upon the table and began to read it aloud. When he came to the word that Kit had spared in silence, he drew his sword and pointed it towards the A. You are needed here, oh, he said. At once a rotten little gentleman came rolling across the room. The A jumped out of the word, and O inserted himself in its place. He is an usurper. He said, that is my place. I have owned that place ever since the Romans accustomed me to it. Quite right, said the master of ceremonies to Kit. You'll find this title made out plainly in the Latin dictionary. I had no wish to keep him out, said Kit. What shall I do with Mr. A? This last question was suggested by seeing the gentleman who had risen to give place to Mr. O, wandering uneasily over the page. Fortunately, we can make room for him between the R and the T in comparatively, said the master of ceremonies, looking a little further down the sheet. So A, looking much relieved, took the place which I at once yielded to him. Mr. I remarked, I always feel out of place in those first conjugation derivatives. Suppose I find a place for myself in disdain a few lines down. If Mr. E will kindly make room for me, I will sit down on the other side of Miss N there. This change was soon made, and Mr. E, without saying, by your leave, sat down by Miss T in the word waste, where he felt he was welcome. Adventurer no more, read the master of ceremonies. Where is my friend Mr. Period? Here seems to be room for him. The gentleman inquired for came forward. He resembled Mr. O, but was smaller and had a much less open countenance. He settled down after the word adventurer, but complained of being lonely. 
Two small boys who were twins came forward hand in hand. Ah, said the courtly leader. The quotation twins. Suppose you two sit down on those high seats just before no more. And now I notice you, Miss N. There's some mistake. You're in your mother's place. Will Mrs. N please come and sit at the head of this row? Being a matron, Christopher, she is entitled to sit at the head of this row. And as these words seem crowded, suppose we move these down a line and call the whole a new paragraph group beginning where the quotation twins are sitting. Christopher agreed. But as the master of ceremonies turned again to the composition, Christopher blushed and picked up the sheet. I say, said Kit. I didn't expect visitors this evening, and I'm afraid it would be a long time before you all find places. Perhaps if you can call again, say tomorrow, I shall have the composition in a little better order. Oh, very well, said the little gentleman, repeating his courtly bow. We had no intention of giving you any trouble. But you see, my friends here are somewhat jealous of their places, and they asked me to inquire whether you had any objection to giving them their rights. So saying, he hopped nimbly down from the table and made his way out of the room, followed by the letters and the punctuation marks. Then Kit went over his work again, and it is really surprising how many excuses Kit found for the visit paid to him. When Helen came in from dancing room, she found that Kit had written a very creditable composition. Where did you learn to spell and punctuate so well, Kit? she asked. Why, at my at home, Kit answered, and then he told her the master of ceremonies. And Helen, he said in conclusion, I don't think anybody could forget to put in quotation marks after seeing those twins perch themselves on their high chairs to hear what was to be said. Nor could any fellow leave out a period at the end of a sentence if he had seen that exclusive Mr. Period settle himself down and draw away from the following sentence. Then there was an exclamation point, an old lady with both the hands held up in astonishment, who was all ready to express Ferdinand's disdain for Columbus's rash schemes. I tell you, I'm going to get acquainted with these punctuation people, for they are very interesting lot. I think they are, said Helen, and it's really very kind of them to stand around while we read, to explain everything and to tell us just who said everything and how they said it. Where did they come from? asked Kit. Oh, they are quite modern, most of them, said Helen. Some of the older ones have lived many ages, but many are recent. There's the question mark, for instance. He began life as a whole word. So my teacher told me. Query his name was. Then they gave him a nickname, QY, and finally he was written only as a question mark, and people forgot that he bore any relation to the letter Q. I don't remember that I ever paid any attention to those little marks except in school, said Kit. But school or no school, I'm not the fellow to forget my friends, and I'm going to get the master of ceremonies to bring the whole of them around to see me some day. Then it will be the whole Kit and the boodle of them, said Helen laughing. There, that's what Kit told me about the evening he wrote his composition. I suppose he dreamed it, but it was a funny dream anyway and seemed to have a sort of moral to it didn't it i know that it has made kit a good punctuator if there is any such word he uses semicolons now in fact i have seen a composition of his telling all about the conjunction of jupiter and venus that had real colons in it his teacher said my stars when she saw it and expressed the wish that all the scholars would punctuate and spell as well as christopher johnson did and then Kit got as red as a beet, and we boys washed his face for him in the snow at recess to keep him from getting too proud. But there's no danger of that. Kit is too good a fellow. End of section 15. Woods of Warwick by Harriet Prescott Spofford. Read for LibriVox.org by Carrie Chirac. Pleasant, pleasant woods of Warwick, when the shaws are thick with summer, green and golden, gloom and sunshine, leafy wealth of wilderness. Velvet mosses, plashing rainbows round the feet of any comer, lingering where the dew still lingers, branches droop and odors press. High above the castle towers, down below the wild brook brawling, and across a dream of sorrow, hark, the nightingales are calling. 
far away in long-drawn depths of dusky dell and dark recess i was never there were you dear yet at once my eyelids closing thrice a hundred years are vanished and a tender hand i lay on this ancient tree bull's furrows crooked gnarls and knots supposing when twas young a lad i know of chance to stroll this self-same way warbling wood notes as he loitered and the blood in blushes bringing while a cuckoo mocked and madly many thrushes burst out singing here will shakespeare it may happen cut the name and hathaway thrush or cuckoo nay beshrew me did he see that cuckoo mocking when he turned his head to listen and his fancy felt the spell in his hand its sweetest secrets under old black letter locking chaucer's was the verse he carried opening where the pages tell of the elf queen and her people when the land was full of fairy thrush or cuckoo nay a gladsome spirit delicate and airy nay an airy spirit was it of the name of ariel on the turf he threw him gaily with old chaucer for his pillow far along the level greenwood where he sent a happy eye wind and boughs and latest sunbeams swept in billow over billow oxlips and the nodding violets danced between him and the sky while time and the sweet musk roses sent their fragrance out to find him there a jeweled snake slipped leaving his enameled skin behind him bees with brimming honey bags and big and burly blundered by was he sure it was a snake then wore the gilded weed and cleft it weed he murmured wide enough to wrap a fairy in and might that titania be who doffed the gauzy coverlid and left it hovering in the gentle gloom and shining there in sheer delight was the bee that just sung by him where the shade was deep and mellow kind hobgoblin loved of fireslides he the shrewd and navish fellow was that puck the lob of spirits merry wanderer of the night evening sun forsook the forest twilight gathered in the hollows winds went rustling dewy coolness fell like shadow on the air where the new moon hung the leaves stirred like the wings of darting swallows where the new moon slight and glorious hung a sudden silver flare in its lovely crescent swiftly stole a glimmering apparition lost among the tossing branches half a dream and half a vision oberon the king of fairies in that moment passing there hissed no whisper in the royal lustre who were these came trooping what gay swarm of silken banners wings and scarfs of damask dyes topsy-turvy hurly-burly tripping tumbling soaring swooping all the elves in humming murmur of light laughs and rippling cries cobweb floating through the darkness filmy as a bat and slender balancing above a poppy moth with wings of downy splendor and peas blossom flower or fairy fluttering with the butterflies master twas a cry of music queen titania's voice oh hearken though indeed you know the summer still doth tend upon my state breathe not think not she all rosy glows while shadows round her darken yet i fain of other lands would tempt the pleasures try the fate running stream no fairy ventures witch nor warlock crosses water woe betide the sorry elf if urchins of the great seas caught her yet beyond them richer roses sweeter nightingales must wait have you with a south wind blowing heard a harp-string silver shiver oberon the king was speaking fairyland obeys my nod and though like a forester i these groves may tread for ever let me break a lance i pray you with some chapleted greek god into lands of antique story master you alone can send us one midsummer night's mad revel in athenian forests lend us we are gothic fairies take us where the fawns of greece have trod master master chimed the chorus we are home-bred english fairies we the little people who the old dame tells you bless the hearth sweep the dust behind the door and churn the cream in lucky dairies dance within the nine men's morris haunt the night-side with our mirth light us tapers from the waxen thighs of humble-bees and cheery blow our elfin horns and scatter when the stars do but we weary long for other sports and weary of this corner of the earth night came sweeping through the forest soft her sombre garments trailing with a sound of gallant chiding distant hounds began to bay like a shoal of dancing waters in the moon the crew went sailing 
like a cloud of flying rose leaves when the winds are up and away. Following darkness like a dream, sighed Will Shakespeare, half in sadness, underneath his breath, and spelled in this midsummer night's dream madness, all the woods of Warwick ringing with the elfin round delay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 17 of The Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Children's Wonder Book. The Little Man by C. P. Stewart. Little Gretchen was going home from school when the wonderful thing happened. She was in the woods. She was alone. If whistling Hans and laughing Bertha and the other noisy, romping ones had been with her, the little man would have hidden himself away. As it was, he came out boldly in the path before her and said, Little girl, come under the toadstool and tell me your name. Gretchen started to say she was too large, for the toadstool was hardly three inches high, while she was nearly three feet. Before she could speak the words, however, she felt herself growing smaller smaller than her little brother carl smaller than baby greta the next minute she was no taller than the little man himself as she followed him under the toadstool and told him her name was gretchen the little man seated himself on a small toadstool beside a middle-sized toadstool the big toadstool spread over them like an umbrella then he whisked out a sheet of birch bark paper and a quill pen made of a hummingbird feather he dipped the pen in a tiny acorn cup of ink and wrote down her name. That done, he looked up and smiled and spoke. And you are the little girl who didn't whisper in school? The little girl who learned her lessons? The little girl who comforted poor lame Lena when she fell and bumped her nose? The little girl who wants to help the house mother because the house father is ill and can't? Little Gretchen was too timid to reply in words but the blushes that made her pink cheeks pinker after each question said yes, quite as plainly. The little man wrote once more with the hummingbird quill. Then he smiled again to Gretchen and said, I was sure you were the same little girl. Now you may go, but remember this one thing. Under the pine at the edge of the woods, among the young uncurling ferns, grows a pink lady slipper. Pluck it and take it to the house mother. Within the flower she will find the help your loving heart longs to take to her. Before Gretchen could speak her thanks, she found herself shooting up to the height of the girl she had been, and when she bent to look under the toadstool, the little man had vanished. So Gretchen hastened home, plucking the lady's slipper under the pine, as she had been told. When the house mother heard little Gretchen's story, she opened the flower, and lo, Within there was a glittering diamond. She hastened to tell the house father. He started up in bed. He looked at it, and at once declared it must be the precious gem the princess had lost from her engagement ring a week ago that very day when riding to the hunt, and for which a great reward was offered. The princess had halted with the prince under that very pine, and when she slipped off her glove that he might kiss her hand, the gem had fallen from its setting, and been cunningly caught in the pouch of the flower of course gretchen took the pink lady slipper to the princess with the strange and beautiful dewdrop still glittering within and then why of course all went well for ever after end of section seventeen section eighteen of the children's wonder book this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The Children's Wonder Book After the Rain by Margaret A. Tinge Just as soon as the rain was over, Willie and Millie ran out into the garden. Willie and Millie were brother and sister. They would have been twins if they had been given to their mamma in the same year. 
for the birthdays came on the same day in the same month but while willie's was june fifteenth eighteen eighty two millie's was june fifteenth eighteen eighty three so you see willie was just one year older than millie the garden was quite wet for it had been raining hard and the plot of ground that the gardener had been spading and planting the day before was very soft in fact it was mud willie slipped off the boardwalk into this mud and millie slipped after him they scrambled quickly out but their shoes were a sight to behold oh i hate mud said willie oh i hate mud too said millie when to their great surprise many soft little voices called out but you must not hate it it gives food and drink to the seeds that are planted in it and this food and drink will make them so strong that they will grow into pretty green plants and the pretty green plants will bear hundreds of lovely flowers well then i don't hate the mud i like it said willie and i don't hate the mud and i like it too said millie then they went skipping along the walk to the well at the other end of the garden here they met a toad he was a big speckled fellow with bright eyes oh i hate toads said willie oh i hate toads too said millie the toad sat up on his hind legs and looked at them sharply that's not right he said for toads do a great deal of good in the garden they catch and eat many insects that would destroy the plants and flowers if they were let alone well then i don't hate toads i like them said willie and i don't hate toads and i like them too said millie the toad hopped away and a big earthworm wriggled out of the place where it had been sitting and dragged itself past the children oh i hate earthworms said willie stepping quickly back from it oh i hate earthworms too said millie the earthworm stopped and turned its head toward them you shouldn't hate earthworms it said for they are of the greatest use if it were not for them none of the green things could grow they travel through the ground breaking the soil and loosening it as they go so that the tiny plants that spring from the seeds may be able to make their way up to the sunshine well then i don't hate earthworms i like them said willie and i don't hate earthworms and i like them too said millie and i guess willie went on i guess i like everything and i guess said millie i guess i like everything too end of section number eighteen out from fairyland by katherine pyle read for librivox dot org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The fairies stole me in the wood and carried me away. I only stayed in fairyland a single night and day. For all the wondrous things I saw, for all the things I heard, I only brought away with me a feather from a bird. When I came back from fairyland, I scarcely knew the way. I thought that things were strangely changed in just one night and day. My baby sister was so tall, my mother's hair was white. They told me seven years had passed in that one day and night. Now, whether I'm at work or play, my heart feels sad and sore. I wish that they would take me back to fairyland once more. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Section 20 of the Children's Wonder Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T.J. Burns The Children's Wonder Book Polly's Visit to the Book Kitchen by Delia W. Lyman Was hätte es sagen sollen müssen? Oh dear, what an outlandish thing to learn, sighed pretty Polly Pillicotti as she sat studying her German lesson in the cushioned chimney corner by the great wood fire in her grandfather's old-fashioned sitting room. 
A snowstorm was beating against the window panes, and Polly longed to shut up her books and watch the feathery flakes. But the lesson must be learned before the hands of the tall old clock should reach the hour of five. Polly was not fond of study, nor of going to school. Oh, dear, she sighed. Why doesn't everybody talk English? These old ichs and oichs just stick in my throat. I've got some stuff that will make them come out just as easy as can be, said a squeaky little voice. Polly looked round, and there, by the clock, she saw a little hump-backed dwarf grinning from ear to ear. He looked so jolly and good-natured that Polly's first impulse to run away was very quickly overcome by her curiosity to know what he meant. Stuff to make them go down easy, exclaimed she. What do you mean? And who are you, anyway? If you please, she asked. I'm chief cook of the book kitchen, said the dwarf. Don't you want to come and see it? It's much nicer than going to school. We go there instead of to school in Dwarfland. It's a much quicker way to learn. Yes, indeed. I'd like to go, cried Polly empathetically, though she had not the faintest idea what the book kitchen might be. Shall I get my things? No, said the dwarf. We don't have to go out into the snow to get to the book kitchen. All you need to do is to take this little ten-league pill and shut your eyes while I count to ten. Polly obeyed, and when the dwarf pronounced the word ten, she opened her eyes and found the sitting room, fireplace, old clock, and all had mysteriously disappeared. And she and her little guide were standing in a strange, large room with low ceilings. It looked more like a pretty drugstore than anything else, for the walls were lined with gilt and silver shelves, on which stood gaily colored bottles of all sizes, each bearing a label. In front of these shelves were counters with glass cases which held oddly shaped little boxes, silver, amethyst, pale blue, and amber colored. But Polly was most interested by what appeared to be a large crystal soda water fountain which occupied one entire side of the room. Polly was very fond of soda water, and she ran at once to this fascinating affair, which seemed to be made of diamonds. She was surprised at the number of taps, for there were at least a hundred. What lots of different flavorings you have here, she began to say, but the words died away on her lips as she turned pale with astonishment, as she read, in place of chocolate, vanilla, sarsaparilla, etc., these words. Arithmetic, spelling, history, geography, and many others. What will you have? asked another little dwarf, who, in spotless white cap and apron, stood behind the counter. What does it all mean? gasped Polly. Try and see, said the first dwarf, chuckling. So, Polly, gaining courage, said more boldly, Arithmetic, if you please. In a moment she had drank the sparkling glass he had filled from the arithmetic tap. Oh, what are these funny little square things it has left in my mouth? asked she. They are square roots, said the dwarf. You haven't taken it strong enough for them to dissolve. Polly laughed, and then, to her intense astonishment, began rattling off the multiplication and division tables way up in the hundreds. 
Nine times three hundred and thirteen are two thousand eight hundred and seventeen. She was glibly announcing when the dwarf interrupted her by saying, We'll see if you have drunk enough arithmetic to do the mathematical cook example. What is it? asked Polly. If a good mathematical cook, you would make a spoonful of extract, arithmetic take, two of algebra and of geometry three, and a pint of strong, fresh logarithmical tea. Of trigonometry, one cubic wine glass, then sup, and of calculus, drink a good heaping cup. Now, in order, one twentieth portion to know, in just what size dish will that much of it go? Such an example would ordinarily have scared Polly Blue, as she used to say, but to her amusement, she gave the answer before the last word was out of the dwarf's mouth. Right, said he. Where is that stuff that makes German easy? asked Polly. The dwarf handed her, from the glass case, a little amber-colored box, which Polly opened and found to contain a stick of amber-colored chewing gum. Try it, said he. Polly put it in her mouth and began to chew. Dankeschön, said she. What? said the dwarf. Ich spreche Deutsch, said she and she opened her mouth so wide with astonishment that the gum tumbled out on the floor. What in the world is that? she asked in English. That is our German chewing gum, he answered. You will talk German as long as you have that in your mouth. Polly popped it in again. Ach, wie wunderschön, said she with the best of accents. So viel leichter und besser als das ewige Studium der hässlichen Grammatik. Jawohl, said the dwarf. Polly capered about the shop in high spirits, talking German as fast as a little Deutsch Fräulein, now singing snatches of the Lorelei, now running over the principal parts of the irregular verbs. Have you any French gum? she asked. The dwarf handed her a little French kid box, in which Polly found some gum that made her talk French as glibly as she had German. After trying it to her satisfaction, she put the German gum also in her mouth at the same time to see what would happen with both together. Comment befinden vous sich? said she. He took from a pig shaped box some hog lantern gum and from another some Italian gum. Sta quite, Jerry, bene, tode, Jerry, said he politely. But, as he offered Polly no Italian gum, she could not understand him, and the conversation struck her as becoming very uninteresting. After she had tried other experiments, combining Choctaw and Japanese, Latin and Sanskrit gums, and had conversed fluently in them all, she remembered her father speaking of a new universal language called Volapük. Have you Volapük gum? she asked. No, said the dwarf somewhat shortly. If we saw that, all our other gums would be a drug in the market. We don't approve of it at all. Come, you'll be a regular polyglot, he continued, if you keep chewing on these gums and he gave her a bit of Greek gum so that she could understand his pun. After Polly had chewed it and laughed, she presently began to read some of the labels of the bottles on the shelves. They were, she thought, very unlike any drugstore bottles she had ever seen. Extract of history, cube root tea, theological bitters, strong solution of ideas, extract of literature, syrup of grammar, dried Latin verb roots, geography pills, and many others. Polly did not understand more than half of these titles, and looked relieved when the dwarf suggested going back to the book kitchen to see these wonders made. From a rear door they entered a large and curious kitchen. 
Along one entire side were ranges on which stood huge kettles a boiling. Two other sides of the room were filled with little doors, each bearing a name grammar, chemistry, Latin, spelling, etc. And on the fourth side were rows of tables where a dozen or more dwarfs, in white caps and aprons, were filling more kettles with the contents of the mysterious closets, which consisted largely of books here they are making composition tea said the dwarf leading polly to a table where a huge cauldron was being filled with thousands of tiny manuscripts of compositions with biographies dictionaries encyclopedias histories poems and many other things when this is all done said the dwarf one teaspoonful of the extract will enable you to write a beautiful composition oh mayn't i have a bottle of it cried polly for she disliked compositions as much as german polly's guide was evidently one of the chief cooks and was tasting the contents of the cauldron put in at least two gallons more ideas said he to the composition cook it needs another good pinch of those compositions on the seasons to give it the right flavor it needs too another string of adjectives and at least a quart more commas and one of semicolons polly was immensely entertained but was soon taken away to the next table where a dwarf was piling up little brown sticky cakes which came from another pot why they look like dates said polly they are said the dwarf this is the history kettle and the strongest historical extract always comes out in dates try one polly took one which was stamped seventeen seventy six and immediately began to rattle off all the principal historical events which took place in that year all over the world is that the reason the year in which a thing happens is called a date she asked never having thought of the connection before certainly said the dwarf all history boiled down comes out in the form of dates at least the old-fashioned kind did and we prefer that he next took polly to a table where from the contents of another kettle a lot of spelling plasters were being made polly saw the kettle was full of boiled letters capital and small clap this on your tongue and you can spell anything said the dwarf polly did so and straightway proceeded to spell without a single mistake schism s c h i s m delium b d e l l i u m tylism p t y a l i s m synecdoche s y n e c d o c h e ichthyology i c h t h y o l o g y immalleability i m m a l l e a b i l i t y physic p h t h i s i c pneumatic p n e u m a t i c scintillate s c i n t i l l a t e calibiate c h a l y b e a t e catechetical c a t e c h e t i c a l incomprehensibility i n c o m p r e h e n s i b i l i t y i've always wished i could make poetry said polly as they came to a big kettle marked poetry and she saw some lozenges sticking on the edge of it is this done said the dwarf to the poetry cook no said the other only half done the rhymes and meters are all in but they are not thoroughly steeped in ideas yet that will take some time longer for the ideas have only just begun to simmer polly took a lozenge and ate it immediately 
she began to jingle away in a sing-song manner. Wanting is what? Oh, give me a lot from that lozenge pot. For my darling dwarf, I'm a little off. With this gingerbread cough, which I took on the wharf of our watering trough. Both dwarfs burst out laughing. It's very evident that the ideas have had no effect yet on that lozenge, said one. Polly looked a little mortified. Anyway, it rhymed and metered, said she, and I never could make a rhyme or a meter before. What's in this other kettle? Accomplishment varnish, said the dwarf. Young ladies must always have a little smattering of accomplishments, a little of everything, and if this varnish is applied every evening, it will give the effect quicker than anything else. The table was piled up with the ingredients for this kettle. Some French, German, and Italian chewing gum, a little musical oil, a large bottle of extract of dancing stood already prepared. But besides these, there were the raw materials just taken from the accomplishment closet, a banjo and guitar, pole on whist, some Kensington embroidery, some songs, a book of plays, a tennis racket, a book of etiquette, a few poems, a box of pencils and paints, and a recipe for making sponge cake. Just then, a bell rang and the dwarf, taking out a queer little watch about as large as a five-cent piece, said, It is school time. Do you want to see the children come in? Polly assented, though it was hard to leave the book kitchen. On returning to the shop, she found a crowd of little boy and girl dwarfs pouring in each carrying a cup and spoon instead of a strap of books. Behind the counters were a dozen or more cooks who had all they could do to wait on the crowd of children. Polly stood in a corner and looked at this interesting way of attending school. Please give me a box of alphabet pills, lisped one little fellow, handing over some tiny coins. I want a glass of geography. With maps, said a little dwarf girl to the cook at the great fountain. What does she mean? asked Polly. Why, just as you take soda with cream to make it nicer, so we have different kinds of book cream to improve these drinks, said the dwarf. Map cream goes with a glass of geography, microscope cream with botany, telescope cream with astronomy, etc. They give an excellent flavor. What are those coins they all give? asked Polly, noticing that nothing was given for nothing. The dwarf handed her some to look at. They were little round coins of different sizes, each bearing the German words Fleissiges Studium. Polly could not make out what they meant. The dwarf left her for a moment, carrying off the coins with him. She ran across the room to get some German chewing gum so she could read them. Where's your money? said the cook at the counter. I haven't any, said Polly. Then you can have no gum. Polly looked for her friend, but he did not come back. The dwarfs swarmed around her, and when she found that she could get neither drinks nor lozenges without the coins, she sat down in a window seat to wait for the dwarf. She was tired and a bit frightened at being alone. The air grew close and warm, and presently she fell asleep. When she awoke, she felt one side of her face uncomfortably warm, and looking around, she found herself again in the chimney corner at home. The fire was roaring hot, and she jumped up to look for the dwarf. The old clock stood there ticking away as usual but not a sign was there of her little friend of the book kitchen. On the floor by her side, Polly caught sight of her German dictionary. Well, I'll find out there what those coin words mean, exclaimed she. She looked through the F's and the S's till she had translated both words and her face fell. Dear me, said she, I see the point. 
I didn't know there were such disagreeable things as points and morals in Dwarfland. End of section 20 Recording by T.J. Burns The Circus by Mary E. Stone Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. What do you think, said the children one night, the circus is coming to town. There are tigers and leopards and dogs that are shepherds and elephants done up in brown. There's a steam calopy to play us a jig and a camel from Israel town. There are cute little monkeys and shaggy-eared donkeys and a beautiful artistic clown. There's a lady who jumps through a hoop all afire and rides without saddle or spur. There's a long-necked giraffe who holds up a staff and a polar bear done up in fur. There's a lion who roars. There's an eagle who soars. There's an antelope timid and mild. There are all sorts of creatures of curious features enough to drive anyone wild. And the teacher next day went frantic, they say, and wished that the children weren't born. Such an uproar was made o'er that circus parade as shouldn't a schoolhouse adorn. And, oh, the black marks that the absent ones got as off to the circus they hide and spent their pin money for things that are funny and laughed at the monkeys beside. Such a terrible scrabble and indecent rabble sighed the prudish old people in town. But those children just cried and threw kisses beside to the clown as he rode out of town. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Query by Mary E. Stone Read for LibriVox.org By Linda Marie Nielsen Vancouver, B.C. Great yellow moon, are you made of green cheese? Would a slice of you make a little boy sneeze? Does the great bear milk all the cows every day That wander about in the long milky way? Does the little bear snivel and grovel and growl, and with a big knife around you just prowl, and eat you all up till you're only a piece, and have to go shining away off in Greece? My uncle tells me such curious things. He says that the stars have all got wings. The reason they shine is plain to be seen. The big sun washes their face so clean. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 23 of The Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Children's Wonder Book. Chapter 23. Wishing. A Comedy by William Grant. Characters. Prince Felix, read by J. Paul Ninety. Alfred, read by Larry Wilson. Princess Pearl, read by T.J. Burns. Rosetta, read by Linda Marie Nielsen. Fairy, read by Diane Alaelima. And narrated by Marianne. Costumes. Pearl. White frock, white stockings and shoes, pearl circlet in hair. Rosetta. White muslin chemisette with full sleeves to elbow, red skirt, black velvet Swiss bodice, red silk handkerchief knotted on her head, bead necklace, black stockings and shoes. She carries a basket with three toys in it. The sweetmeats are concealed in the back by means of a slip of paper pasted within the cover. Felix, blue fancy suit. Alfred, yellow and white. Fairy, 
Dolly Varden suit, with peaked hat and long staff, or the regular fairy costume, white dress, wand, and all. Scene. Interior of a summer house in the Royal Children's Pleasure Garden. Three little chairs. Rustic table to the left of stage. Some pots of flowers. Door to left. Door to right. Pearl and Felix discovered. Pearl seated to left of stage. Felix beside her, leaning on rustic table. Window to right of stage. Felix. Well? I wish something would happen. We shall have breakfast directly. I meant something new. Go without breakfast, then. That would be new. If I went without breakfast, it wouldn't be something new happening. It would be something old not happening. How clever you are this morning. I object to a clever girl, especially when I am hungry. Rising. And I object to a rude boy, especially if he's my brother. Goes to window and stands looking out, with her back to Felix. After a moment, Felix follows her. Pearly! Pearl takes no notice. Felix touches her on the arm. Pearly! Pearl looks round. I say, I didn't mean to be rude. Turns round and takes his arm. And I didn't mean to be clever. They walk down stage. It was an accident. Alfred comes in at left-hand door with light breakfast for two on tray. Good morning, Alfred. Good morning, Princess. He places tray on table and sets two chairs. Summer's come. Who? The prince and princess sit down at table. Alfred behind Pearl's chair. Summer, Princess, summer. That's nothing. Summer always comes. The prince and princess begin breakfast. To Alfred. Is my king papa going to review the troops today? No, Prince. His Majesty has a cold. Oh, dear. And we were to ride with him on our ponies. Can't he make the doctor's cure his cold? Before twelve o'clock, Prince? Well, why not? If they all united together? Flings herself back in her chair. It's too bad. That review was all I had left to live for this morning. <sighs> I don't see what the sun wants to shine for now. And Alfred, I wish the bees would put a different taste in the honey. Alfred hands jam. Try some strawberry jam, Princess. <sighs> no, thank you. Give me an apple. Alfred hands plate of apples. Pearl takes one. She turns it round in her hand and looks at it doubtfully. I wish it were a pear. Are there any pears? No, Princess, the last are gone. Standing up, playing with apple. There's too much in an apple. Have you noticed that, Alfred? No, Princess, I never think there's too much, not even in three or four apples. Why don't you sit down, Pearl? Laying apple on table. I have finished. She walks to window. How Beautiful the sky looks. It's a pity we live such a long way off from the sky, isn't it, Felix? Felix, still at breakfast. Oh, I don't know. I'm all right. I wish we were birds. Nonsense. Ah! What's the matter? A girl. A strange girl. She came in at the little wicket gate, and she's walking this way. Come and look at her, Felix. No, thank you. I wish you weren't so athapetic. Athapetic? What's that? Why, not taking an interest in interesting things. Men are often athapetic. My queen mamma said so. Alfred. Yes, princess. Go and ask the girl her name, and where she came from, and where she's going to, and what she's doing, and why she's doing it, and whether... Interrupting. Please, Princess, can I come back for the rest? Never mind the rest. She'll be gone. Fly. Alfred goes out at left-hand door. Felix gets up and joins Pearl in looking through the window. To Felix. Isn't she pretty? Not bad. I wish I could be dressed like that. How she smiles. Here comes Alfred. Alfred comes in at left-hand door. 
if you please. Princess, her name's Rosetta, and she comes from the last place she was in, and she's going to the next place she can find, and she's selling toys, and she does it to earn a living. To Felix. We'll buy toys. To Alfred. Tell her to come here at once. Alfred goes out at left-hand door. Pearl's manner becomes more lively. This is almost an incident, Felix. They place two chairs to right of stage. Pearl sits. To Felix. Sit down. Felix sits. Look dignified. I can't. I haven't any pocket money. I'll lend you some. Takes out purse and puts a silver coin into Felix's hand. Alfred comes in at left-hand door and removes a little table to back of stage. He is followed by Rosetta. Graciously. Good morning, Rosetta. Curtsying. Good morning, princess. Good morning, prince. So you're selling toys? Yes, princess, but I have only three left. Shows toys. A ring, a looking glass, and a book. We'll buy them all. My king papa says it is the duty of the royal family to encourage trade. Thank you, princess. Pearl takes three toys. She and Felix pay Rosetta. Pearl turns the toys over in her lap. Alfred, you shall have the looking glass, because you arrange your own hair, you know, in the morning. Gives Alfred looking glass. I will have the ring, because it fits me. Puts ring on her finger. And Felix, you should have the book, because, because, books sometimes do people good. Gives Felix book. Felix, sulkily and rising. Not such little books as this. It's a beautiful book. All fairies. Fairies? How jolly! Fairies? Who cares for fairies? Oh, hush. They are my friends. What do you mean, Rosetta? I mustn't talk about them. They don't like it. Goes toward left-hand door. Goodbye, princess. Goodbye, prince. Wait a minute, Rosetta. Rosetta comes back. A pause. Pearl seated, Rosetta standing to face her. Felix and Alfred standing by Pearl's chair. Pearl next to audience. Felix leaning on Alfred's shoulder. Pearl solemnly. Do you mean to say that you believe in fairies? Of course. Dear me. She ought to be put in a museum. She'd look very pretty in a glass case. Be quiet, boys. Felix and Alfred run out of left-hand door, laughing. Now, Rosetta, were you ever at school? No, princess. Then you don't know anything. Yes, I do. Let me try you, Rosetta. How far is the sun from the earth? Just the proper distance. That's a baby's answer. Mention the names of three stars of the first magnitude. Who told you their names? My professor of astronomy. And who told him? Professors don't need telling. Neither do I. I call the stars by names, too. Then they are wrong. I don't see. Someone else made yours up. I make my own up. I'd rather. But you have no right to do it. I believe that for calling the stars out of their names, you could be sent to prison. Rosetta gives a loud cry and runs to left-hand door. Felix and Alfred, entering, stop her. What's the matter? She wants me sent to prison. Don't be frightened. I'm the heir apparent, and I wouldn't allow it. Oh, don't cry. Have an apple. Pearl, rising. You should not say I want you sent to prison, Rosetta. It's a story. On the contrary, I am very sorry for you, poor unenlightened little thing. Stamping. I am not poor, and I am not unenlightened, and I am not little, and I am not a thing. You must be poor, or you wouldn't sell toys. You must be little, for you're not grown up. You must be unenlightened, because you believe in fairies. Fairy appears suddenly at left-hand door. Who says that? Felix, Alfred, and Pearl cling together in alarm. Rosetta runs to Fairy and stands beside her. Fairy next to audience. I said it. 
I said who cares for fairies. I said fairies are jolly. If you are going to change us into anything, angry fairy, please make it birds. I am not angry. On the contrary, I am very sorry for you, poor unenlightened little thing. To Rosetta. What would my little favorite like me to do? Dance. Dance for them to see. I only dance by moonlight. I wish we could get some moonlight. I have a Chinese lantern. The sun's as good as the moon, and better, too. Do you all wish it? Together. Yes, yes. 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 Fairy advances to middle of stage and recites the following verse with slow movements of her wand. Felix, Alfred, and Pearl grouped together to her left, Rosetta to her right. Though tis day, spirits play. Music sweet for fairy feet. Music begins softly. Rain around, silver sound, shed o'er mortal's floor. Music louder. Measures meet for fairy feet. Music and dance of fairy. Rosetta, as the dance ends. There. To the other children triumphantly. I learn dancing, but I can't dance like that. Felix, very politely. We are extremely obliged to you. Do it over again. No children know. I must now seek my secret home. But before I go, I will leave with each one of you a token of my power. To Pearl. You are fond of wishing. Give me your ring. Takes ring and touches it with wand. Wishes three lie in thee. What? Can I have three wishes granted me? Out of my ring? Three. Receiving back ring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Felix coming forward. Charm my book. Alfred coming forward. Charm my looking glass. Fairy touching the book with the wand. Sweet meats three be found in thee. Touching looking glass. Pictures three show in thee. Turning to Rosetta. Love and glee stay with thee. Fairy goes out at left hand door, kissing her hand to Rosetta, who returns the salute. She's gone. Oh, isn't she lovely? Did you ever see her before? I mustn't tell. To Pearl, who is standing apart with a thoughtful air. What do you say now, Princess? It just strikes me that my professor of psychology would say she was an illusion. What is an illusion? Something you see when nothing is there. Can illusions talk? I believe some of them can, quite nicely. Can illusions give away sweetmeats? Please, Prince, open your book. Felix opens book and takes sweetmeats from inside the cover. Here they are, three. To Rosetta. Good for your fairy. Offers Rosetta a sweetmeat. No, thank you, Prince. I often get them. Do you really? Oh, I wish... Interrupting. Take care, Princess. Why, dear me, yes, of course. I must take care. Turning ring round on her finger. If the fairy was real, my three wishes are real, and I mustn't waste them on trifles. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll wait till twelve o'clock when I shall see my King Papa and Queen Mama and ask them what they advise me to wish for. People's parents have useful ideas sometimes. If Rosetta does not want a sweetmeat, there's one all round. Felix gives Pearl and Alfred each a sweetmeat. The three children eat them. Mine tastes of violets. Mine tastes of roses. Mine tastes of buttercups. I wish mine did. Exclaiming. It does. Strong. One wish gone, princess. Oh, that's too bad. That's too bad. I never thought. Why didn't someone stop me? Walks away to back of stage, sulking. Never mind, princess. You have two wishes left. Pearl, crossly. Two isn't three. Draws chair to right-hand side of stage in corner and sits with her back turned to the others. Let us see a picture in your glass, Alfred. You must choose what you'll see. Rosetta knows all about it. To Felix. You choose first, Prince. 
Alfred holds up glass and stands facing Felix and Rosetta. Now then. I choose the picture of whoever loves me best. Looking into glass and exclaiming. Oh, oh, my queen mamma. Alfred peeping round the glass. Her majesty has her best crown on. Pearl, come directly. Come and see. Don't speak to me. I mean to sit here and say nothing till twelve o'clock. What a beautiful mamma you have, prince. Of course I have. You may kiss her before she goes. Rosetta kisses glass. Banished. Felix to Alfred. Now you choose. Rosetta holds glass up in front of Alfred. I choose a picture of myself killing a tiger. How silly. Alfred looking into glass. Oh, this is the best. Felix looking in glass. What a glorious tiger. Rosetta looking in glass. What a glorious boy. Felix to Alfred. You couldn't really kill a tiger. Perhaps I could if he were about my own age. Takes glass from Rosetta. Now, Rosetta, it's your turn to choose. I choose a picture of the pleasantest place in the world. Looks in glass. My mother's cottage. There's baby playing on the doorstep. There's my own sandy cat. There's the cherry tree. Taking Felix's hand and pointing in glass. Do you think it looks pleasant, Prince? See the honeysuckle over the doorway. Only see. Felix looks in glass. But I see our palace and bright garden. Alfred looks in glass. And I see my father's castle with the hill behind it and the flag flying from the tower. I see home. Children, together. We, we all see, see home. home. Music, Home, Sweet Home, or a verse of the song may be sung behind the scenes. The three children stand in a group turned away from the audience as if listening to the strains. Music ceasing. What was that? Fairies. I can put the glass away now. We've seen all three pictures. Lays glass down on table. Pearl turning round. What is the time? Ten o'clock, princess. So early. Rises and comes forward. Oh, dear. I can't sit still for two hours. Let's play at something. Then I shall not be wishing. May I play, too? Of, of course. course. What shall we play at? Telling stories. Who is to begin? Whoever laughs first. The children stand round in a semicircle, looking in one another's faces with forced gravity. After a pause of a few seconds, Alfred laughs. <laughs> I knew it would be Alfred. Felix, Pearl, and Rosetta take chairs and sit to right side of stage. Alfred stands facing them. There was once a giant who was so large he was too large for anything. He was simply huge and enormous. I just tell you, if he was to lie down on the ground, a cavalry army would have to ride some time before they could get all the way along him. Most fortunately, he was not one of those man-eating giants which are so common, but he had rather a good heart. At last, he died, that's all. How old was he when he died? Middle-aged. It would have been more interesting if his heart had been bad. When a giant has a good heart, nothing comes of it. Had he a wife? Oh, no. He was too large. There would not have been room in the house for her. He might have taken a larger house. He had the largest there was. I don't mean to have a wife. You must. Who? A king must have a queen. What a bore. Let's go on with the game. Rosetta next. Rosetta takes Alfred's place. Alfred sits in Rosetta's chair. Once there was a squirrel who used to be happy, till she got discontented. She said she ought to have had her choice in the beginning, whether she would be a squirrel or not. And she became so thin with fretting over this idea that at last you could not see her unless you looked quite close. Her friends left off visiting her because they thought she must be ill, and they were afraid of catching it. 
and altogether her life was dreary, till one day a mole who had known her mother advised her to get into a better state of mind. She did so, and the consequence was that she recovered her former handsome appearance, and again enjoyed pleasures. She felt very grateful to the wise mole, besides making him several expensive presents. That's all. That's a what-you-may-call-it story. Don't say what-you-may-call-it, Alfred. So unrefined. He means moral. Yes, I mean moral. My Queen Mama says you can draw moral from everything, if you wish to. I would rather draw something else. Oh, I hate drawing. Look here, Rosetta. What were the presents the squirrel gave the mole? Every single thing he was longing for. Do moles long? Yes, why not? Then he was no more contented than the squirrel. Oh, yes, he was. He longed, but he didn't repine. Oh, hell, you girls talk. Let us go on with the game. You next, Pearl. No, you. Felix and Rosetta change places. Mine is going to be poetry. Pause. Make haste. I shan't. Poetry takes a long time to do. Does it? Why? It's so difficult. Why is it difficult? It's so beautiful. Here goes. When the night comes, it's very dark. Unless there's a moon. Do be quiet, Alfred. That's the very thing I was going to say. Unless the moon shines and gives light in the park. What park? Any park. She sits up on high. The moon doesn't sit. She sits as much as she stands. She sits up on high. We love to see her beauty. I say, what rhymes with beauty? Duty. What else? Nothing else. Well then, she sits up on high. We love to see her beauty. Let us follow her shining example and endeavour to do our duty. That's all. It's short. It's long enough. Oh, quite. I'm ready now. Pearl and Felix change places. Once there was a pretty little girl with golden hair which curled naturally. But she was very stupid at history, especially the histories of the Greeks and Romans. This made her parents experience despair, because they did not see what was to become of her when she got old. They promised her an ivory brush and comb if she would improve, but it did not avail anything, so they sent her to school. It was a large school, and one day, no policeman being near, it caught fire. That's the end of the first chapter. I'll go on in a minute. Please, Alfred, give me my handkerchief. Alfred fetches handkerchief from table and gives it to Pearl. Pearl smells at handkerchief. Scented with lavender. I wish it were musk. Rosetta, just too late to stop her. Princess, princess. They all rise in excitement. Oh, my wish. My second wish. Stupid. Stupid handkerchief. Throws handkerchief on ground. Alfred picks it up and smells it. It smells of musk like one o'clock. Rosetta and Felix smell handkerchief. Well, I declare. Pearl, very plaintively. Only one wish left. Take it now, princess. So I will. Leans against table and looks down. Wish for a gun that will never miss. Wish for a horse that will never tire. Leave me by myself, all of you. I can't think comfortably while there's talking. Come along, come outside and play hide-and-seek. Come, Alfred, come, Rosetta. Felix, Alfred, and Rosetta run out of doors, crying, Hide-and-seek, hide-and-seek. Hide hide How difficult it is. I might wish to grow up perfectly beautiful, but my Queen Mama says beauty is a secondary consideration. I might wish to know everything. But I believe I should get tired of not having any lessons. I might wish to be a fairy, but my King Papa wouldn't like that. 
Felix comes in at left-hand door and crouches down by table close to Pearl. I might wish... Felix interrupting. Don't tell where I am. Pearl starts. Oh, dear. Why couldn't you hide outside? This is better. I say, Pearl, what do you think we just saw? Pearl is absorbed in thought and takes no notice of Felix. A fawn-coloured rabbit. Such a jolly little chap. He came up and let Rosetta stroke him. Only fancy right in our garden a fawn-coloured rabbit. Pearl! Pulls at her frock. A fawn-coloured rabbit! Pearl, very sharply. I wish you were a fawn-coloured rabbit. Then you wouldn't come teasing me. Felix starts off through the right-hand door. Pearl follows him, stands at door for a moment as if rooted to the ground, with hands clasped before her. Very loud. Felix! He's changed! He's changed! Runs off, right-hand door. Rosetta and Alfred come in at left-hand door. I heard the prince call. So did I. He was here. I know it. Look everywhere. They hunt about. He must have run out. Where's the princess? Hiding too, perhaps. I am tired. Sits. So am I. Sits. The sun is very hot. Oh, blazing. If we stop here, they'll come back. Of course. Let us play at something quiet. Twenty questions. Or being grown up. Yes, Alfred, play we're both grown up, and you come to pay me a morning visit. I have often seen gentlemen come to visit ladies, while I am showing my toys in their drawing rooms. I know just what I should do. Go to the door. Alfred goes to the left-hand door. Rosetta moves her chair a little way and arranges herself primly on it. Here I am, sitting alone. Ah, me! I wonder if any one will call. Now then, Alfred. Alfred comes forward and makes a bow. Oh, good morning. Rosetta, very dignified. Good morning. How are you? Thank you. I have a little cold. How are you? Thank you. I have a little cold. You shouldn't say the same that I say, Alfred. Besides, gentlemen don't mention it when they are not well, unless they are likely to die. His Majesty mentions it a lot. He is not a gentleman. He is a king. Go on. Say you're quite well, thank you. I am quite well, thank you. Won't you sit down? Alfred sits. What beautiful seasonal weather. Yes, what beautiful seasonable weather. So bright. Yes, so bright. Do you fancy it will last? Yes, I fancy it will last. Now you must begin a fresh subject, Alfred. I don't know what to say. Anything will do. Anything pleasant. Isn't it a fine day? No, Alfred. We've done the weather. So we have. Pause. Do you like cranberry tarts? You forget, Alfred, that we are grown up. So we are. You might ask me if I sing. Uh, do you sing? Yes, a little. Pause. Now you might ask me if I will sing. Will you sing? I... I don't know. I don't think so. Alfred, cheerfully. All right. No, no, Alfred. You should say, do, please do. Ladies never sing the first moment they are asked. Is it likely? Do, please do. Well, I have a little cold. You remember, Alfred, I said I had a little cold. But I'll try. Rosetta sings two verses of a bright and familiar song. Anything pretty may be selected. Alfred, at the conclusion of Rosetta's song. Thank you, thank you. Rosetta, encouragingly. That's quite nice. You are getting on. Look here. I quite love you. You are the nicest, prettiest girl in the world. Rosetta, crushingly. That's not a thing for a gentleman to say to a lady. Why? It would startle her too much. I say, Rosetta, this game is as hard as sums. Don't you like it? Then we'll leave off. Where can the prince and princess be? Gets up. I must go, but not without wishing them good-bye. 
oh say rosetta hold on don't go off yet pearl comes in at right hand door crying <laughs> What's, What's the, the matter, matter princess? princess? They run to her and take her hands. Pearl, standing between them, center of stage. Felix! Felix! Is he hurt? Shall I call anybody? It's no good. I ran after him till he got to a little hole by the root of a tree. And then he went down it. <laughs> he'll never come back he, he's down that horrid hole rosetta amazed the prince went down a little hole he isn't a prince now he's a fawn-colored rabbit rosetta and alfred start back i wished him to be one i did but you weren't thinking oh no no i wasn't thinking and I haven't a wish left to get him back with. <laughs> Alfred to Rosetta. Could your fairy help us? She could, if she would. Eagerly. Rosetta! Rosetta! Is she very far off? Not too far to hear me call. Imploringly. Oh, call her then! From your leisure and your pleasure, your fair flowers and fairer hours, from your dreams by wondrous streams, which meander where you wander, from your dwelling bright past telling, fairy hear me, oh, come near me. Fairy comes in at left-hand door, advances to front of stage and turns, facing right of stage. The three children opposite to her. Pearl sinks on one knee, very rapidly. Oh, fairy, bring him back, and I'll wish for nothing more. I'll never be cross again when he doesn't sympathize with me. He shan't sympathize with me, except when he wants to. I'll give him everything I possess, and put my arms around his neck and kiss him twenty times a day. Only perhaps he wouldn't like it. Boys seldom appreciate what one does for them. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Rosetta, can't you help me beg? Rosetta sinks on one knee. Dear fairy, bring back the prince. Alfred on one knee. Dear fairy, do. Be silent, children. The fairy traces a circle in center of stage with her wand, and placing herself within the circle, calls. Felix, Felix, Felix. Felix runs on by right-hand door. Pearl flies to him and embraces him. Dear, dear Felix, let me look. Oh, he's all right. See, Alfred? See, Rosetta? There isn't a trace of fawn-colored rapidness about him. Don't stifle a fellow, Pearly. To Fairy. I am awfully glad to see you again. Won't you stop and be introduced to our royal parents? Our royal parents would love to see you. They could not see me. Why? They have disbelieved in the possibility of my existence too long. I'm sorry for that. I was thinking that if it's true that I must marry, it would be best fun to marry a fairy. Only I suppose it would be awkward to have a queen whom most people couldn't see. Besides, she has wings, and if she got vexed with you, she could fly away. If I were married and king of the whole land, and the person I married got vexed with me, I'd much rather she flew away. Don't talk like that, Alfred. You are only a little boy. And as you will never be king, you need not think about the future at all. Need he, fairy dear? Live happy, all four. To Pearl. Wish less, laugh more. To Rosetta. Often yet I'll be with you. Going to the door. Adieu. Adieu, adieu. Rosetta, following her, turns round at the door and kisses her hand to the three children, saying in time to fill up the measure of the fairy's verse. Adieu. As she speaks the word, she runs off, following the fairy. Pearl, between Felix and Alfred. Well, boys, something has happened. Curtain falls. End of section 23.
Willow the Wisp by Mary E. Stone. Read for LibriVox.org. Willow the Wisp, with your lantern gay, into far fairyland, show me the way. Here is a cricket, will jump on his back. The light from your lantern shall keep us the track. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 25 of The Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. Paul 90. The Children's Wonder Book. The Pursuit of Happiness by Tudor Jenks. Sometimes very strange things happen. There was once a discontented small boy. He saw many things which he was sure he would like to have. He found his clothes uncomfortable, or not so fine as he would have wished them to be. His family was not in all respects exactly to his taste. Occasionally he had things to do which he did not care to do. The fame of this remarkable lad spread far and wide. Proprietors of circuses and museums in vain tried to persuade his parents to exhibit him. His father, a very busy man, had to give much of his time to keep the boy's name out of the papers, and his mother was forced to vary his costume every time he went out. Of course, things were different in those days. Now the same boy would be much less remarked. In those days, a long time in the future, I believe it is, a discontented boy was indeed a rarity and this one was a remarkably fine specimen. His name I have not yet found out, but I expect it is Rudolphus. As there will be no difficulty in distinguishing him, we will call him Rudolphus during the recital of his adventures. The most striking symptom of dissatisfaction which he exhibited was discovered by his parents at the early age of fifteen. Soon after his fifteenth birthday, Rudolphus was invited with his kind parents to a picnic. It was at the seashore, and the weather was fine. Rudolphus was brushing the sand from a hard-boiled egg which he had dropped upon the beach for the third time, when without warning he looked up into the face of his happy mother, and said with much deliberation, I wish I had a million dollars. In spite of the distinctness with which he spoke, his mother could not believe she had understood him. What did you say? she asked. I wish, repeated Rudolphus, that I had a million dollars. There could be no mistake. His tender-hearted mother burst into tears, and excusing herself to the merry throng of picnickers, she sought out her husband, who was happily building sand hills for the waves to destroy. Calling him aside, she confided the whole story to the grieved father. It is a most extraordinary occurrence, said Mr. Rudolphus, as we may call him. For many years no similar case is recorded. And why this blow should come upon us in a moment without warning is beyond my comprehension. For a minute his emotion overpowered him. Recovering himself with an effort, he went on firmly. But I must meet it like a man. If Rudolphus wishes for a million dollars, why a million dollars Rudolphus must have. In no other way can he be convinced of the uselessness of wealth. Send him to me. Do not be severe with the boy, begged the mother, putting her gentle fingers upon the father's coat sleeve. Rudolphus is but a boy. He does not realize how much better it is to live without a superfluity of wealth. I shall not be severe with him, said the father, smiling reassuringly into the mother's pleading face. But think, this is the first sign of discontent since the old days when all men wished for money. Suppose the example should spread. Do you wish to see the world return to the Dark Ages? Consider, Mrs. Rudolphus, consider history. Mrs. Rudolphus shuddered. No, oh no, she said. I have read too much of the unhappiness of the past. But let us pay no attention to the idle talk of a thoughtless child. Rodolphus may never think of the matter again. Won by his wife's pleading, the stern brows of Mr. Rodolphus relaxed, and he at length agreed to pass over this offence as the aimless talk of a careless boy. But, as I have hinted, Rodolphus did not reform. In fact, by the time he was seventeen, he was known far and wide, near and narrow, high and low, as the discontented boy, 
and his parents saw that something must be done ere it was too late. At first they tried to reason with him. His father, a skilled logician, proved with mathematical exactness that Rudolphus had all he could eat, all he could wear, full opportunities for a free education at the expense of the state, the assurance of a fixed income, and a pension for his old age. Still, Rudolphus was silent. Well, my boy, said his father, what more do you find to ask for? Father, said Rudolphus, respectfully but firmly, it is impossible for me to perpetrate a falsehood. I wish I had a million dollars. I see, replied his father, that the case is serious, not to say hopeless. I know of but one course to pursue. You shall have a million dollars and enjoy life in your own way. Experience is the best of teachers. Fortunately, I can readily grant your wish. You know that my sister, your aunt, is one of the Supreme Council. Foreseeing this moment, I have already applied to the government, through her, for the sum you desire, and upon her representation that the money is needed for the cause of education, the Council has kindly placed that amount at her disposal. She is quite willing to turn the money over to you, and indeed has already done so. If you will go to my writing desk, you will find in the top drawer a certified check for one million dollars on the nation. Take it, my son, and do with it as you think best. I cannot give you my blessing, but at least I can wish you may come to no harm. Wringing his father's hand, the happy boy ran to the desk and soon returned bringing the check. He found his father still seated where he had left him, at the library table and buried in thought. Father, said Rudolphus, is there no mistake about the money? Can I really expend it as I choose? As you choose, replied his father solemnly. But remember that no one cares for money now. Since every person has enough, no one wishes for a superfluity. All have enough to eat, enough to wear, and enough to do. You have not, therefore, the same power that this large amount of money would once have given you. Still, you can certainly hire anyone to do for you the work which they choose to do. Of course, no one will know that you have more than your fellows, so long as you do not yourself reveal the fact. I understand, said Rudolphus, and his eyes twinkled. Goodbye, father, he said. I have been discontented, I admit, but I could not help it. I crave excitement. Life here is happy, but it is dull, very dull. If it were not for an occasional boiler explosion, railroad accident, or electric discharge, it would be unendurable. I am but a boy, I know, but I think I can be happier in my own way. Do not think hardly of me, father. Under the old constitution, about which Professor Jorkins told us in his ancient history course, man was entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Somehow, father... Here Rudolphus was compelled to pause for a moment. His feelings overpowered him. Somehow, I think those ancient fellows were not altogether wrong. Goodbye, father. Thank my aunt for her kindness, and say goodbye to mother. You are happy thus, but I am not. Goodbye. Stepping to the elevator, Rudolphus sank out of sight. Stifling his emotion in a handkerchief, Mr. Rudolphus said huskily, Unfortunate man that I am. Why is it my son who is the first to thus revert to the discontent of his ancestors? At this moment, the electric annunciator sounded its call to the day's work, and Mr. Rudolphus hurried away. As for Rudolphus, he was more discontented than ever. But now his discontent was not hopeless. Full of enthusiasm, he rushed to a well-known meeting place in the suburbs. With an impatient hand, he adjusted the telephone and hurriedly sent a number of messages. Rudolphus, while awaiting the result of the hasty summons he had dispatched, seated himself at the head of a long table covered with green bays and ran his eye over some papers which he drew from his pocket. Yes, he said triumphantly, all is in order. We needed but the money, and now even that lack is supplied. Rudolphus was not long alone. A young man soon entered the room and seated himself at the right hand of the newly-fledged millionaire. Another followed and seated himself at the left. Another and another joined these first comers, until the table was filled. Gentlemen, said Rudolphus. Citizens, prompted the young man at the right. Gentlemen, 
repeated Rudolphus firmly. I have the honour to announce that all is now ready for the execution of our plans. But the money? asked the young man at his left. All is ready, said Rudolphus. I have the money. Three rousing cheers followed this unexpected announcement. When silence was restored, Rudolphus, flushed with pleasure, resumed, I have here a check for one million dollars and... Again, the young man at his right interrupted him. But worthy president, is it? Rudolphus did not wait for the question to be finished. Impolite as it was, the president in turn interrupted the secretary. Yes, said President Rudolphus. The check, most noble secretary Montgomery, is certified. The cheers again broke forth. The president made a warning gesture with his hand. Hush, he said. Time enough for cheering when we are upon the blue seas. Now we must act and without delay. Here are the directions. You, Secretary Montgomery, must give the directions for the hull. I will attend to the rigging personally. The treasurer, turning to the young man at his left, may see to the supplies, while others will attend to the proper ordinance and the dynamite. Enough. To your duties. Four short weeks later, a small but beautifully proportioned steamer set sail from an island not far from the harbour's mouth. In vain did the national cruisers strive to overtake her. Even the swiftest torpedo boat, which had made fifty knots on her trial trip and was good for at least thirty-five, was left behind as readily as the slowest of the squadron. Without showing her colours, firing her gun, or playing a tune on her electric whistle, the strange steamer made for the offing and was soon out of sight. Morning broke and found the swift craft far out at sea and steaming merrily over the waves with all the speed her quintuple expansion electric motor could add to her excellent steam power. Upon the railed gallery of her conning tower stood Rudolphus. At last, he said with a sigh of heartfelt joy, at last we are pirates. Then drawing from his pocket an ancient leather-bound volume, he pressed it to his heart. Oh, Captain Kidd, how often have I poured in rapture over your delightful pages when I was supposed to be studying the latest volume in political economy? You it is, Captain Kidd, who first taught my youthful heart the delights of freedom, and showed me where true happiness was to be found. And now I too am a pirate. But his happy dreaming was interrupted. Smoke ho! cried the lookout. Order up the instantaneous photographer, said Captain Rudolphus and let the telescopic camera be adjusted on the weather bow. The first officer telephoned the order, and in a moment the apparatus was adjusted, the button was pressed by the pirate captain's own hand, the plate was developed by the assistant developer, and the completed picture, gummed to a neat pasteboard card, was handed to the impatient captain. Aha! he said gleefully. The national wheat boat on her way to India to procure supplies. We shall make a rich haul of trade dollars. Turning to the telephone, the captain shouted, Hello, Central? Hello, was the reply. What number? 323, in a hurry, said the captain. The bell rang, and the captain resumed, Hello, who are you? The trigonometer. Very good. How far away is the wheat boat when she takes a picture one inch long? After a pause, the answer came, Four miles, captain. All right, goodbye. The captain then telephoned a few rapid orders, and in a minute or two the kangaroo motor sent the light steamer to within dynamite range of the outward-bound wheat boat. Firing a gun-cotton shell across her bows, Rudolphus caused the other vessel to heave too. A receiving and transmitting telephone was then placed in a light hollow shell of rubber and fired aboard the wheat boat. Who are you? And what are you firing at us for? were the questions which Rudolphus heard through the telephone as he raised it to his ear. I, he replied, am the celebrated pirate Captain Rudolphus, the terror of the seas. After a pause, the message came. We never heard of you. Well, I've just started, said Rudolphus, glad that the telephone wire did not reveal his blushes. But that's what I'm going to be. Well, what do you want? I want your trade dollars said Rudolphus, angered by the slight chuckle which his improved telephone had brought to his ears. And if I don't get them, I shall send after you one of the most improved, self-propelling, self-feeding, self-directing, and self-exploding torpedoes you ever saw. 
The Sock Dollager Improved Reissued Number 10 Submarine. Perhaps you've heard of it? Nonsense, was the reply. What? asked Captain Rudolphus in reply. Nonsense! The answer was unmistakable. Dropping the telephone, Captain Rudolphus touched an electric button and the Sock Dollager was sent upon its horrid errand. Then he telephoned again to the fated vessel. The Sock Dollager is on her way! And indeed so it was, for high up in air could be heard its war cry, sent forth by the Sock Dollager itself through its phonographic steam whistle and talk attachment. It could be heard on both vessels. Here I come, the Sock Dollager number 10 improved submarine. Nothing can save you but immediate surrender. Beware of imitations. Look for the signature of the inventor after the explosion. None others are genuine. Here I come. Do you surrender? If you do, blow your whistle three times. Going, going. The wheat boat blew her whistle three times. After a short explanation by wire, the Sock Dollager came slowly back. The talk attachment saying, the Sock Dollager torpedoes can be obtained from all reputable dealers in dynamite or other high explosives or will be sent direct. We employ no agents, do not be deceived, ask for the genuine number 10 and take no other. Then a boat loaded with trade dollars came to the pirate steamer and was hoisted on deck. Several others loaded with other valuables followed, and after the booty was secured, the pirate steamer proceeded on her cruise. Other rich prizes rewarded Rodolphus and his crew, and their days were as happy as pirates could wish. Weeks passed by, and their good luck continued. But one day the lookout reported an electric cruiser dead ahead. She was flying the national flag, and as she came within hearing distance, Captain Rudolphus heard a whizzing in the air above him. He turned sharply, looked upward, and saw a flying torpedo hovering like a hummingbird over his head. In a moment a telephone wire was dropped upon the deck, bearing a label which read, Attach this to your telephone, or you'll be blown to pieces. He attached it to the telephone without unnecessary delay. Then he heard a voice say, Are you Captain Rudolphus, the alleged terror of the seas? I am, he answered. What's your armament? Sock Dollager's Improved Number 10, he answered. Submarine? What? Oh, yes, submarine. Well, we're from the National Cruiser, and she's armed with the Sock Dollager Number 12, Aerial Torpedo. Do you surrender? Why, of course, said Rudolphus. I only wanted to have a little fun. <laughs> Very good, said the Torpedo Man, who seemed to be a courteous sailor. You and your crew can get into the boats and go on board the cruiser. Your boat is a month old, and she's not worth saving. I shall blow her up in half an hour. Understand? Oh, yes, said Rodolphus. Goodbye. Goodbye, said Rodolphus. The pirate captain and his crew at once entered the boats, and the launches carried them to the cruiser. Then from the deck of the National Cruiser, the captain and his crew watched the operation of Sock Dollager No. 12. It was certainly a very effective weapon. The explosion was not loud but the result was satisfactory. The pirate vessel rose in a cloud of dust and then fell in fragments upon the waves. Among the pieces could be seen a number of neat rubber balloons, upon each of which was printed, so the pirates were told, a short and attractive advertisement of this, the newest thing in torpedoes. Then, her work accomplished, the national cruiser proceeded homeward. Do you use the kangaroo attachment? asked Rudolphus of the captain. Oh no, we use the sea serpent propeller. We shall be at home in two hours, said the captain. And so they were. A large crowd was gathered to welcome them, for the exploits of the terror of the seas had caused much amusement among the citizens. The inventors were very grateful to Rodolphus, and meant to petition the government to release him. It had been so long since they had had anything to do that they looked upon the piratical crews as a benefaction to their kind. But of course it would not do to allow so public a manifestation of discontent to pass unnoticed. The council was convened, and after a long debate, decided that Rudolphus and his crew should be known as antiquated individuals. The punishment was thought to be severe, but they were young and might someday hope for pardon and restoration to citizenship. Provided, of course, 
that they remained contented with their lot thereafter. When Rudolphus returned home, his mother was awaiting him in the reception room. Their interview was affecting. Rudolphus was, after all, a good son, and he loved his mother. He was affected by seeing her tears and spoke to her encouragingly. Do not weep, mother, he said. Here I am, safe and sound. My adventure may have been thoughtless, but I should never have been happy unless I had tried the experiment. It has cost only a few millions, and the government can easily spare the money. They ought not to regret the expense, as our example may keep others from similar courses. Let bygones be bygones. To others I may be an antiquated individual, but to you, mother, to you I am always your own Rudolphus. Cheered by these brave and loving words, Mrs. Rudolphus regained her composure and led Rudolphus to his father. The meeting between father and son was affecting also. After a few moments, Mr. Rudolphus said, My boy, I cannot regret the past. You have certainly learned a lesson which is well worth what it cost. You will, I am sure, never forget it. Hereafter, let us never refer to the matter. Let the terror of the seas be buried in the ocean of oblivion. For my part, I will say nothing to you except, Welcome home, my son. Still, let me hear from your own lips the acknowledgement that you made a mistake. Frankly, my son, were you not wrong? Could a million dollars make you contented? No, father said Rudolphus in a tone of conviction. I was wrong. A million dollars was not enough. I should have made it ten millions at the least. The boy's parents eyed him for some moments in speechless surprise. Then Mr. Rudolphus said, Well, let us go to dinner. End of section 25「The Griffin」by Marion Ames Taggart Read for LibriVox.org By Linda Marie Nielsen Vancouver, B.C. I am a griffin, gothic and grim, Large of head and small of limb, Medieval in every scale, With an utterly early English tale. For hundreds of years I have kept my perch, over the door of this ancient church. I have seen the Saxon urchins grin in response to my smile as they entered in. A Norman workman spent his toil on my neighbor, the graceful and gay gargoyle, whom, although I am far from proud, I scorn as modern and therefore loud. I have seen the white-robed monks at nones file past chanting in monotones and it seemed but yesterday indeed that they won the charter at runny mead i have seen the crop-headed men at arms marching with knoll to the sound of psalms and the cavaliers swaggering gaily dight singing and drinking to charlie's right and now from a land that was new to bess come fair shrill maidens who cry i guess they frighten the sinners with that great brute me a griffin as old as canute i curl my tail and thrust my tongue at the nineteenth century pert and young and feel with the scorn of conscious worth that i've the true beauty of gothic birth all alone with the years i sit how the ages come and flit stuart and tudor plan a gannet how fast men pass how soon forget but what are years or men or race to me who for ages have held my place a griffin perfect to every nail with an utterly early english Hail. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 27 of the Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carrie Chirac. The Children's Wonder Book. The Silver Hen by Mary E. Wilkins. Dame Dorothea Penny kept a private school. It was quite a small school, on account of the small size of her house. She had only twelve scholars, and they filled it quite full. Indeed, one very little boy had to sit in the brick oven. On this account, Dame Penny was obliged to do all her cooking on a Saturday when school did not keep. On that day she baked bread and cakes and pies enough to last a week. The oven was a very large one. It was on a Saturday that Dame Penny first missed her silver hen. She owned a wonderful silver hen, whose feathers looked exactly as if they had been dipped in liquid silver. When she was scratching for worms out in the yard, and the sun shone on her, she was absolutely dazzling, and sent little bright reflections into the neighbor's windows, as if she were really solid silver. Dame Penny had a sunny little coop with a padlocked door for her, and she always locked it very carefully every night. So it was doubly perplexing when the hen disappeared. Dame Penny remembered distinctly locking the coop door. Several circumstances had served to fix it in her mind. She had started out without her overshoes, then had returned for them because the snow was quite deep, and she was liable to rheumatism. Then Dame Louisa, who lived next door, had rapped on her window, and she had run in there for a few moments, with the hen coop key dangling on its blue ribbon from her wrist and Dame Louisa had remarked that she would lose that key if she were not more careful. Then, when she returned home across the yard, a doubt had seized her, and she had tried the coop door to be sure she had really fastened it. The next morning, when she fitted the key into the padlock and threw open the door, and no silver hen came clucking out, it was very mysterious. Dame Louisa came running to the fence which divided her yard from Dame Penny's, and stood, leaning on it with her apron over her head. "'Are you sure that hen was in the coop when you locked the door?' said she. "'Of course she was in the coop,' replied Dame Penny with dignity. "'She has never failed to go in there at sundown for all the twenty-five years that I have had her.' Dame Penny carefully searched everywhere about the premises. When the scholars assembled, she called the school to order and told them of her terrible loss. All the scholars crooked their arms over their faces and wept, for they were very fond of Dame Penny and also of the silver hen." Every one of them wore one of her silver tail feathers in the best bonnet or hat, as the case might be. The silver hen had dropped them about the yard, and Dame Penny had presented them from time to time as rewards for good behavior. After Dame Penny had told the school, she tried to proceed with the usual exercises, but in vain. She whipped one little boy because he said that four and three made seven, and she stood a little girl in the corner because she spelled hen with one n. Finally, she dismissed the scholars and gave them permission to search for the silver hen. She offered the successful one the most beautiful Christmas present he had ever seen. It was about three weeks before Christmas. The children all put on their things and went home and told their parents what they were going to do. Then they started upon the search for the silver hen. They searched with no success till the day before Christmas. Then they thought they would ask Dame Louisa, who had the reputation of being quite a wise woman, if she knew any more likely places in which they could hunt. The twelve scholars walked two by two up to Dame Louisa's front door and knocked. They were very quiet and spoke only in whispers because they knew Dame Louisa was nervous and did not like children very well. Indeed, it was a great cross to her that she lived so near the school, for the scholars when out in their own yard never thought about her nervousness and made a deal of noise. Then, too, she could hear every time they spelled, or said the multiplication table, or bounded the countries of Africa, and it was very trying. Today, in spite of their efforts to be quiet, they awoke her from a nap, and she came to the door, with her front piece and cap on one side and her spectacles over her eyebrows, very much out of humor. "'I don't know where you'll find the hen,' said she peevishly, "'unless you go to the White Woods for it.' "'Thank you, ma'am,' said the children, with courtesies, and they all turned and went down the path between the dead Christmas trees. Dame Louisa had no idea that they would go to the White Woods, she had said it quite at random, although she was so vexed in being disturbed in her nap that she wished for a moment that they would. She stood in her front door and looked at her dead Christmas trees, and that always made her feel crosser, and she had not at any time a pleasant disposition. Indeed, it was rumored among the townspeople that that had blasted her Christmas trees, that Dame Louisa's scolding, fretting voice had floated out to them and smote their delicate twigs like a bitter frost and made them turn yellow, 
for the real Christmas tree is not very hardy. No one else in the village, probably no one else in the county, owned any such tree, alive or dead. Dame Louise's husband, who had been a sea captain, had brought them from foreign parts. They were mere little twigs when they planted them on the first day of January, but they were full-grown and loaded with fruit by the next Christmas day. Every Christmas they were cut down and sold, but they always grew again to their full height in a year's time. They were not, it is true, the regulation Christmas tree. That is, they were not loaded with different and suitable gifts for everyone in a family, as they stood there in Dame Louise's yard. People always tied on those, after they had bought them, and had set them up in their own parlors. But these trees bore regular fruit like apple or peach or plum trees, only there was a considerable variety in it. These trees, when in full fruitage, were festooned with strings of popcorn and weighed down with apples and oranges and figs and bags of candy, and it was really an amazing sight to see them out there in Dame Louise's front yard. But now they were all yellow and dead, and not so much as one popcorn whitened the upper branches, neither was there one candle shining out in the night. For the trees, in their prime, had borne also little twinkling lights like wax candles. Dame Louisa looked out at her dead Christmas trees and scowled. She could see the children out in the road, and they were trudging along in the direction of the white woods. Let em go, she snapped to herself. I guess they won't go far. I'll be rid of their noise anyway. She could hear poor Dame Penny's distressed voice out in her yard calling, Biddy, 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 and she scowled more fiercely than ever. I'm glad she's lost her old silver hen, she muttered to herself. She had always suspected the silver hen of pecking at the roots of the Christmas trees and so causing them to blast. Then, too, the silver hen had used to stand on the fence and crow, for unlike other hens, she could crow very beautifully, and that had disturbed her a great deal. Dame Louisa had a very wise book, which she had consulted to find the reason for the death of her Christmas trees. But all she could find in it was one short item, which did not satisfy her at all. The book was on the plan of an encyclopedia, and she... Having turned to the CHs, found Christmas trees, very delicate when transplanted, especially sensitive, and liable to blast at any change in the moral atmosphere. Remedy? Discover and confess the cause. After reading this, Dame Louisa was always positive that Dame Penny's silver hen was at the root of the mischief, for she knew that she herself had never done anything to hurt the trees. Dame Penny was so occupied in calling, Biddy, Biddy, Biddy! and shaking a little pan of corn, that she never noticed the children taking the road toward the white woods. If she had done so, she would have stopped them, for the white woods was considered a very dangerous place. It was called white because it was always white, even in midsummer. The trees and bushes and all the undergrowth, every flower and blade of grass were white with snow and frost all the year round, and all of the learned men of the country had studied into the reason of it, and had come to the conclusion that the woods lay in a direct draught from the North Pole, and that produced the phenomenon. Nobody had penetrated very far into the White Woods, although many expeditions had been organized for that purpose. The cold was so terrible that it drove them back. The children had heard all about the terrors of the White Woods. When they drew near it, they took hold of one another's hands and snuggled as closely together as possible. When they struck into the path at the entrance, the intense cold turned their cheeks and noses blue in the moment, but they kept on calling, Biddy, 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 in their shrill, sweet trebles. Every twig on the trees was glittering white with hoar frost, and all the dead blackberry vines were white wreaths. The bushes brushed the ground. They were so heavy with ice, and the air was full of fine white sparkles. The children's eyes were dazzled, but they kept on, stumbling through the icy vines and bushes and calling, Biddy, Biddy, Biddy. It was quite late in the afternoon when they started, and pretty soon the sun went down and the moon arose, and that made it seem colder. It was like traveling through a forest of solid silver then, and every once in a while a little frozen clump of flowers would shine so that they would think it was the silver hen and dart forward to find it was not. About two hours after the moon arose, as they were creeping along, calling, Biddy, Biddy. Biddy, more and more faintly, a singular hoarse voice replied suddenly. We don't keep any hens, said the voice, and all the children jumped and screamed and looked about for the owner of it. He loomed up among some bushes at their right. He was so dazzling white himself and had such an indistinctiveness of outline 
that they had taken him for an oak tree. But it was the real snowman. They knew him in a moment. He looked so much like his effigies that they used to make in their yards. We don't keep any hens, repeated the snowman. What are you calling hens for in this forest? The children huddled together as close as they could, and the oldest boy explained. When he broke down, the oldest girl piped up and helped him. Well, said the snowman, I haven't seen the silver hen. I never did see any hens in these woods, but she may be around here for all that. You had better go home with me and spend the night. My wife will be delighted to see you. We have never had any company in our lives, and she is always scolding about it. The children looked at each other and shook harder than they had done with cold. I'm afraid our mothers wouldn't like to have us, stammered the oldest boy. Nonsense, cried the snowman. Here I have been visiting you time and time again and stood whole days out in your front yards, and you've never been to see me. I think it is about time that I had some return. Come along. With that, the snowman seized the right ear of the oldest boy between a finger and thumb and danced him along, and all the rest trembling and whimpering under their breaths followed. It was not long before they reached the snowman's house, which was really quite magnificent, a castle built of blocks of ice fitted together like bricks, and with two splendid snow lions keeping guard at the entrance. The snowman's wife stood in the door, and the snow children stood behind her and peeped around her skirts. They were smiling from ear to ear. They had never seen any company before, and they were so delighted that they did not know what to do. "'We have some company, wife!' shouted the snowman. "'Bring them right in,' said his wife with a beaming face. She was very handsome, with beautiful pink cheeks and blue eyes, and she wore a trailing white robe like a queen. She kissed the children all around, and shivers crept down their backs, for it was like being kissed by an icicle. "'Kiss your company, my dears,' she said to the snow children." and they came bashfully forward and kissed Dame Penny's scholars with these same chilly kisses. Now, said the snowman's wife, come right in and sit down where it is cool. You look very hot. Hot, when the poor scholars were quite stiff with cold. They looked at one another in dismay, but did not dare say anything. They followed the snowman's wife into her grand parlor. Come right over here by the north window where it is cooler, she said, and the children shall bring you some fans. The snow children floated up with fans. All the snowman's family had a lovely floating gait, and the scholars took them with feeble courtesies and began fanning. A stiff north wind blew in at the windows. The forest was all creaking and snapping with the cold. The poor children fanning themselves on an ice divan would certainly have frozen if the snowman's wife had not suggested that they all have a little game of puss in the corner to while away the time before dinner. That warmed them up a little for they had to run very fast indeed to play with the snow children, who seemed to fairly blow in the north wind from corner to corner. But the snowman's wife stopped the play a little before dinner was announced. She said the guests looked so warm that she was alarmed and was afraid they might melt. A whistle that sounded just like the whistle of the north wind in the chimney blew for dinner, and Dame Penny's scholars thought with delight that now they would have something warm. But every dish on the snowman's table was cold and frozen, and the snowman's wife kept urging them to eat this and that, because it was so nice and cooling, and they looked so warm. After dinner they were colder than ever even. Another game of Puss in the Corner did not warm them much. They were glad when the snowman's wife suggested they go to bed, for they had visions of warm blankets and comfortables. But when they were shown into the great north chamber, that was more like a hall than a chamber, with its walls of solid ice, its ice floor, and its ice beds, their hearts sank. Not a blanket nor comfortable was to be seen. There were great silk bags stuffed with snowflakes instead of feathers on the beds, and that was all. If you are too warm in the night and feel as if you are going to melt, said the snowman's wife, you can open the south window and that will make a draft. There are none, but the north windows open now. The scholars curtsied and bade her good night, and she kissed them and hoped they would sleep well. Then she trailed her splendid robe, which was decorated with real frost embroidery, down the ice stairs and left her guests to themselves. They were frantic with cold and terror, and the little ones began to cry. They talked over the situation and agreed that they had better wait until the house was quiet and then run away. So they waited until they thought everybody must be asleep and then cautiously stole toward the door. It was locked fast on the outside. The snowman's wife had slipped an icicle through the latch. Then they were in despair. 
It seemed as if they must freeze to death before morning. But it occurred to some of the older ones that they had heard their parents say that snow was really warm, and people had been kept warm and alive by burrowing under snowdrifts. And as there were enough snowflake beds to use as coverlids also, they crept under them, having first shut the north windows, and were soon quite comfortable. In the meantime, there was a great panic in the village. The children's parents were nearly wild. They came running to Dame Penny, but she was calling, Biddy! 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 out in the moonlight, and knew nothing about them. Then they called outside Dame Louise's window, but she pretended to be asleep and not hear them, although she was really awake and in a terrible panic. She did not tell the parents how the children had gone to the White Woods, because she knew that they could not extricate themselves from the difficulty as well as she could herself. She knew all about the snowman and his wife and how very anxious they were to have company. So just as soon as the parents were gone, and she heard their voices in the distance, she dressed herself, harnessed her old white horse into the great box sleigh, got out all the tubs and pails that she had in the house, and went over to Dame Penny, who was still standing out in her front yard calling the silver hen and the children by turns. "'Come, Dame Penny,' said Dame Louisa. "'I want you to go with me to the white woods and rescue the children. Bring out all the tubs and pails you have in the house, and we will pump them full of water.' "'The pails? Full of water? What for?' gasped Dame Penny. "'To thaw them out!' replied Dame Louisa. They will very likely be wholly or partly frozen, and I have always heard that cold water was the only remedy to use. Dame Penny said no more. She brought out all her tubs and pails, and they pumped them and Dame Louisa's full of water and packed them into the sleigh. There were twelve of them. Then they climbed into the seat, slapped the reins over the back of the old white horse, and started off for the white woods. On the way, Dame Louisa wept and confessed what she had done to Dame Penny. I have been a cross, selfish old woman, said she, and I think that is the reason why my Christmas trees were blasted. I don't believe your silver hen touched them. She and Dame Penny called, Biddy, 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 and the names of the children, all the way. Dame Louisa drove straight to the snowman's house. They are more likely to be there than anywhere else. The snowman and his wife are so crazy to have company, said she. When they arrived at the house, Dame Louisa left Dame Penny to hold the horse and went in. The outer door was not locked, and she wandered quite at her will through the great ice saloons and windswept corridors. When she came to the door with the icicle through the latch, she knew at once that the children were in that room, so she drew out the icicle and entered. The children were asleep, but she aroused them and bade them be very quiet and follow her. They got out of the house without disturbing any of the family but once out, a new difficulty beset them. The children had been so nearly warm under their snowflake beds that they began to freeze the minute the icy air struck them. But Dame Louisa promptly seized them, while Dame Penny held the horse, and put them into the tubs and pails of water. Then she took hold of the horse's head and backed him and turned around carefully, and they started off at full speed. Then she took hold of the horse's head and backed him and turned around carefully, and they started off at full speed. But it was not long before they discovered that they were pursued. They heard the hoarse voice of the snowman behind them, calling them to stop. "'What are you taking away my company for?' shouted the snowman. "'Stop! Stop!' The wind was at the back of the snowman, and he came with tremendous velocity. It was evident that he would soon overtake the old white horse, who was stiff and somewhat lame. Dame Louisa whipped him up, but the snowman gained on them. The icy breath of the snowman blew over them. "'Oh!' shrieked Dame Penny. "'What shall we do? What shall we do?' "'Be quiet,' said Dame Louisa, with dignity. She untied her large poke bonnet, which was made of straw. She was unable to have a velvet one for winter now her Christmas trees were dead. And she hung it on the whip. Then she drew a match from her pocket and set fire to the bonnet. The light fabric blazed up directly, and the snowman stopped short. "'If you come any nearer,' shrieked Dame Louisa, "'I'll put this right in your face, and—' and melt you. Give me back my company, shouted the snowman in a doubtful voice. You can't have your company, said Dame Louisa, shaking the blazing bonnet defiantly at him. To think of the days I've spent in their yards, slowly melting and suffering everything, and my not having one visit back, grumbled the snowman. But he stood still. He never took a step forward after Dame Louisa had set her bonnet on fire. It was lucky that Dame Louisa had worn a worsted scarf tied over her bonnet. I could now use it for a bonnet. The cold was intense, 
and had it not been that Dame Penny and Dame Louisa both wore their Bay State shawls over their beaver sacks, and their stone martin tippets and muffs and blue worsted stockings drawn over their shoes, they would certainly have frozen. As for the children, they would never have reached home alive if it had not been for the pails and tubs of water. "'Do you feel as if you were thawing?' Dame Louisa asked the children after they had left the snowman behind. "'Yes, ma'am,' said they. Dame Louisa drove as fast as she could, with thankful tears running down her cheeks. "'I've been a wicked, cross old woman,' she said again and again, "'and that is what blasted my Christmas trees.' It was the dawn of Christmas Day when they came in sight of Dame Louisa's house. "'Oh, what is that twinkling out in the yard?' cried the children. They could all see little fairy-like lights twinkling out in Dame Louisa's yard. "'It looks just as the Christmas trees used to,' said Dame Penny." "'Oh, I can't believe it!' cried Dame Louisa, her heart beating wildly. But when they came opposite the yard, they saw that it was true. Dame Louisa's Christmas trees stood there, all twinkling with lights, and covered with trailing garlands of popcorn, oranges, apples, and candy bags. Their yellow branches had turned green, and the Christmas trees were in full glory. "'Oh, what is that shining so out in Dame Penny's yard?' cried the children, who were entirely thawed, and only needed to get home to their parents and have some warm breakfast and Christmas presents to be quite themselves. Biddy, 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 cried Dame Penny, and Dame Louisa and the children chimed in, calling Biddy, Biddy, Biddy. It was indeed the silver hen, and following her were twelve little silver chickens. She had stolen a nest in Dame Louisa's barn, and nobody had known it until she appeared on Christmas morning with her brood of silver chickens. Every scholar shall have one of the silver chickens for a Christmas present, said Dame Penny, and each shall have one of my Christmas trees, said Dame Louisa. Then all the scholars cried out with delight. The Christmas bells in the village began to ring. The silver hen flew up on the fence and crowed. The sun shone broadly out, and it was a merry Christmas day. End of section 27「Section number 28 of the Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The Children's Wonder Book. Red Velvet Pig by Marion Manville. What will Tommy have for dessert? asked Grandma. A stomach ache, I imagine, answered Papa with a laugh, as he wiped his big mustaches with his napkin. Tommy watched that process with interest, so absorbing as to deprive him of speech, until the napkin descended into Papa's lap. Then he replied soberly, Me ain't dot no tummy ache. Ho, laughed Brother Jack. Yes, you have. Little pips all have stomach aches. It's bad manners to call names, Jack, said Mama reprovingly. Little brother means he has no stomach ache. Bless the child, said Grandma fondly. He has hard work to keep awake. It was Christmas dinner, and Tommy sat at the table with the family for the first time. He had felt very important, but the glitter of lights and china and silver had begun to weary him. He leaned back in his wicker high chair with his little spoon in his mouth and looked thoughtfully around. There was a queer Dresden china shepherdess standing in the center of the table, holding a vase on her shoulder, which in turn held more roses than Tommy could count. Mama was dressed in a beautiful red velvet frock that was very dark in places and then leaped into flame in others as the light fell across it. There was a soft vest in front of some creamy stuff, brocaded pattern in it. Grandma had on a black silk and some pretty lace over her white hair, and crossed kerchief-wise around her shoulders. Everybody certainly looked well, and Tommy glanced, down with complacency, upon his own fat little body arrayed in a new kilt and wrapped with a wonderful scarf that had red tassels at each end. And as he looked, the most wonderful thing happened. The funniest red velvet pig popped right out from under the table. He was brocaded in stripes around his body and had a cream-colored background, so to speak, which set off the flowery bands upon his person 
to the best possible advantage. Tommy was too amazed to speak, but as the pig seemed about to go into the drawing room, he made haste to scramble down from his chair and follow. As he crossed the sill, he thought he would call Grandma and Mama, but there was another surprise in store for him that rendered him speechless. The red velvet pig had gone through the drawing room door, to be sure, but instead of going into the long room, with its soft lights and open fire and warm curtains and thick rugs to roll upon, Tommy followed him into a big green field, full of flowers and long grasses, and many curious things, as Tommy saw at the first glance. He opened his mouth to call the nurse, but just as he was ready to speak, the red velvet pig arose on his hind legs and set off across the fields at quite a pace. Tommy was so diverted by this extraordinary performance that he laughed a fat little laugh and trotted after as fast as his short legs could carry him. And that was the very last he thought of Mama or Grandma or Nurse during all his singular trip. The pig turned his head in a jocular way and looked at Tommy over his shoulder. Are you coming with me, little man? He said with a very cordial invitation, conveyed in the way he grunted. Yes, sir, if I tan, replied Tommy, modestly and yet with eagerness. Perhaps we had better stop and see Rose Scarlet on our way. She lives just over that little hill said the red velvet pig in a confidential tone. Tommy felt immensely gratified at the proposition, but could think of nothing to say in reply, so kept still. They had to go through quite a forest. As they emerged, Tommy's eyes nearly rolled out of his head, in amazement at what he beheld. At first he thought they were in a field of strange-shaped white flowers, but what he mistook for blossoms were in reality lovely frosted cakes growing on stalks just conveniently high to reach. I think it's about time for lunch, said the red velvet pig, picking a little heart-shaped cake and eating it with great gusto. Help yourself, he said to Tommy, with a wave of his left forefoot which seemed very comprehensive. If you want chocolate cake, just bark three times and roll over. Now Tommy was very fond of chocolate cake, but he feared he could not bark correctly. Although he was such a fat little mite, he knew from past experience he could roll over as well as if he had practiced a hundred years. He took a sugar kiss and ate it while he deliberated. At last it seemed a very simple thing to do in order to get a piece of his favorite cake, so he barked and rolled over three times. It was not the least surprising when he jumped up to hear the jingle of Zip's bangles and to have four legs instead of two. In fact, this arrangement so delighted him that he capered about and barked at the cakes and the red velvet pig with such fine effect that he amused them mightily. Indeed, the cakes shook so with laughter that a great many dropped crumbs off their fat sides, which immediately took root and grew macaroons, greatly to Tommy's delight. You see, we begin at the right end of a dinner to suit little boys. I think this is a pretty good kind of a country to live in, said the pig, with satisfaction showing on every brocaded flower upon him. Tommy thought so, too, and would have said so, only Zip's tongue seemed, if anything, more clumsy and awkward than his own to manage. So he was obliged to bark again, as a sign of assent. This appeared perfectly intelligible to the pig, who continued, Now I think a little roast duck, or quail, on toast, or a wing of a fine spring chicken, would taste about right. Suppose we go into the next dining field. So they pattered along on all fours, greatly to Tommy's edification, who found this means of locomotion an improvement upon his previous method. Before he could realize they had left the cake field, he perceived they were in the midst of the most curious-looking plants he had ever beheld, while a savory odor arose from them, very like the nice smells he had observed in Cook's kitchen at home. Some of these singular plants had, instead of leaves, a fine crisp chicken wing, or breast, done to an exact turn, and rolled in fringed paper pinned together with the wishbones. On others, standing out like big buds from the stalk, were many fat golden-brown drumsticks, while as a crowning effect each and every plant had at the top a piece of toast, with the whole quail, or plover, or reed bean, laid upon it in the most tempting manner. Tommy ate with moderation, not being very hungry after the sweets. But the red velvet pig ate with such prodigious appetite 
that he kept growing bigger all the time. Finally, he picked a piece of toast and threw it at Tommy in a friendly way. But as it hit one of his forelegs and was moreover rather hard, it didn't seem nearly as funny to him as it seemed to be to the pig. Indeed, Tommy yelped and whined and found himself quite unable to move the injured member, which speedily grew into a fire shovel, which was a great weight and impediment to him. Oh, that's no matter, said the red velvet pig, with what Tommy thought heartless indifference. You remember how you hurt Zip the other day by throwing Noah's Ark at him? You pretty near broke his leg, but it didn't hurt you any. Tommy was obliged to confess to himself that this was perfectly true and dragged his fire shovel along with humility and what patience he could muster dear dear said the red velvet pig we shall never get to see rose scarlet at this pace suppose we hurry along a little faster poor tommy hopped and hobbled as best he could but found himself unable to keep up with the pig whose legs seemed to grow longer every minute at last as he was quite breathless and almost in despair the red velvet pig stopped with a great flourish before a big rose bush which grew beside the road he knocked on the stalk and immediately there appeared the biggest rose tommy ever remembered to have seen it was six times as big as the very biggest one in the vase on the table at home and was of a bright scarlet color quite dazzling to look upon as tommy limped up and stretched himself out on the ground feeling very tired he observed the red velvet pig was holding a flowery conversation with the big rose. I declare, friend Velvet, whenever I have the happiness of meeting you, you appear to me like a lovely cream jug filled with winter strawberries. And whenever I see you, replied the pig with great gallantry, making his best bow, I am filled with the sweetness of wild honey, and the day lantern shines with greater splendor and magnificence. Just here Tommy became conscious of a singular sensation in his right ear. Putting up his paw to discover what it was, he found something growing there, and looking at the red velvet pig, he observed a big creamy rose standing out of the pig's left ear, and appearing very fresh and beautiful. So he concluded it must be a rose in his own. Just as he was convinced this was the case, he heard a small voice saying to him, Stand on your head and you can talk too. With great difficulty he accomplished this feat, finding it hard to lift the fire shovel leg with its brass handle in the air. But as soon as he had succeeded, he was delighted to behold his own kilts again and have the use of his own tongue. So he thought it no more proper that he should say something gallant to Rose Scarlet, and upon opening his mouth spoke very fluently and as plainly as any one. When I see you, the paragoric bottle is seized with a terrible stomachache and my canton flannel elephant packs his trunk and tries to hide in noah's ark manners manners cried the pig turning upon him with a squeal of rage and wrapping his horny forefeet smartly together poor tommy felt overwhelmed with confusion and mortification to think his treacherous tongue had said such dreadful things to beautiful rose scarlet when he intended to say something especially sweet and flattering to his horror the ear of the red velvet pig began to grow and grow and grow and the creamy rose in it got to look as big as a cabbage and bigger and bigger and bigger and just as they were both about to tumble down upon him he gathered strength enough to scream for zip to come and bite the red velvet pig whose ear immediately turned into the vase filled with lovely roses upon the table poor little darling he fell asleep and had a bad dream said mamma as nurse gathered him up out of his high chair Tommy opened his frightened eyes and looked sleepily around. We don't like the wed velvet pig, he exclaimed. Grandma patted him reassuringly as she wiped the damp forehead and brushed back the baby rings upon it. Grandma's precious boy. He shan't have the red velvet pig if he don't want it. Everybody else laughed and Papa said, Too much roast turkey, my little son. Who ever heard of a red velvet pig? shouted Brother Jack in great glee. But Tommy drew a sigh of relief and gurgled his baby laugh as he nestled down in nurse's arms. Me saw him, bad wed velvet pig. End of section 28.
Wool Gathering by Helen Gray Cone. Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Where are my five wits gone, and will they come back soon? They're gone a gathering wool in the valleys of the moon. There the little dream sheep that look like mounds of snow through the green, green meadows go grazing to and fro. Thither have I sent them, those five wits of mine, two with bags and two with crooks, and one with shears that shine. They catch the little dream sheep and cut their fleece away, all to weave a story from upon another day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section number 30 of the Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Children's Wonder Book. An Old Fashioned Witch Story. Translated from the Danish by Laura E. Poulsen. It was in the earliest springtime. In the shade, the air was still quite cold, but where the clear and strong sunshine streamed down, one could see that spring had come, for there the blossoms were beginning to stretch upward on their tiny stalks. A couple of poor children came walking through the forest. A ten-year-old girl named nina and her little brother johannes they were seeking flowers nina had to find them because the flowers were too tiny and too much hidden for so small a child as johannes to spy them for himself but she always let him have the pleasure of picking them it was such a joyous spring walk that nina did not notice how far they were straying from their grandmother's hut back of the hill this little hut had been their home only for a short time when their dear father and mother died their grandmother had kindly taken them to live with her and this was their first walk in the forest at last nina thought they ought to go back but just as she turned around with joannes by the hand who should stand before them but a hideous old creature more glaring and frightful than you can imagine what are you doing here you wretched children she shrieked are you plucking flowers in my forest then i shall pluck you you may believe oh pardon us cried nina we did not know that we must not pick flowers here we are strangers in this forest pray pray pardon us snickle-snack fiddlestick answered the terrific old witch for such the creature was don't talk to me i never pay attention to what children say nor old folk either for that matter indeed i don't snickle-sack snickle-sack but it is not you that i want silly girl it is the boy there who has offended me the little rascal it is he who picked the flowers now i shall take him oh take me take me instead cried nina in terror flinging her arms around her brother it is my fault i showed him the flowers and let him pick them you've no right to take him oh do take me he is too little snickle-snack answered the witch what a lot of talk but you are right the boy is small to come into my service so i suppose i shall have to take you now listen well to what i say spring and summer are coming and i shall have no work for you then so i shall not trouble myself about you for the present but when autumn has come and gone and all the leaves and flowers have disappeared 
then are we very busy in the underground world then you may believe that i shall teach you how to work and i live deep down very very deep now you may go but i will make a bargain with you when the last flower is faded listen when the last flower is faded meet me here on the spot or or the old wish stopped to think what she could best threaten nina with her wicked eyes glared around for an instant till she noticed that nina stood with her arms about her little brother ready to ward off any evil that might come upon him or i shall come and catch this little rascal and twist his arms and legs all out of joint screamed the witch shaking her naughty stick at little johannes then after a dark glance at nina she shuffled off through the forest with the crows shrieking after her and the leaves and flowers trembling on every side as soon as the witch was out of sight nina hastened home with joannes like a kind sister she suited her frightened pace to his so that he should not stumble and fall the poor little boy had been so terrified at the witch that he had not in the least understood the cruel threats she had used against him or the dreadful fate which was in store for nina nina was rejoiced that this was so for then he could not tell their grandmother what the witch had said and she herself would not disclose the dreadful doom hanging over her she was determined that the poor grandmother should not be made more anxious and sorrowful as long as it could be helped shortly after this spring burst forth in all its power and beauty and the blossoms shot up everywhere in the woods the fields the meadows and the gardens nina welcomed them as her dearest friends they would protect her against the forest witch so long as she had a single one of these she would not have to go down into the dark earth to serve the hideous witch nina had always loved flowers but never had she thought so much about them as now yet alas spring soon turned into summer and summer went faster than ever before it seemed to poor nina the tears streamed down her cheeks as she saw the blue cornflowers fall before the reaper's scythe when the grain was cut in harvest time but nina could still hope even then for the roses continued to bloom on grandmother's old rosebush outside the door of the hut nina kissed them and begged them to last as long as ever they could and so they did the dear friendly roses when the last little rose had at length withered autumn had almost passed and the many colored leaves were dropping from the trees by thousands yet nina discovered to her joy and comfort that there were flowers still along the roadside stood the simple hardy wild aster which bloomed on and on although the autumn winds and rains destroyed everything else winter began but so mildly that it seemed as if it were still autumn when the asters finally disappeared other help came to dina for the hazel bush was completely hoaxed by the mild weather and thought it was spring so it began to unfold its yellow catkins standing beautiful and bright as one saw it between the bay trees over the hedges so even when the winter was far advanced nina was still saved by going to the witch but this could not long continue cold weather must come soon because grandmother had said that christmas was near and suddenly winter did come in earnest with its icy frosts and drifting snows for five days it was impossible to get out of the hut because the wind kept whirling the snow into high drifts all about it but when the sixth day came the wind abated 
and the snow lay peacefully on the ground now nina dared no longer to stay in the house for surely all the flowers were dead and buried under the cold snow after this bitter storm she must go and keep her compact with the witch so gathering together all her courage she stole out of the house without being seen by any one outside she stood still for an instant took a last look at the hut which now seemed so cosy and dear whispered farewell and started on her way to the forest but she had gathered too little courage after all for it melted away immediately when she discovered waiting for her a few steps from the door the witch standing in their little roadside garden you've been rather slow about keeping to your bargain exclaimed the witch angrily i was just coming after you oh do not make me go with you cried nina in her agony she fell down upon the snow at the witch's great feet and besought her wildly let me go free oh do let me go free snickersnack snapped the witch up with you no nonsense can there really be not a single flower wailed nina she half rose and fairly beside herself with fright and despair she began to scrape the snow aside from the garden bed at the side of the path trying to find a flower oh yes look if you like snickersnack snickersnack laughed the witch her face glowing with exultation at nina's trouble but an instant after her countenance became filled with fury for where nina had cleared the snow aside there appeared a plant with fresh dark green leaves and white flower buds nina clasped her hands together in great joy and thankfulness then breaking off a bud she lifted it up high toward the witch and rushed away into the hut the witch in her disappointment and vexation sprang about so wildly in the snow that it rose in a cloud all about her and nina never saw her again safe at home in the little hut nina now told all her adventure and the grandmother took the little girl's sweet frightened face between her two old hands and kissed her forehead many times faithfully every day nina went to pay a loving visit to the little christmas rose in the garden helleborus nisier that for was the name of the flower which had saved her and the whole winter long it could be found fresh and beautiful here and there under the snow though no other blossoms dare come forth to face the snows and frosts of deep winter the christmas rose ventures bravely out into the bleak weather and with modest and serene courage holds her own against its powers the snow lying over it keeps it from freezing and if one brushes away this beautiful covering the christmas rose appears with its lovely white gold center blossoms laughing at the frost it blooms steadily on until it can say good day to spring's first blossom the little snowdrop and so through all the year are there flowers blooming in our dear northern land thus it was that nina escaped the witch who being a forest witch did not know of the christmas rose because that is a garden flower end of section thirty recording by linda Marie nielsen vancouver b c was is the conqueror by edith w cook read for librivox dot org by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c lo all the world i have conquered gooseclap the mighty one said light laughed an indian woman shaking her dark braided head speak not too swiftly my master 
one still unconquered remains was is the baby forever lord of the mightiest reigns watching the motes in the sunshine baby sat still on the floor gooscap the mighty magician gazed through the open door he who had vanquished the storm bird binding its wings in the north ever the wild winds after speeding more gently forth he who could fashion the squirrel little or great at his will lord of the bear and the beaver master of good and ill gazed at the wonderful baby watching the dancing gold wondered what magical weapon little brown fingers could hold happy of heart in the sunshine was is the wonderful child sucking the sweets of the maple looked at the stranger and smiled gooscap the mighty magician wife had known never nor child knew not the heart's tender watchwords wherewith caresses are wild softly he smiled at the baby bidding him gently come nigh was this stirred not from the sunshine watching the motes dance by sweet then as midsummer forest singeth the wee winter when spoke unto was this the strong one master of beasts and men unto the master's eyes lifted wandering eyes of the child moved in the sunshine no shadow was this sat silent and smiled then with a voice as of thunder under a terrible frown from the fir trees of the forest shaking the brown cones down gooselap the mighty magician spoke his command o'er and o'er neither the sunshine nor shadow changed on the lodge's bare floor but from the brown eyes of wazis rolled the great tears to the floor rose from the red lips wide parted mighty voiced heart piercing roar gusap the slayer of beaver wondering er more and more wove all the spells of his magic was this the unsubdued or singing the strange wild music wherewith he conjured the dead wherewith the dark-hearted spirits up from their caverns he led smooth grew the cheeks of the baby dry the bright tears in his eyes merriest playfellow gooscap seemed unto wisest the wise who as the magic grew wilder still by each spell unbeguiled sucking his sweet maple sugar looked at the great chief and smiled gooseup while weary with struggle sat in the low lodge door moved not the shadow of wasis over the sunlit floor round the red lips of the baby ripples of laughter o'erflowed gazed he admiring at gooseup goo gooed and lustly crowd vain was the strength of the giant never a spell could bind was this the unconquered baby stronger than sun or wind well spake the indian woman thoughtfully gooseup spoke kindling his pipe while the baby smiled at the curling smoke though the world i am master one still unconquered remains was this the baby forever master of gooseup reigns still know the indian woman was this the wonderful child and when the baby cries goo goo unto contentment beguiled crowing none knowing the reason softly they say through his thought runneth the time where old gooseup mightiest conquest he wrought so since the world had beginning nothing unconquered remains 
save only was this the baby home's little master he reigns end of poem this recording is in the public domain Section 32 of the Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eve. Social media at YS Eve Chan. The Children's Wonder Book. Mary Lee's Story by Robert Drock. This is the story which Mary Lee told me while she sat in a huge rocking chair late one New Year's afternoon. It had been a joyful day for her, full of active play, and as the dust began to fall and the skaters on the pond across the lawn grew dim in the twilight, she curled up on the big chair to rest a little and wait for tea. Her twinkling feet and busy hands were seldom still, all day long, and I felt very much honoured by this quiet half-hour of her company. There was just enough light falling on the western windows of the parsonage to make a pretty picture of the little girl, with the real yellow hair and blue eyes of children in fairy stories. Well, what do you think? said Mary Lee, with the grave sigh she uses when she is about to take you into her confidence. I'm nearly five, and I'm going to have a beautiful birthday party, with a room full of candy and ice cream, and little boys and girls, but no grown folks, except you. I like you. And if you're good and stop pulling my toes, I'll tell you a story. One I think all myself. I promised solemnly, and then Mary Lee smoothed out her ruffles, pulled her hair around on either side of her pretty chin, and with another confidential sigh, began. Well, what do you think? Once there was a little girl with long yellow hair, no bigger than me, who had a pony black as ink with white stars all around his head and both cheeks. And she had a dog, big as a mastiff, who was white as snow with black roses on his back, and a beautiful one right in the middle of his face. What a fortunate little girl, I said. And when Mary Lee had determined that I really thought so, she went on with her story. Well, there were twenty big men and twenty big horses with twenty long rifles who made a party one day to go hunting the little girl asked to go along but one of the horrid men said girls are no good hunting she be in the road but an old grandpa said let her follow along behind she'll be quiet so the little girl got on the black pony and the rose dog went with her she hid a real rifle under her riding skirt on the saddle horn it was only as long as your two feet, but it shot real fire. She did not say anything out loud, but way down in her throat she said, I'm going to show those men what a little girl is good for. Then they rode through the town at a canter, and the rude boys on the corners laughed at the little girl, but she only tossed her hat and looked the other way. They rode on and on over the snowy road till they came to a four-bar gate when the men stopped to open it. The little girl never stopped, but her star pony jumped right over it with the rose dog at his heels, and they all waited in a hollow for the men. Miles and miles and miles they rode through the woods till they came to a big clearing, bigger than any circus ring you ever saw. There were big humps of snow in the middle of it. You know, humps like a camel. Then Mary Lee straightened herself in the chair and opened her eyes like pansies, while in an excited voice she said, Well, what you think? There, over the biggest of the humps, was a high branching horn, and that meant a reindeer. Those men just talked together and did not know what to do next. But the little girl rode around to the other side of the ring, put an icicle in her rifle, and, just as quick as that, bang went the gun, and down fell the reindeer. The rose dog went right up to him and bit his throat so that he died quick, and it didn't hurt him either. Those men felt very cheap, 
especially the horrid one who said she'd be in the road. The good old grandpa helped her put the reindeer on behind her saddle, and the little girl on the star pony with the rose dog rode back to town at the head of the procession. The women all looked out of the windows, and the rude boys were ashamed that they had laughed at the little girl. She was as cool as you please, and rode down to the courthouse where the chief lawyer gave her a prize. A lovely pink satin ribbon round her neck. Well, what do you think? The next day, the little girl went out hunting with the twenty men, and she put a piece of ebony in her rifle instead of an icicle, and shot a black bear. The prize she got that day was a white satin ribbon for her hair. And what do you think? The very next day, she put a green pebble in her rifle and shot a wild cat. The prize that time was a red ribbon for a sash. Everything depended on what she put in the rifle. If she had put in a snowball, she would have shot a polar bear, and a piece of gold would have killed a canary, and silver a grey squirrel, and a diamond a glittering peacock. And what do you think? A butterfly in the rifle would have killed a fairy. With this wonderful revelation, Mary Lee leaned back in her chair, satisfied that she had made a deep impression. By and by, she said, "I have another story that I think to myself, but it almost makes me cry, and I won't tell it to you. If you cry on New Year's Day, don't you know you'll cry on every day of the year? Come to supper, quick, quick, before the grim folks take all the hot muffins." End of section thirty-two. Recording by Eve. Social media at ys eve chan. End of the Children's Wonder Book by various authors. The Little Lady by Mary E. Stone, read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. From a land called Quaint Arcady, once there came a little lady, dressed in a robe of pink lake gossamer and she rode a little pony caparisoned so tony for the saddle was of silver and the bridle was of gold when she passed them all the people rang the bells in their church steeple and saluted till their faces touched the ground lo a person with a sermon and a prince in royal ermine fought a duel for this little lady's hand but the maid from quaint arcady this funny little lady would have not of all the suitors in the land till she met a boy tow-headed ah she smiled and they were wedded back to quaint arcady rode the lad and little lady end of poem this recording is in the public domain Section number 34 of the Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Children's Wonder Book, Snowy Peter by Susan Coolidge. The weather was very cold, though it was not Christmas yet, and to the great delight of the Cane children, December had brought an early and heavy fall of snow. Older people were sorry. They grieved for the swift vanishing of the lovely Indian summer, for the blighting of the last flowers, chrysanthemums, snowberries, bittersweet, and for the red leaves so pretty but a few days since which were now blown about and battered by the strong wind but the children wasted no sympathy on either leaves or berries a snowstorm seemed to them just then better than anything that ever grew on bush or tree and they reveled in it all the long afternoon without a thought of what it had cost the world 
It was a deep snow. It lay over the lawn six inches on a level. In the hollow by the fence the drifts were at least two feet deep. There was no lack of building material. Therefore, when Reggie proposed that they should all go to work and make a fort, such a wonderful fort as it turned out to be, it had walls and bastions and holes for cannon. It had cannon, too, all made of snow. It had a gateway, just like a real fort, and a flagstaff, and a flag. The staff was a tall, slender column of snow, and they poured water over it, and it froze and became a long pole of glittering ice. The flag had a swallow tail and was icy, too. Reggie had been in New London and Newport the summer before. He had seen real fortifications and knew how they should look. Under his direction the little ones built a glacis. Some of you will know what that is. The steep, slippery grass slope which lies beneath the fort walls and is so hard to climb. This glacis was harder yet. Snow is better than grass for defensive purposes, if only it would last. Now let's make the soldiers, shouted little Paul, as the last shovelful of snow was spread on the glasses and smoothed down. Oh, Paul, we can't. There won't be time, said Emma, the biggest girl, glancing apprehensively at the sun, which was nearing the edge of the sky. It must be five o'clock, and Nurse will call us almost right away. Oh, bother! I wish the days weren't so short, said Paul discontentedly. Let's make one man anyway, just for a sentry, you know. There ought to be a sentry to take care of the fort. Can't we, Emma? Yes, only we must hurry. The small crew precipitated itself on the drift. None of them were cold, for exercise had warmed their blood. The little ones gathered great snowballs and rolled them up to the fort, while the big ones shaped and molded. In a wonderfully short time the man was completed, eye, nose, and all, and the gun in his hand. A pipe was put into his mouth, and an old hat on his head. Emma curled his hair a little. Susan Sunflower, as the round-faced younger girl was called for fun, patted and smoothed his cheeks and forehead with her warm little hands. They made boots for him and a coat with buttons on the tail pocket. He was a beautiful man indeed. Just as the last touch was given, a window opened and Nurse's head appeared, the very thing the children had been dreading. "'Come, children!' come in to supper she called out across the snow it's nearly half past five you ought to have come in half an hour ago miss susan stop working in that snow nasty cold stuff you'll catch your death master reggie make the little boys hurry please there was never any appeal from nurse freeman's decisions least of all now when papa and mamma were both away and she ruled the house as its undisputed autocrat even reggie on the verge of twelve dared not disobey her she was english and a marionette and had been in charge of the children all their lives but she was kind as well as strict and they loved her reluctantly the little troop prepared to go they picked up the shovels and baskets for Nurse Freeman was very particular about fetching things in and putting them in their places. They took a last regretful look at their fort. Paul climbed the wall for one more jump down. Little Harry indulged in a final slide across the glasses. Susan Sunflower stroked the sentinel's hand. Good night, Snowy Peter, said Reggie. Good night, Snowy Peter, they all cried in chorus for that was the name they had agreed upon for their soldier. Then they ran across the lawn in a long scurrying line, like a little convoy of birds. There was a scraping of feet on the porch. 
the side door closed with a bang and they were gone left to himself snowy peter stood still in his place beside the gateway of the fortification snowy men usually do stand still at least till the time comes for them to melt and run away so there was nothing strange in that what was singular was that about an hour after the children left him when dusk had closed in over the house and the leafless trees and fort kane had grown a vague dim shape he slowly turned his head it was as though the fingers of little susan had communicated something of their warmth and fullness of life to the poor senseless figure while working over it and this influence was beginning to take effect he turned his head and looked in the direction of the house all was dark except for the hall lamp below which shone through the glass panes above the door and for two windows in the second story of which streamed a strong yellow light these were the windows of the nursery where at that moment the children were eating their supper snowy peter remained for a time in motionless silence looking at the window then his body slowly began to turn following the movement of his head he lifted one stiff ill-shaped foot and moved a step forward then he lifted the other and took another step his left arm dangled uselessly the right hand held out the gun which paul had made and which was of the most curious shape the tracks which he left in the snow as he crossed the lawn resembled the odd waddling tracks of a flat-footed elephant as much as anything else it took him a long long time to cross the space over which the light feet of the children had run in two minutes each step seemed to cost him a mighty effort the right leg would quiver for a moment then wave wildly to and fro then with a sort of galvanic jerk project itself and the whole body with a pitch and lurch would plunge forward heavily till brought up again in an upright position by the advanced leg after that left leg would take its turn and the process be repeated there was no spring no subtle play to the joints in fact snowy peter had no joints his young creators had left them out when constructing him at last he reached the wall of the house and stood beneath the windows where the yellow light was burning this had been the goal of his desires but alas now that he had attained the coveted position he could not look in at the windows he was far too short desperation lent him energy a stout lattice was nailed against the house up which in summer a flowering clematis twinned and clustered seizing this snowy peter began to climb up one bar after another he slowly and painfully went lifting his heavy feet and clinging tightly with his poor stiff hands his gun stock snapped in the middle his hat sustained many contusions even his nose had more than one hard knock but he had the heart of a hero whom neither danger nor difficulty nor personal inconvenience can deter and at last his head was on a level with the nursery window still it was a pleasant sight that met his eyes no one had slept in the nursery since paul had grown big enough for a bed of his own and though it kept his old name it was in reality only a big cheerful upstairs sitting-room where lessons could be studied meals taken and nurse freeman sit and do her mending and always be on hand for any one who wanted her now that mr and mrs kane were absent the downstairs rooms looked vacant and dreary and the children spent all their evenings in the nursery from preference a large fire burned briskly in the ample grate a kettle hissed and bubbled on the hob 
on the round table where the lamp stood was a row of bright little tin basins just emptied of the smoking hot bread and milk which was the usual nursery supper nurse was cutting slices from a big brown loaf and buttering them with nice yellow butter there was also some gingerbread and by way of special and particular treat a pot of strawberry jam to which paul at that moment was paying attention he had scooped out such an enormous spoonful as to attract the notice of the whole party and just as snowy peter raised his white staring eyes above the sill reggie called out hello i say leave a little of that for somebody else will you piggy wiggy remarked harry indignantly and it's your second help too master paul i'm surprised at you observed nurse freeman severely taking the big spoonful away from him there that's quite enough and she put half the quantity on the edge of his plate and gave the other half to susan that's not fair remonstrated paul when i've been working so hard and it's so cold and when i like jam so and when it's so awfully good besides jam what is jam thought snowy peter he pressed his cold nose closer to the glass we all worked hard paul said elma and we all like jams as much as you do may i have some more dursey i wonder how poor snowy peter feels all alone out there in the garden said susan sunflower he must be very cold poor fellow ho he doesn't mind it declared paul with his mouth full of bread and jam oh yes i do i mind it very much murmured snowy peter to himself but he had no voice with which to make an outward noise wouldn't you come out and see him to-morrow nursey went on susan he's the best man we ever made he's quite beautiful he's got a pipe and a hat and curly hair and buttons on his coat i'm sure you'll like him snowy peter reared himself straighter on the lattice he was proud to hear himself thus commended if he could only talk and walk he'd be just as good as a live person really he would nursey said alma wouldn't it be fun if he could we'd bring him in to tea and he'd sit by the fire and warm his hands and it would be such fun he'd melt fast enough in this warm room observed reggie while nurse freeman added that's nonsense miss alma how could a man like that walk and i don't want no nasty snow images in my nursery melting and slopping up the carpet snowy peter listened to this conversation with a painful feeling at his heart he felt lonely and forlorn no one really liked him to the children he was only a thing to be played with and joked about nurse freeman called him a nasty snow image but though he was hurt and troubled in his spirit the warm bright nursery the sound of laughter and human voices even the fire that foe most fatal of all to things made of snow had an irresistible attraction for him he could not bear the idea of returning to his cold post of duty beside the lonely fort and under the wintry midnight sky so he still clung to the lattice and looked in at the window with his unwinking eyes and a great longing to be inside and to sit down by the cheerful fire and be treated with kindness took possession of him but what is the use of such ambitions in a snowman long long he clung to the lattice and lingered and looked in he saw the two little ones when first the sandman began to drop his grains into their eyes and noticed how they struggled against the sleepy influence and tried to keep awake he saw nurse freeman carry them off and presently fetch them back 
in their flannel nightgowns to say their prayers beside the fire snowy peter did not know what it meant as they knelt with their heads in nursie's lap and their pink toes curled up in the glow of the heat but it was a pretty sight to see and he liked it after they were taken away for the second time he watched alma as she studied her geography lesson for the morrow while reggie did sums on his slate and paul played at checkers with susan sunflower snowy peter thought he should like to do sums and he was sure it would be nice to play checkers and jump squares and chuckle and finally beat as paul did alas checkers are not for snowmen paul went to bed when the game was ended and susan and a little later the other two followed then nurse freeman raked out the fire and put ashes on top and blew the lamps out and went away herself leaving the nursery dark and silent except for a dim glow from the ash-smothered grate and the low ticking of the clock some time after she departed when the lights in the other windows had all been extinguished and the house was as dark inside as the night was outside snowy peter raised his hand and pushed gently at the sash it was not fastened and it opened easily and without much noise then a heavy leg was thrown over the sill and stiffly and painfully the snow soldier climbed into the room he wanted to feel what it was like to sit in a chair beside a table as human beings sit and he was extremely curious about the fire alas he could not sit he was made to stand but not to bend when he tried to seat himself his body lay in a long inclined plane with the shoulder blades resting on the back of the chair and the legs sticking out straight before him an attitude which was not at all comfortable the chair creaked beneath him and tipped dangerously it was with difficulty that he got again into his natural position and he trembled with fear in every limb it had been a narrow escape a fine thing it would have been if i had fallen over and not been able to get on my feet again he thought how that terrible old woman would have swept me up in the morning then cautiously and timidly he put his finger into the nearly empty jam pot rubbed it round till a little of the sweet stickly juice adhered to it and raised it to his lips it had no taste to him jam was a human joy in which he could not share and he heaved a deep sigh drops began to stand on his forehead though there was so little fire left the room was much warmer than the outer air and snowy peter had begun to melt a great and sudden fear took possession of him as fast as his heavy limbs would allow he hastened to the window it was a great deal harder to go down the lattice than to climb up it and twice he almost lost his footing but at last he stood safely on the ground the window he left open he had no strength left for extra exertion with increasing difficulty he stumbled across the lawn to his old position beside the gateway of the fort a sense of duty had sustained him thus far for a sentry must be found at his post but when at least he was there all power seemed to desert his limbs little susan's warm fingers had perhaps put just so much life into him and no more as would enable him to do what he had done as a clock can run but its appointed course of hours and must then stop his head turned no longer in the direction of the house his eyes looked immovably forward the straight stiff hand held out the broken gun two o'clock sounded from the church steeple three four the earliest dawn crept slowly into the sky it brought into a soft pink flush a sudden wind rose and stirred 
and as if quickened by its impulse up came the yellow sun smoke began to curl from the house chimneys doors opened voices sounded but still snowy peter did not move why what is this cried nurse freeman hurrying into the nursery from her bedroom which was near how come this window to be open i left the fire covered up a purpose that my dears might have a warm room to breakfast in it's as cold as a barn must be that careless maria she's no head and no thoughtfulness that girl maria denied the accusation but nurse was not convinced windows did not open without hands she justly observed but what hands opened this particular window nurse freeman never never knew presently another phenomenon claimed her attention there on the carpet close to the table where the jam pot stood was a large slop of water it marked the spot where the snowman had begun to melt the night before it's the snow the children brought in on their boots suggested maria boots cried nurse freeman incredulously boots when i changed them myself and put on their warm slippers she shook her head portentously as she wiped up the slop there's something unaccountable in it all she said so there was but it was a great deal more unaccountable than nurse freeman suspected when the children ran out after lessons to play in their fort their time for wonderment came how oddly snowy peter looked not at all as he did the day before his figure had somehow grown rubbed and shabby the buttons were gone from his coat-tails the gun they had taken such pains with was broken in two where was the other half what's that on his finger demanded elma it looks as if it were bleeding it was the juice of the strawberry jam paul first tasted delicately with the tip of his tongue then he boldly bit the finger off and swallowed it why what made you do that asked the others jam was the succinct reply jam impossible how could our snowman get at any jam it couldn't be that tastes like it anyway remarked paul i can't think what has happened to spoil him so said emma plaintively do you think a loose horse could have got into the yard during the night see how the snow is trampled down hallo look here shouted reggie this is the queerest thing yet there's the other half the gun sticking out halfway up the clematis frame it must have been a horse said alma who having once settled on the idea found it hard to give it up it couldn't be anything else oh yes it could it was no horse it was me said snowy peter in the depths of his being where a little warmth still lingered he was very ugly now i think see how he's melted all along his shoulder and his hair has got out of curl and his nose is awful pronounced susan sunflower let's pull him to pieces and make a nicer man oh oh groaned snowy peter with a final effort of consciousness his inward sufferings did not affect his features in the least and no one suspected that he was feeling anything paul knocked the pipe out of his mouth with a snowball harry with a great push rolled him over the crisp snow parted and flew the children hurrahed and in three minutes he was a shapeless mass and nobody ever knew or guessed how for a few brief hours he had lived the life of a human being being agitated by hope and moved by desire so ended snowy peter and his sole mourner was little susan who remarked after all he was nice before he got spoiled and i wish nursey had seen him end of section thirty four Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, 
Vancouver, B.C. So Funny by Abby Morton Diaz Read for LibriVox.org by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. I've heard something, children. I can't think tis true. It does make me laugh so. Oh, what shall I do? For I want to begin it and tell it this minute, this funny old story of ho hum Galoo, the far unknown country of ho hum Galoo, yes, of ho hum Galoo. In ho hum go, ha 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 ha, do just wait till I can stop laughing. There, now I will state some curious ways of their washing days pray who would not laugh such a tale to relate such a comical washing day tale to relate yes such a tale to relate now in ho hum galoo there is no separate scrub of a child and its garments but into the tub go the children all dressed for this is thought best as a saving of time and a saving of rub one washing for both is a saving of rub yes a saving of rub and then now remember the story's not mine and then ha 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 when the weather is fine they're wrung out of the suds each child in its duds and hung up to dry out of doors on the line two clothespins to each out of doors on the line yes out of doors on the line Oh, I knew you would laugh when I told you the whole, to think of them stringing from close pole to pole. Ha, 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 he, 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 you're all laughing with me. I knew you would do so, the thing is so droll. We will giggle together, the thing is so droll. Yes, the thing is so droll. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 36 of the Children's Wonder Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Children's Wonder Book. The King Cat by A. A. Rawling. Next Saturday always seemed far off to Willie Hart. He counted the days on his fingers. He would say to his mamma, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that makes seven days, and when seven days come, it will be Saturday. Now one of those long look for Saturdays had arrived. Willie was at the breakfast table. The bright sun told of a pleasant day. The birds were singing, and the leaves were rustling, and Willie was enjoying these things without knowing it. He supposed he was only enjoying his griddle cakes and maple molasses. Willie had been taught politeness, never to leave the table without saying, Excuse me, and many other manners of good breeding. But this morning he had dropped from his chair, had thrown down his napkin, and had reached the door before his mamma knew what he was doing. She called him back. "'You have forgotten to be polite, Willie,' she said. "'Now you must sit at the table two minutes longer.' Willie sighed as he mounted his chair. "'Mamma, I don't like to be polite on Saturdays. That will be two minutes gone. Fanny,' he continued, turning to his sister, a naughty sparkle in his eye, what do you think I am going to do today? I don't know, replied Fanny. I'm going to make Topsy a little muslin cap lined with blue. Topsy was Fanny's kitten, and although named after a little black girl in a storybook, she was as white as snow, without a spot of color, and with lovely pink eyes. Pshaw, said Willie, just like a girl, dress up a cat. I'll tell you what I am going to do. 
I'm going to chase cats and throw sticks and stones at em, and I'm going to run after em and catch em and drown em, and where's Topsy? And he looked over at the little white fuzzy ball curled up in the rocking chair. Fanny ran and caught Topsy in her arms, and turned to Willie with very bright eyes and very red cheeks, and stamping her foot to make him understand. She cried out, Willie Hart, you promised me you never, never would, as long as you lived, hurt my little Topsy. Now shall he, Mama? Willie's cheeks were almost bursting with the laughter he was keeping in, but his mamma said very seriously, I hope my little son would not make anything suffer. I think it shameful to give pain. Willie turned away. He didn't like his mamma to look so, and he went out on the piazza feeling quite uncomfortable. Now Willie had no thought of chasing cats when he laid his plans for the day before his sister Fanny. He had said that just to tease her, still he was rather fond of vexing both cats and dogs, and while he was standing on the piazza step he espied the grey family cat basking on the railing and regarding him with big yellow eyes. As if in a spirit of defiance he picked up a stone with one hand and a stick with the other and flung them with a whoop loud enough to have come from the throat of a young savage and mamma and fanny rushed out in time to see willie pursuing the poor old pet with the vindictiveness of twenty bad boys willie chased the cat far into the woods feeling comfortable in the thought that as it was Saturday, he need not hurry back to school. Pussy still remained unhurt and sometimes would turn back and look at him with two big yellow eyes in a queer way, until finally he determined he would not put up with it. So he threw sticks and shouted louder and ran faster, but the only result was to make Pussy laugh. This startled him. He tried to convince himself that the cat did not laugh, but still he could see that the cat was laughing, and now he began to catch sight of other cats running in and out among the trees. He was sure he saw a spotted cat, and then a white one, and then a black one. For a moment he felt disposed to run after them. But the yellow eyes of the gray pussy looking down at him now from a tree decided him. Ho, oh, oh gray, you don't get rid of me yet, he shouted, throwing a stick by way of emphasis. But old gray sprang from tree to tree. Willie chased on until they were in the very middle of the woods. Then he lost both his breath and his patience and sat down on a log to rest. While sitting there he felt sure he saw other cats, plenty of them. There were rows of them behind every fallen log. They peered at him from behind every stump and from every tree. He could count twenty-four from where he sat. What jolly fun, he cried. I wish Dick and Jack Harris were here. Wouldn't we scat em, though? He was answered by the sound of laughter. It came from the cats as they darted in and out among the trees. Startled, he looked up at the gray cat. He sat in a tree looking down at him with great, mirthful yellow eyes. You impertinent thing, shouted Willie, throwing a clump of moss up at him. I'll teach you. But Pussy sprang to a large tree not far off and then threw a hole in the trunk and disappeared. Willie was astonished. He sprang for the tree, too, darted through the hole after the cat, and landed head first at the foot of some winding stairs. He did not seem to wonder at the winding stairs, but, supposing Pussy must have gone that way, he climbed them just as fast as he could until he came out among the branches. 
for a moment he thought only of the delightful situation he found it cool and comfortable among the great green breech leaves and he was joyfully looking for some branches that would serve as a seat when a curious stir below attracted his attention creeping along a stout limb he looked over and saw what so startled him that he almost lost his balance he saw cats of all sizes and colors black cats and white cats and spotted cats gray cats and yellow cats and maltese cats and each cat standing on its hind feet with a club in its right paw each cat lashing its great tail right and left and all looking up at him you may not believe it but willie laughed aloud it seemed very funny to him he would have laughed longer but now the cats began to climb the tree as they came nearer and nearer he could see that they did not look friendly and seized with a sudden fear he began to creep backward in his haste he missed his hold and tumbled heel over head down the winding stairs and reached the foot without his hat and with several aching spots on his elbows and knees he hurriedly felt for the entrance but it had been blocked up the few rays of light came from far above where he did not feel able to climb the next moment he was conscious that the cats had begun the descent not a stick or stone was to be seen while searching for something with which to defend himself he saw a square piece of wood with an iron ring in the middle of it and without stopping to think he slipped his fingers through the ring gave a pull and again down he went with a thump that jarred him soundly the square board was a trap door and willie had pulled it up he had not much time for surprise he knew the cats were coming down the stairs he hurriedly reached up and closed the trap door over him when willie's eyes had become accustomed to the darkness he found he was standing on another stairway a glimmer of light from below a turning told him which way it led but he was too much bruised to explore besides he felt it must lead underground he said to himself the old things will go away by and by and then i will lift the door and climb to the opening but the old things did not go away he could now hear them scratching and spitting at the trap door at first he felt safe for cats cannot open a trap door but when he reflected that these cats could walk on their hind feet with a club in the paw he began to think that animals so extraordinary might even open a trap door in that case they might all at once alight on his head so he concluded to go down the steps and see if he could not burrow out when he had turned the first winding he stood still and said oh the stairs were rock and the walls were rock but it was the lights on the walls that made Willie say, oh, they looked like clusters of eyes. Willie felt that a thousand cats were staring at him, but they were not cat eyes. They were clusters of rats' eyes put together into all sorts of fanciful shapes, in squares and circles and stars and flowers. Willie went on down and down, looking up at the wall as he went his mind so filled with daring delight that he forgot all fear suddenly an abrupt turning brought him into an immense hall of rock brilliantly lighted in the same manner only on a larger scale the lamps being in the form of trees and fountains the ceiling filled with stars back of the lights were curious furry hangings of rat skins looped with wrapped tails and the floor as well as the couches along the sides of the hall were covered with the same soft material willie walked along the hall his shoes making no noise on the furry carpet 
looking right and left with admiration across the side which he was approaching extended wide steps which led to a platform on each end of which was a row of chairs cushioned with pale gray mouse furs upon a throne in the center appeared a huge object that was all fur willie soon saw that this object had two feet and he was just going nearer to satisfy his curiosity when the words don't come near it is dangerous for boys made him draw back he looked sharply and discovered that it was an enormous cat his left paw resting on an arm of the throne his right paw holding a huge club above his head willie drew back still farther his eyes fixed on the cat's face they looked at each other for fully a minute then willie remarked what a stunning cat you are you are the biggest fellow i have ever seen the cat took no notice of this disrespectful observation he sat dignified and solemn after a pause which willie had not the courage to break the king cat asked are you william hart willie immediately answered yes sir and then he laughed because he had said sir to a cat what brought you here asked the cat why said willie why i was chasing and then he stopped catching chasing what asked the cat well he began a strange obligation upon him to tell the truth our cat he kept a going and i kept a chasing the old thing wouldn't stop long enough for me to hit him and he went into a hole in a tree very strange that a cat wouldn't stop to be hit very strange i must say reflectively observed the king cat a boy now would have stopped to be hit of course he would be so obliging why i don't think began willie but the king cat interrupted him i'll give you time to think you may sit down there and think and he pointed with his club to a couch near the platform willie sat down obediently the king cat seemed in no hurry to speak again he sat on his throne looking straight before him his left paw on the arm of the throne his right paw resting on his club willie thought and thought all the cats he had ever seen came to his mind and all except his sister fanny's little topsy were running from him some he was pursuing with sticks some with stones and they all were getting away as fast as they could his attention was attracted to a cat who had just entered it was walking on its hind feet and carrying a tray in his forepaws it was the gray cat of the morning's adventure pausing before the king gray made as low a bow as he could considering he had a tray in his paws and said here is your majesty's mail when the king cat had read the missives he said inform the judge and jury and the ladies and gentlemen of the court that we are ready to proceed to try the case thereupon a fine-looking cat walked in he had a sunflower wand in one paw and a roll of paper in the other making his bow he took his seat at the left of the throne then twelve cats came in each carrying a club and saluting the king six took the seats at one end of the platform and six at the other then followed the members of the court all silently passing to the seats at the other end of the hall and finally forty fierce-looking cats armed with clubs filled the outside row of seats willie looked at the cats and the cats looked at him and he started with surprise when he recognized his sister fanny's little topsy among them the king turned to the first officer and said you may proceed the first official arose willie felt sure it was his cousin tom's pet cat and he remembered seeing tom trying to teach him to write and after bowing to the king and jury and then to the court 
read from the paper as follows to your royal highness the gentlemen of the jury and the ladies and gentlemen of the court greeting at the request of your royal highness i have prepared this statement of our grievances from this boy and others of his race first i confess that many of our people do wrong and deserve the chastisements they get some notwithstanding a careful bringing up allow nature to get the better of them and in order to satisfy the cravings of hunger jump upon the dinner-table and even run away with pieces of beefsteak and mutton-chop such conduct deserves the punishment which generally follows but your royal highness what i complain of is the persistent tyranny exercised towards us by that class of human beings called boys why your royal highness if a cat do but curl in a corner to sun himself or settle comfortably on a post or a fence if he stop for a moment to wash his face or take a roll in the cool grass these boys pounce on him with sticks or stones and he is obliged to flee for his life not content with that they chase him this particular boy your royal highness is one of the worst of his kind but he shows no mercy especially in the chase and but that we are a fleet-footed race many of your loyal subjects would be found lying dead on the ground killed by him we think your royal highness that these things should be stopped it was by your orders this morning that lord Greycat enticed him into the tree which stands as a tower to our underground castles by your orders also we are now met to consider what shall be done with him the king then said i give all opportunity to speak and in order to avoid confusion the cat highest in court may begin the others may follow in order lord grey cat we will hear you lord grey cat made his speech stating he knew william hart intimately and many of the court testified after him as willie listened his color came and went he felt himself growing hot and cold by turns and he owned to himself that all they said was true then the king turned to willie boy you may speak if you have any reason for your conduct make it known willie arose not to be outdone by cats in politeness he bowed first to the king and jury and then to the court your royal highness i didn't suppose that cats cared i didn't think your royal highness then he stopped not knowing what to say next but catching sight of topsy he continued in a faltering voice your royal highness i was always good to topsy wasn't i topsy and my sister fanny loves eats loves cats and it would grieve her if you should hurt me then he sat down after a moment of silence the king was turning to the jury when the first official again came forward with his sunflower wand what is it asked the king your royal highness miss topsy wishes to speak certainly said the king the first official brought forward miss topsy leading her by the paw a thrilling sensation ran through the court many of the cats clapped their paws silently evidently miss topsy was a favorite she certainly did look lovely with a little ruffled muslin cap lined with blue stuck over one ear a blue ribbon around her neck and a little embroidered handkerchief in her right paw even his royal highness smiled there she stood looking so pretty that willie could not help saying oh topsy i wish fanny could see you topsy took no notice of willie she kept her eyes on the king and jury now and then putting her handkerchief up to wipe away the tears she pleaded for willie in a soft purry tones dwelling on his uniform kindness to her and the goodness of fanny and of his mother to all cats 
occasionally she would turn to some big juryman and ask if what she said were not true and he would directly say that it was the whole jury indeed seemed to feel the influence of her words and when she returned to her seat willie felt that public opinion had been changed the jury retired it seemed to willie that they were gone a long time but in fact they were gone only five minutes at the expiration of that time they returned as quietly as they had left at a nod from the king the first official arose and read the decision it seemed very severe to willie we think a persecutor of cats ought to be condemned to death but as some extenuating circumstances have been related in regard to this boy we think the punishment of the second degree may do in his case the forty executioners shall be ranged opposite each other twenty in a row with clubs raised at the signal the boy shall run between the lines and all shall hit him who can the boy shall then return through the lines all striking at him with the left paw claws unmuffed this shall be done six times if the boy survive he shall remain a prisoner until he has done some deed of great service to the race of cats the king turned to the executioners prepare there was an immediate movement topsy went anxiously from one to another of the executioners willie heard her say don't strike hard please scare him only the executioners ranged themselves the first official led willie to the head of the line willie's heart beat fast but he was a brave boy he held up his head and awaited the signal like a young indian the order was given the clubs were raised and willie ran he reached the foot of the lines not much hurt the executioners had remembered miss topsy some had made a great fuss but had not touched him and the others had hit him lightly at the end of the sixth run willie had lost some hair had received some scratches and a black eye but on the whole he had come out safe and he now stood panting and wondering what would occur next the king nodded his head as a signal for all to leave and willie was left standing before the king boy his majesty said at last be seated strive to think of some good deed you can do willie was glad to sit as he was rather tired but as i have said he was a brave boy and he immediately set to work thinking of something good to do for the king and his subjects he was fond of using tools he had a very nice set at home and he had amused himself every rainy day with them he now soon remembered a rat trap he had just finished he arose and said please your royal highness i could make a rat trap if i had the things and stuff that pleased the king and he said i like to see a boy do the best he can pass into the next room and you will find everything you need willie passed in he found a carpenter's bench some wood and wire and all the tools he needed he never worked so steadily before he gave himself no time to rest he measured he sawed he planned he bored holes as if his life depended on it and indeed how did he know but that it did at the end of an hour his rat trip was finished he took it to the king cat and explained it the king said rats know too much to go in there willie replied they will go after cheese sir i wish i had some cheese you will find some in the closet in the next room said the king sure enough willie found it on a shelf put away with other nice bits for the king's dessert willie showed the king just how to set the trap and then put it by a hole which the king pointed out if that can catch rats said the king it will save my subjects a deal of trouble 
for it is necessary for my health that I eat a rat at every meal. They both fixed their eyes on the trap. Willie would now and then glance at the king, but the king never once took his eyes off. It was so still, and the lamps burned so brightly that Willie almost dropped to sleep. After a watch of about two hours, Willie heard a little click, and then another. He held his breath and looked at the king. The king turned his head towards him and said, He is caught. Bring him here. Willie carried the trap to the king, feeling very happy. Now you will let me go, he said. The king took out the rat. Then he bade Willie set the trap again and place it back. It soon caught another. Then he knocked with his club on the floor, and Lord Greycat and Miss Topsy entered. After they had expressed their satisfaction, the king cat turned to Willie. Boy, you are to go, but first I wish you make a solemn promise. Yes, sir, said Willie eagerly. Accordingly, at the king's command, Willie repeated after him these words. I solemnly promise that I will no more torment cats by chasing them, throwing sticks or stones after them, or in any way whatsoever, and I will do all I can to discourage these acts in other boys. The king then turned to Lord Greycat. Conduct the boy out of the castle and show him the way home. Willie bowed politely and said, Thank you, sir, to the king, and followed Lord Greycat up the stairs out of the hollow tree, out into the beautiful woods. The sun was just gilding the tops of the trees, so he knew it must be near tea time. When Willie looked down again, Lord Greycat was still before him but he was walking on his four feet, and he had Willie's hat in his mouth. "'Give me my hat!' Willie shouted, but Lord Greycat ran on. Once Willie forgot and picked up a stick, but remembered in time and dropped it. When they came in sight of the chimneys, Willie knew where he was. Lord Greycat dropped his hat and disappeared. Willie picked it up and running soon reached the house and entered the dining room just as the family were seating themselves at tea. Willie, where have you been? What is the matter? greeted him on all sides, for you must remember his hair had been pulled, his face scratched, and his eye bruised. Besides, his trousers and jacket were torn. Willie's appetite astonished everybody, so did his silence. At last he drew a long breath and looked around. There was the grey cat on the rug, and there sat Topsy with her muslin cap and blue ribbon. Fanny noticed his look. She said, Topsy went off this morning, don't you think, and she lost her beautiful little handkerchief. Willie went around and smoothed Topsy's fur and called her Miss Topsy and then he patted the old cat and called him Lord Grey Cat, and everybody shouted with laughter, everybody but Willie. He looked perfectly serious. It was some time before Willie took his father and mother and Fanny into his confidence. His parents grieved him by doubting his story, but Fanny won his heart by believing every word of it. One day Willie and Fanny went together into the woods in search of the hollow tree. They saw several cats wandering around, but the hole was filled with rubbish, and the branches were so thick that Willie could not climb them, so they contented themselves with leaving some nice pieces of meat and a little note directed to the king cat, and when they went again both the note and food were gone. After that they often went with Topsy and Lord Greycat, who seemed to enjoy the visits very much, and to be acquainted with all the cats they met, but none of them could be induced to walk on their hind feet without help. Willie kept his promise. He was a friend to all cats from that time, and he also persuaded many a boy to cease tormenting them. End of section 36. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.
End of the Children's Wonder Book by Various